Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where from you are joining us. Welcome to the Open Run for Beyond 5G Wireless Networks conference, Challenges and Vision. My name is Alexandra hetchko jelonek I'm a product manager at IS Wireless. And I am Rafał Sanecki from IS Wireless marketing team. Together, we will be your host today. We have an exciting lineup for, of talks for you. We hope you will find it inspiring and enjoy it. The organizer of the conference is IS Wireless, which develops and delivers mobile networks in the open run model. But we couldn't have done it only by ourselves. Today, we have great universities, we have great organizations, great R&D centers, and great commercial partners with us. This is true 5G made together spirit. We have, over, we have also over 600 registered participants for the conference from all around the world. Please use the chat window on YouTube channel to say hello and tell us where are you watching us from. The conference will consist of panels as well as presentations. Uh, regarding the housekeeping, we welcome questions. There is an opportunity to ask them in the chat window at the YouTube channel. Without further ado, let us start the conference. I would like to invite Sławomir Pietrzyk, CEO of IS Wireless, who will officially open the conference. Sławek, the floor is yours. It is my great, great pleasure to welcome you all during the conference open run for Beyond 5G Wireless Networks Challenges and Visions. My name is Sławomir Pietrzyk and I represent IS Wireless, the host of this conference. IS Wireless, IS Wireless is a mobile networks vendor of the future, with 4G demonstrated last year, 5G demonstrated this year, and mission critical uh, communications uh, last month. We are proving that we are a reliable partner, a new kid on the block in this game. But there is also another game. In parallel to hard work on product development, we were extremely busy with research. Actually, this research work started earlier, started first, as typically research precedes the product development. And since 2012, we were busy with research on 5G. Over these years, we were doing a number of research projects within Horizon and FP7, where we met wonderful partners. It is our time now to stand up together and show our strengths in defining the future of 5G. We truly believe that 5G can only be made together. Therefore, we use this vehicle to form an, an alliance, an organization of collaborating institutions and companies. Today, we proudly present some of the partners that share this vision with us. And we hope and we are sure that this family will grow. Last but not least, we would like to direct the spotlight on our region, that is Central and Eastern Europe. This is the region that stretches over the three seas, the Baltic, Adriatic and the Black Sea. Hence, it is often called the three seas region. We are very interested in catalyzing the momentum for research beyond 5G here. Thus, during this conference, we will have a dedicated panel where we will talk about regional collaboration and we will host guests from Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, Czechia and Slovenia. I wish you a great conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Slavomir, for this introduction, for opening the conference. Uh, so let's start the conference. We will be back with you in one minute.
I would like to welcome Artur Chmielewski, Head of Business Development at IS Wireless. Working with partners is part of our DNA. Artur, please tell us more. Hello. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. That's my great pleasure to be here today again. I said again because this is already the third event in this year organized by IS Wireless under the motto of uh, 5G made together. The expression made together natively assumes the collaboration and the spirit of partnership against a common target, which is the speeding up of development of open run by driving the innovation. It is important for 5G success, but it's even more important for everything beyond 5G. And beyond 5G is actually the subject of today's conference. At the beginning of our conference, we invited our business partners to share their views and visions on 5B, 5G and beyond. So as the first speaker, I have the pleasure to invite Jeremy Foe from IBM. Jeremy leads business development for consulting 5G and network transformation units. Jeremy, please share your views and visions with the audience. All right, thanks, Arthur. Uh, it's great to be here today, and, and I, I can't uh, agree with you more in the 5G made together. There is no one vendor or company that's going to deliver it all. So working with uh, the likes of IS Wireless and others uh, is a great honor for IBM, and, and uh, we're really excited about the, the evolution uh, that's going on. So instead of a uh, instead of a, uh, a presentation, I, I prepared a few words. Uh, so I'm sitting in my office here in Budapest, uh, and like Arthur said, my name is Jeremy Foy, and I lead our go-to-market team uh, in Europe uh, for 5G and industry transformation. So today we're here to discuss 5G and beyond, and I'll share a few insights into what we are experiencing on the market and how we are collaborating with, with partners such as IS Wireless and carriers uh, to advance 5G networking. My daily uh, focus at IBM is engaging with carriers to grow their top and bottom line revenue. And with the advent of more efficient networks, 5G gives the operators greater flexibility to provide additional in services. And I think we really have the momentum of the expectations of the carrier that 5G is gonna help them drive new revenue streams like, like the other uh, past generations have not. This morning, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the current status than the beyond status, just because I believe we have so much massive opportunity in the current state. 5G is just launching and taking off now. I think it's gonna run another decade at least. So the, the opportunity that we have is to enable uh, carriers to adopt these new methods, to upskill staff, to automate everywhere and create and monetize solutions. And, and that's just a few. The list of upside potential is longer uh, than we've ever seen it. And looking into ORAN specifically, if you read industry analyst reports, they believe that by 2026, two thirds of all cell sites will be uh, open RAN deployed. And IBM supports that development of open RAN standards, which is why we've been applying our technology and expertise to help accelerate how operators adopt open RAN in order to monetize and innovate. One example that I can share is a partnership that we have with a Telefonica brand where we've launched a fully functional open RAN network as a proof of concept. This deployment, one of the first globally, covers just under 100,000 customers, and it's enabling our partnership to test live commercial traffic and serve as an important proof point in the open RAN technology as it continues to evolve and mature. Another example uh, here in Europe is our partnership uh, with um, uh, an open RAN test bed that we've set up in combination in our Munich IoT Center and our telecommunications center in Nice, France. The goal uh, is to provide operators with a test platform to 
to trial edge applications and network slicing to give them and the vendors an opportunity to test and optimize performance as they develop solutions. We're in the early days having these test beds, we believe is fundamental into helping both the vendors and the carriers understand uh, the, the, the ecosystem that's being built. And we, IBM, we, we actively support the need to reshape the radio access network industry towards more open, intelligent, virtualized, fully interoperable mobile networks. Our, our open RAN, our open cloud uh, architecture aligns to this objective by supporting the choice across RAN technology suppliers and delivering agility in how mobile operators move and manage workloads across IT and network environments. Looking at today's lineup of speakers, we will hear from many experts around open RAN. I'm excited to be with you guys all day. So if I can just take a, 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 sh a moment to shift and to look at where carriers are thinking about profitable revenue. So we all know that the 5G deployments take significant investment. And as I work across carriers, the question of rev revenue growth is absolutely paramount. And operators are spending billions of dollars on 5G, on Spectrum alone. Uh, there, there was a recent uh, auction here in Europe where a local CEO described the auction as catastrophic in terms of spend. Uh, his organization spent over 1.5 billion. Another carrier on the network spent over 2 billion just for the spectrum. So they are clearly looking for ways to increase revenue with 5G capabilities. Everybody knows that. And communication service providers are increasingly realizing the importance of edge applications. We do annual surveys with executives. And in a recent survey, we found out that 94% of executives expect that edge services will have a positive impact on their operations within five years. And almost 60% of those executives told us that they're already in a proof of concept or deployment phases of early edge services. So, how are we helping enable the edge service uh, ecosystem? Well, I'll give a couple more examples there. Our first example is with Colt Technologies out of the UK. Colt Technologies Services and IBM in, in July, we announced an edge computing collaboration where we're focusing on helping the enterprise customers adopt an edge computing strategy designed to enable them to move data and applications seamlessly across hybrid cloud environments from their private data centers uh, to, to the edge. And you know, what, what are the problems that we're trying to solve and Colt Technologies are trying to solve? Well, everybody knows that enterprise organizations are adopting these new cloud technologies designed to simplify their business. But the fact of the matter is, is this new distributed infrastructure is not so simple. So this collaboration we have with, with Colt will jointly explore uh, this area, and we will also develop and innovate use cases for the enterprise customers. Because let's remember that the use cases are going to what, what's going to drive the platform and the adoption, and the carriers definitely need this type of uh, use case innovation uh, across industries. Uh, another quick example we have is with Bouygues Telecom out of France, where we co developed an open 5G lab. Uh, the, the open lab approach resolves around co-developing use cases, leveraging the power of 5G. So we're working with Bouygues uh, across manufacturing, energy and utility, healthcare, and I think a couple more, I forget, I think retail as well. So in addition to that, we, we have created a rapid test site for enterprise customers to come in and test the use cases in a real 5G environment to assess the technological benefits. And then if it meets their needs, then they can assess how do they address it into the market? How do they industrialize it uh, into the market? So those are a couple that we're working with uh, from, a, from an edge use case. And then, and then further drilling down, you know, what type of edge use cases are we seeing? You know, what, what are these networks that we're building what edge uh, cases are, are being utilized. I'll highlight just a couple. Uh, last week in the Wall Street Journal, on Friday, I think, they had a really interesting article about the global automotive industry. 
I, I, I would highly recommend you guys read it. And uh, they spoke about how Porsche in Germany has teamed up with Vodafone to help design and test equipment that Porsche is going to have to adopt into their vehicles with the, the evolution of 5G. And now what type of, you know, what, what are they trying to do? Well, safety is Porsche's number one uh, priority. So they are attempting to have, let's say, there is an obstacle in the roadway, let's say an animal, a human, uh, the Porsche wants that vehicle, whether it's an autonomous or human driven vehicle to alert other vehicles in the area to say, hey, slow down, stop. There isn't, you know, there is something blocking the roadway. An another thing that they want to do is they want to do Jeremy. the remote vehicles. Jeremy, please. Yeah, we have to we have to still listen to some other participants. So please right. keep right. the timing. Yeah. Right. Right. All right. So, hey, I'll, I'll wrap it up, Arthur. I'm sorry. I'm just excited I like know. you guys are. This so, is this is so exciting that we could spend hours on on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's why I didn't give a presentation. So, hey, I'll, ju I'll just say this, that IBM appreciates the work uh, that we're doing in the ecosystem. Uh, I think, Arthur, we have a lot more to go with um, amongst IBM and IS Wireless, but I thank you for, for inviting me to, to uh, the conference today, and I wish all the uh, participants and, and uh, audience a great day today. Arthur, thanks very much for, for inviting IBM. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. It was very informative. Uh, now, as the next speaker, I would like to invite Patricia Sokalska pomajo from Microsoft. She's the head of sales in Microsoft Azure for operations, responsible for Central and Eastern Europe region. Patricia, the floor is yours. Patricia, we can't hear you. Please unmute or... Uh, we cannot hear you. Patricia, we, we cannot hear you, so I suggest that we jump over now to the next speaker and in the meantime you can solve the technical issues, okay? All right, so do we have Sharif Setki with us? Sharif. Hello? Sharif, can you hear us? So the next presenter should be the representative of VMware, Sheriff Setki. We hope to get him still connected. Uh, Sheriff is the Telco Cloud Run Technical Specialist at VMware. So we would be keen also to hear from him what are the VMware visions on 5G and beyond. Do we have Sheriff with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Now we can hear you. Great. So, and Sheriff, the floor is the yours. <laughs> uh, and um, thanks for the invite. It was, it's a great pleasure to be here with this uh, with all of you, and we are all speaking about uh, the evolution to 5G, uh, ORAN. Now, uh, may I would like uh, to ask, are you able to see my screen? I'm trying to share a couple of slides. Actually, we can't see the slides. You cannot. We cannot, we cannot. Oh yes, now it's something coming up. So we can see the slides right now. Great. So uh, as I said, I'm part of uh, VMware Telco Cloud uh, Solutions, and uh, we are in partnership with 
IS wireless and wide range of industries. But I would like to highlight a few points about VMware View. Uh, as you know, VMware are very leading in the enterprise and cloud native and cloud tech solutions. But we have a new focus and a very dedicated new developed business unit focused on telco cloud solutions serving CSBs. Inc. One focus would be about the impress of ORAN. And even we are contributing to the ORAN specifications. And from VMware vision, we see that ORAN evolution is starting from today where we are having this monolithic layer from traditional RAN vendors uh, with a one box serving a proprietary hardware and software into an intermediate stage, which has started to happen, where we start to introduce the virtualization, separating and de -aggregate, disaggregating this baseband units into a software, and hopefully it's a cloud native distributed unit, DU and CU, running on COTS server. And by this, we achieve the decoupling between hardware and software. However, still we have uh, the same vendor specific element management system, but we can even start to introduce cloud platform and telco cloud automation to maximize and speed up the life cycle management of this. And then what we are seeing and we foresee and we are supporting is a full ORAN solution where we achieve the four layers of this aggregation by the aggregation of hardware and software, the, the openness between the front of the front hole between RU and the ODU. And then we have this the smartness and agility by the disaggregation of the control plane to enable a clear intelligence enabled DRIC, which is a near real time RIC application, and the non real time RIC hosted in the SMO service and management. And then on top of this, we have the management plane again, a fourth layer of disaggregation where the management is completely separated and disaggregated. So this is a view we believe in. We are very well aligned with this approach from the ORAN and we are supporting this. And to do this, what we are seeing that operators and uh, communication service providers would need a horizontal cloud native platform that is consistent across their core applications, their regional data centers, where they can host several uh, 5G core functions till the near edge where they can start to do this certain uh, CRAN concepts by hosting the CUs and the DUs in one location or even the cell side distributed uh, configuration at the edge where they can host DU. Now with VMware, what we are offering and we are working with all the vendors and providing the CSPs the flexibility to host a multiple vendors, the best of breed selection, a platform which is a cloud native. It enables the onboarding of all their core and RAN function, whatever location and topology according to their network design is possible. It is a consistent operation across all the data centers and automated in a way that with Telco Cloud Automation, we automate the onboarding, the life cycle management, day one and day two, to ensure simplified and smooth, and in the very near future, foster the CI-CD pipeline, and at the same time, meet the ORAN specs. Um, this is in a very brief way, and we have the pleasure also to very soon be working with many RAN and uh, telco and core function developers, including IS Wireless. Last, I would just like to summarize, and I know the time is very tight. We are quite here in the telco since several years. We have many telco customers who are running thousands of uh, VNFs and CNFs in a multi-cloud environment, on-premise environment. We also have the edge solution and more uh, engagement and more news is coming forward and I would recommend you to keep following our approach. I try to keep it short and brief and I I can now hand over to our, to our next speaker. And uh, more than available uh, and glad to support any and answer any question or any 
side or breakout chat. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, it was a very interesting story and view of uh, VMware for the 5G and what's going to happen after that. So now, hopefully, we can welcome Patricia from Microsoft. Patricia? Yes, hello, good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. This is very good. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to take part in this event. I have prepared a couple of slides and please allow to share me. I hope you can see it. Is it the right format? We can see the slides. Okay. Very good. So let me see. So um, just a couple of words about 5G and why Microsoft is interested in this area. So as you know, 5G is bringing new capabilities that 4G didn't have. So it's speeds and throughput like fiber. It is lower latency. Um, as well as massive connectivity. And this is bringing vast um, use cases to enterprises. So actually, we as consumers will probably not notice whether we are using mobile applications on 5G or 4G, but this is very significant for, for enterprises, for Industry 4.0. And this is where also Microsoft has not noticed the industry potential. And this happened for the following reasons. On one hand side, Microsoft is having global connectivity with Microsoft Azure. On another hand, Microsoft is having a lot of enterprise customers, actually probably majority on the market, uh, partnering on different business uh, applications with them already. The component that was probably missing was um, private uh, networks 5G packet core. And that's probably one of the main reasons why Microsoft acquired Affirm Networks and Metaswitch in order to have a complete solution to address uh, 5G uh, use cases with, uh, with enterprises and industry. And this is the reason why, and I'm trying to jump to another slide, this is why Microsoft came up with Azure Private Mac solution, which is available now. We have already many references on the market with big enterprises, global enterprises, as well as smaller ones. The solution will be also available as first party solution on Microsoft uh, Marketplace. Uh, this is soon to come. But there are a couple of layers in this end-to-end -end ecosystem of partners and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Microsoft solutions. So here on the bottom, you can see that, of course, we need radio and um, we are here partnering with IS Wireless uh, for radio solutions, as well as devices. So Microsoft is coming with Azure Percept solution, um, which is bringing a video um, AI platform uh, to create some customized uh, solutions for enterprises for these uh, industry use cases. Another important point of this whole puzzle is actually edge compute resources. Here we're also coming with different, different flavors, like for instance, Azure Stack Edge Box that can be deployed on premise with enterprise, uh, giving a very small footprint and very high capacity. Uh, another layer, it's uh, edge network function, like packet core, 5G SA, 4G. Uh, this is something like enabler for enterprises, probably not visible for them in order to make all these 5G services happen in a much better way than, than with Wi-Fi or cables today. And something which I think is one of the most important components that, that Microsoft has is Azure IoT applications in order to fulfill those needs of use cases for enterprises, and there will be hundreds of them. And this is not about only Azure IoT applications, but this is also about the whole um, ecosystem for developers, which will uh, be um, allowed to actually customize those services for end customers. And uh, last but not least is um, cloud management uh, platform. Um, this is for orchestration and for monitoring of, of applications and network functions. Because, first of all, uh, such private networks need to be deployed in minutes, not in months, like traditionally. And second of all, they need to be managed in the most effective and efficient way in order to scale this business, because 5G private networks business is about scaling. So that's how I want to cover uh, this topic today. Thank you very much for giving uh, us this opportunity to present how we are uh, interacting uh, with this market. Um, so thank you very much. So thank you, Patricia. 
And I would like to say thank you to all the presenters. So as you can see, there are a lot of ideas, a lot of energy in the whole ecosystem. So I'm really looking forward for the development of Open Run and everything beyond. Thank you very much, Artur, for hosting this part. And big thank you to all of our partners. Let's move to the next part of the conference. Welcome uh, Adam Flisikowski uh, on the stage, my dear colleague from IS Wireless. Adam is uh, leading the R&D team at IS Wireless, and he is behind this uh, agenda of this whole conference today. So, Adam, what's the conference will be about? What can we expect today? Thank you, Rafał. So, welcome everybody. My name is Adam Flisikowski. I'm leading the R&D team here at IS Wireless, um, and. Uh, well, the team is composed of uh, senior researchers and young researchers, but uh, our message here today is that uh, the role of research is fundamental uh, in the de development of 5G systems and beyond uh, 5G systems. So, as we are the software company and software house um, developing the full a stack solution with the GNOB, ENODB, RIG, CORE, MANO, and all the elements that are needed for the Beyond 5G, uh, we need to tightly cooperate with our software developers because from the research side, we know that there can be some great ideas, challenging ideas, but we need to be able to match and map them against the systems that we have on a table. Uh, in our case, uh, that, that needs us to cooperate with our software developers very tightly. So, from this point of view, I would like to say that uh, we started as or was already initiated by our CEO, Dr. Sławomir Pietrzek. Uh, we started the research story long before 2012, but uh, till 2012 we've been delivering the software libraries for the 4G link level and system level simulations. Uh, and now we are also uh, soon exposing the 5G new radio uh, simulation. Uh, for the link level, uh, but uh, the experience there uh, helped us to ignite and leverage us to, towards the European projects where we entered in 2012. Uh, by that time it was uh, FP7 calls and projects, now we are uh, having Horizon 2020 projects uh, with us running, um, but uh, all this actually is taking us to the uh, statement that uh, the research we are doing is very often reaching well ahead of time. We can imagine like 10 years ahead. So the elements, technical elements and research elements like selfie, where we focus, machine learning and AI, it's used to the placement and prediction of workload. Um, uh, other things like in the history, like LDPC, NOMA, and, uh, and now NOMA as well for the 6G, they always needed time to be able to be implemented into the real systems. So this is something that uh, we need to face uh, with our developers. So the research we do is innovative, uh, but we need to always like try to match uh, with uh, specifications that are somehow our frame and, and, and the boundary for what we do. So. Um, SD-RAN that we have developed, so G node B, E node B, and the, the other elements of the wireless systems, um, is actually um, also the place uh, that is now uh, the solution is being commercialized, it's put into the market in the first deployments, but it's where we cooperate a lot. I'm highlighting the word cooperation, and I believe among cooperation there's also interdisciplinarity of, uh, of domains, of, of, of competence, and also com com complement complementarity of competences uh, that we need to have in order to proceed with the 5G onwards. And that's why please have a look at this nice mixture of, uh, of uh, presenters, speakers and panelists and also the topics that we prepared for you to give you the nice, um, nice feeling of, of where the research is heading for Beyond 5G. So we believe that with the SD-RAN we are already having the baseline and now we are actually going ahead with the research of the Beyond 5G and 6G. So uh, we are uh, tightly linked to the standardization, so 3GPP, ETC, ORAN, this is where we are looking tightly, but not so tightly to not do the research and let us elaborate and evolve towards the beyond 5G and towards the 6G. So from this point of view, we are working on solutions that increase effective SNR uh, to the users that uh, actually help 
um, predict and place the workload um, in the edge or cloud or between edge and cloud in a hybrid fashion. Uh, we also work on uh, addressing the re radio resource management, which is our core competence uh, for the, both all the three uh, triangle um, elements of the 5G, like EMBB for maximizing uh, the capacity, like URLC for maximizing reliability, and MMTC for maximizing the amount of connected devices. So uh, from this point of view, we put a strain on our developers because eventually they need to face it and they need to uh, develop it in the solutions. And sometimes this uh, makes a lot of challenges. We need to talk, we need to discuss, and we need to cooperate tightly. So I believe that the researchers around, but also the professionals and industry experts around know that we have very nice momentum now. We have 5G that is being deployed, we have 5G evolution that is being defined, uh, and we have a roadmap towards 6G, expecting 6G to arrive in 2030. So from this point of view, the current 5G software-based uh, architecture is something that uh, is giving us a great potential because it has flexibility and it has a lot of potential to ingest, uh, inject actually the research results um, into it. So we keep uh, tightly connected to the use cases as well. As a researcher, we need to follow uh, the, different, uh, the different alliances and groups. I already mentioned Oran, but also AIoT. Uh, recently, we joined 6GIA for the SNS partnership um, and the cyber mate in Poland was mentioned by, by our colleagues as well. So, okay, uh, Rafa was asking about uh, the idea for the conference and like to introduce it. So the, the, the recipe is simple. We thought that we will cluster great people, great researchers, but also great industry experts. Uh, we will uh, mix uh, very interesting highlights of the topics uh, for the research together. Um, and uh, we'll, by this, show the complementarity sorry, of uh, experiences that are, we believe are needed to go beyond 5G. So I hope you will be able to, to see it and experience it. So from this point of view, I would like to say that we are very happy. Uh, we are very proud and honored with the um, speakers and panelists. Uh, you will be able to see, you already seen first, but you will be see, see, see some more. And for the outline, uh, I would say this is very simple. We'll be having five hours of uh, exercise, uh, of a great um, information uh, and dense information about about the highlights from the research. Uh, we'll be mixing presentations with the panels, not to let you fall asleep or lose focus. So we'll try to, um, to improve the quality of experience of our, um, our audience by, by this time, by, sorry, by this way. And also, uh, as you already seen, we have a really best uh, in class hosts, Alexandra and Rafa, that will help you be guided through all the conference. So I hope the conference will be very uh, interesting for you. Uh, I wish you the fruitful conference. I will be returning to you uh, in the end of conference and also in the moderated panel. So that's it, Rafa. Thank you very much, Thank Adam. You. It looks really, really uh, interesting. The agenda is amazing. So yeah. let's start the conference. Yes. Thank you. Let's start the conference with uh, a keynote presentation. Uh, which will be delivered by John, uh, by Dr. John Vardakas from iQuadrat from Spain. The title of the keynote presentation will be Beyond 5G, where are we heading in open run networks? Uh, John, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for, uh, uh, for uh, this opportunity to, uh, to speak to your, uh, to, to, to this conference. I think that uh, it's a very interesting conference with a lot of experienced researchers presenting their ideas and discussing their ideas. Uh, so, uh, without any delay, a more, more delay, I would like to, to discuss with you how we are heading. Uh, oh, sorry for this, someone started some construction works. Uh, where we are heading in open run uh, networks and going beyond 5G. Um, so, in, and in order to do that, I thought it would be a very good idea to consider how uh, we are envisioning going uh, uh, towards beyond 5G or even 6G networks uh, by considering open run, uh, by presenting our approach in the newly uh, 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 research EU project where Equadrat, my company, and I was also as wireless participating. This is uh, the project Marshall, 
And in order to do so, I would like to start uh, by giving some background, uh, uh, background approach in order to, uh, to present how we uh, were motivated to uh, develop such a, a network configuration uh, for 6G networks and how uh, we are considering uh, uh, Open RAN and uh, the Open RAN Alliance. So uh, some background, uh, this, uh, background discussions. Uh, uh, probably most of you already know this, uh, some stuff about this. Uh, in the last few years, you know that the, the CRAN design has become a prevalent a, a front hole solution that connects centralized and remote network components using uh, common public, uh, the CPRI over Ethernet. However, as the, uh, the, the fifth generation of new radio uh, network deployments become more dense, uh, high capacity front hole infrastructure is required in order to support this, uh, uh, their operation. The high centralization of the CRAN and the use of the CBRI require very high front hole data rates and impose strict delay uh, demands. For example, a target delay lower than uh, 100 microseconds in the CBRI for 5G. Uh, so, uh, in order uh, to provide a solution, uh, uh, we noticed uh, that a, a number of converged fiber wireless technologies have been introduced in the CRAN to support fast broad connectivity, relying on usually on analog radio over fiber transmissions and exploding the spectral efficiency of millimeter wave frequency bands. Uh, so the, uh, uh, this analog radio over fiber front hole uh, enables the multiplexing of several signals over the same uh, optical carrier uh, and the functional splitting between the baseband units and the, the RRHs, for example, splitting inside the physical layer or between the, the, the MAC and the physical layer that can be managed by the, uh, by the operator, by the mobile network operator. Uh, of course, various splits have been uh, described in the, in the evolved in the ECPRI specification. Uh, and based on this approach, in our previous uh, uh, research uh, work, uh, we have uh, been uh, working on a front hole solution that is mot uh, motivated by the capabilities of this fiber wireless convergence. Um, this is the architecture that you can see in this figure, uh, where we have a rooftop uh, RRH serving a number of lamppost RRHs through a millimeter, uh, through millimeter uh, wavelengths in the 57 to 66 uh, gigahertz uh, band. The lamppost can serve a number of end users that generate from uh, traffic managed by the by the MNO, uh, the operator. Uh, that is the, the, the centralized BPU and the remote uh, units, the antennas. Uh, the network intelligence, sorry again for the noise, uh, is located at the centralized analog baseband uh, unit that communicates through Ethernet port uh, uh, with, uh, with the BPU. The RRH is connected with the CA BPU, the centralized analog uh, BPU, through a dedicated fiber link and emits direct pings to the lampos. And each lamppost is connected to the to the to the antenna to the RLUs with uh, w uh, with Ethernet uh, with Ethernet links. Uh, the millimeter wave band is split in half. Allocated uh, we allocate four gigahertz to the uplink and four gigahertz to to the downlink traffic. And the functional split between the uh, centralized the and the RLUs is performed inside the physical layer. Uh, so we have option seven. Uh, and we place some of the radio functionalities, uh, of course, at the, at the, at the RRH. A similar functional split is performed between the, uh, the centralized BPU and the RUs. So we, uh, we uh, uh, consider this approach, this converged analog, uh, sorry, converged, sorry, uh, wireless uh, uh, and optical network configuration in order to, uh, uh, to develop a new network configuration based on uh, novel uh, radio edge uh, technologies. Uh, this approach is uh, the main core of the, this uh, an, a new uh, research project that we are working on also together with, uh, with Eyes Wireless. This project is called uh, Marshall. Uh, and uh, um, uh, the main feature of Marshall is to propose a new paradigm of elastic virtual infrastructure that integrate in a transparent manner a variety of uh, novel radio access uh, 
networking, management, and also security technologies, which be developed uh, under the Marshall framework in order uh, to, uh, to deliver end-to-end -end transfer, processing, and storage services in an efficient and uh, secure way. So uh, this is the uh, this figure uh, uh, provides the main, uh, let's say, components of uh, of our, our network configuration, uh, and our uh, innovations are the radio edge, the regional edge, and uh, some uh, work on the on the core. Uh, so in order to do that, we uh, focus on three main pillars in order to enable this new generation of ultra dense, cost efficient, flexible, and secure networks. We have the network design pillar. We have the virtual elastic infrastructure pillar and the network, the network security pillar. Now, for the network design, uh, we uh, uh, push to cell-free networking uh, towards. Uh, uh, we push, sorry, we push cell-free networking towards a, a distributed processing cell-free concept, and also enable wireless millimeter wave solution, which will be integrated. And uh, with existing uh, VRAN ele elements, while, and this is one of our key uh, innovations, being in line with the Open RAN, Open RAN Alliance. So we, we consider a new network configuration for the, for the radio edge part, uh, tar targeting to be in line with the Open RAN Alliance. Also, in the second pillar, we, uh, this, this second pillar is uh, built on, uh, based on the elastic edge computing notion targeting to optimize the, the functionality of the MEC and the network slicing management uh, system, uh, both of them through a hierarchy of analytic and decision engines. And of course, we are also considering the network security uh, part by developing a novel machine learning based mechanism that guarantee privacy and security in multi-tenant uh, in, in multi environments. So, uh, from this, uh, let's say, high-level description, you understand that uh, at, at the radio ends, our uh, focus is on the uh, consideration of the cell-free networking. And I, I thought that it would be nice to start by providing some uh, uh, high-level description of this, uh, this approach, uh, the cell-free uh, massive MIMO concept. Uh, okay, this, this person can be considered as a beneficial incarnation of a general distributed massive MIMO concept, where, where in the most common cell-free configuration, we have a large number of access points geographically distributed uh, over a large area uh, that serve uh, usually a lower number of UEs with the aid of a front hole network and, uh, and a centralized um, uh, pro and a CPU operating in the same uh, time frequency response. Another approach, which is based on the cell-free concept, is a radio stride, which considers many antennas embedded in, the cable, in a cable uh, or an adhesive tape, which can be easily installed anywhere in outdoor and indoor uh, areas, such as uh, city squares, cultural places, malls, stadiums, uh, airports, train stations, uh, factories, uh, etc. Uh, and this, this specific uh, approach has been uh, proposed by Ericsson and Nikopkin University. So we consider this cell-free approach in our network configura uh, configuration of Marshall uh, in, uh, in two ways. We have two different network configurations for the rest uh, for the radio edge. The first solution that you can see in this figure is based on this, the, the distributed processing uh, cell-free concept. Uh, where we are working on the development of novel uh, of a novel cell-free uh, paradigm, disaggregating the original CPU of the, let's say, the common uh, cell-free approach in many uh, distribution units, in many DUs, and supporting distributed computation and coordination between access points and between DUs. Uh, in this scheme, uh, we consider clusters of access points connected to multiple DUs, and uh, we are working on the, uh, how to jointly address the uh, inter-DU and the AP to DU coordination for the first time. Uh, and this approach should also consider the constraints in, uh, introduced by the front hole and the mid hole links, uh, mainly in terms of uh, capacity. And going a step further, we uh, we are going to pro uh, to uh, to improve uh, the, the network by proposing data-driven dynamic cluster formation algorithms with emphasis on real-time operation. This is the first approach of the radio edge, and the second approach is uh, 
based on the development of a new hybrid MIMO front hauling approach specifically targeting cell-free networks with advanced beam forming and beam shaping uh, capabilities. Uh, therefore, we have a new uh, access point topology adaptation in cell-free networks and advanced scenarios can be supported with uh, access point uh, reassigned to different user on demand as you can see uh, in the figure based on the, the network configuration. Uh, also, we have point to multipoint connectivity, which will be supported through beam shaping from multiple access points. This approach will unlock practical self free deployments in, uh, six, in five, beyond 5G and 6G networks, allowing them, allowing them sorry, to significantly increase spectral efficiencies through uh, network densification and interference cancellation. Uh, uh, however, we uh, for for both configurations we target to be in sorry uh, uh, in alignment with the Dioran Alliance architecture, which represents as uh, you probably know evolution of the the, the CRAN by further disaggregating the, uh, the BPU and complementing the 3GPP standards through a, 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 um, a foundation of uh, VRAN network elements and packet-based interfaces. Uh, the open RAN disaggregates the BPU uh, in a DU, in a distributed unit with, uh, with real-time operations and functions, and the CU, a central, a central unit with the, the non-real-time functions. The CU is further disaggregated in the CU user plane uh, and the CU control plane, as you can see uh, here in the figure. Uh, in our work, we uh, target to, uh, to deploy the, the user plane function, uh, <coughs> sorry, the CU user plane function and the DU uh, at the radio edge. And the, uh, the control plane, the CU control plane at the, at the, at the near real-time rig at the regional edge. The cell-free uh, physical layer functions, the modulation, the pre-coding, uh, et cetera, uh, which are part of the, uh, of the access points, the considered access points, will, will be integrated with the, with the DU and the MAC scheduler through a 5G FAPI-like interface, adding in this way a cell-free support in the open RAM architecture for the first time. So this is one of our key uh, innovations. Uh, uh, so uh, in order you know, to, uh, to briefly sum up uh, how we target to contribute uh, to the ORAN, we target to contribute with many cell-free related innovations to the open RAM architectures. We have the distributed cell-free networking support that will be implemented as part of the ODU module appropriately modifying the physical, the MAC, and the RLC suppliers. We have the cell-free radio resource management uh, uh, that will be implemented as part of the near uh, real-time uh, rig. We have a complementary distributed radio resource management solution, which will be also developed as part of the DU, uh, which lo be, uh, will locally schedule resources of the underlying infrastructures at the radio edge and complement uh, the, um, the, the global view provided by the uh, provided at the level of uh, near uh, real-time rig, and also extensions of the existing interfaces and control plane protocols uh, will be uh, uh, applied to, to, to different to, to various uh, reference points. Uh, points, for example, the front hall, the E2, uh, the O1 interfaces, etc., in order to incorporate support for the, the self-free the self uh, networking of the radio edge. So you can see that we target to contribute with many uh, innovations, self-free based innovations to the, to the Oran Alliance. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, we are also working, uh, and this was <clears throat> our uh, uh, initial approach to, go, uh, to, to work on the, um, uh, base, uh, to, to work uh, by considering a converse optical wireless configuration. So uh, in, the, um, uh, in the discussion of the network uh, management pillar, the second pillar of our, of our work, we envisage a new paradigm of edge infrastructure based on the notion of elastic edge computing, aiming to overcome the isolation and to also the, uh, the, the underutilization of the resources deployed at the, at the edge, at the edge nodes, uh, targeting to offer zero-based latency to smart connectivity applications. 
So, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we are motivated by the previous approaches targeting optical wireless conversions in the CRAN architectures that I presented at the beginning of my, my speech, uh, which uh, were mainly centralized, and thus uh, uh, they can be uh, considered as optimal solutions for, the, uh, for our approach at the radio edge. We have a dis disaggregated uh, VRAM. Uh, we also consider the fact that the open run is also mainly centralized since the orchestration and the autom automation layer is deployed at the core tier. So in Marshall, we are working on the implementation of a novel hierarchical control plane solution, federating this, the SDM controllers of the fixed uh, segment, the mid hole, and the mobile uh, segment, the self free uh, run uh, of the network under a common. Uh, orchestration subsystem. Uh, so for the control plane of the mobile segment, we propose the segregation of the non-real-time uh, SDN control function into two functions, into the near real-time SDN function that we, we hosted at the, at the near real-time RIC at the, at the regional edge. Uh, in, uh, in this way, we have near real-time reaction to work variations uh, which can be supported at sub-second time scale, uh, time scales. Uh, we also propose the deployment of the software-defined trans uh, transport network controllers at the radio, uh, at the, sorry, at the regional edge to control the fixed uh, segment uh, of the network that will be implemented by using standard optical ethernet technologies. Uh, both domains will be federated under our uh, uh, core tire, uh, tire NTO based on Etsy OSM, which will provide network as a uh, net sorry, network slicing as a service functionality uh, uh, as per the 3GPP uh, specifications. Um, uh, this will be achieved by considering this uh, interface in the, o, uh, the OR uh, uh, WI interface, uh, southbound SDN interfaces uh, that will allow the network slicing as a service subsystem to orchestrate the life cycle management and configuration and reconfiguration of the slices for both domains, for the fixed and the mobile domains. Uh, also, uh, we proposed a novel fixed uh, mobile conversion solution to facilitate the integrated connectivity of both fixed uh, users and mobile users in order to uh, be able to be applied to network to existing network configurations. Uh, so uh, we, we consider that they can, these two uh, users can share the same mid and edge infrastructures and are both served by the, by the core. Uh, fixed mobile conversions is considered uh, a key, a vital strategy that will result in a big, uh, big saving operations uh, savings. Uh, hence, 3GPP and Protocol Form are jointly working on the standardization of this approach. Uh, in our in our work in Marshall, uh, uh, our solution involves a, a two transmission approaches, seamlessly integrated at the regional edge, includes, including a, a point to point uh, uh, links. <coughs> Sorry, uh, with or without the consideration of WDM, wide length division multiplexing, and a, a PON approach, a point to multi point approach based on XGSS PON modules, as you can see here. Uh, such devices allow uh, point to multi point connectivity using smart XGSM PON uh, transceivers. So we consider both approaches. Uh, point-to-point -point links and also point-to-multi-point -point links through a passive optical network configuration. Uh, based on these features, uh, the Marshall Converse Optical Wireless Approach offers a high degree of flexibility, allowing capacity to be dynamically shared by both fixed and mobile clients, clients sorry, leveraging on the aforementioned hierarchical control plane. Uh, so uh, this is uh, our approach on how to uh, consider a converse optical wireless configuration in um, 
uh, in the Marshall uh, in the Marshall uh, uh, network, and how we envision the uh, the the uh, the, the cell-free approach in the radio edge in order to be in order to provide connectivity to a large number of uh, of users. Uh, and some fa uh, the fact sheet of, of this project in order to uh, uh, to see some details. Uh, we started in the, at the beginning of uh, of this year. Uh, with a total persons of uh, over uh, 700 uh, uh, person months. You can see all, uh, all the partners here. Uh, in uh, Spain, we have Equadrat and CTTC, uh, Orange, KU11, uh, Farotech, Acceleran, uh, Ice Wireless, of course, and from uh, Greece, we have OTE, uh, Intracom, and the University, the National University, Technical University of Athens. Uh, uh, Ebos from uh, Cyprus and Melanox Nvidia from um, uh, from Israel. The project manager is uh, Dr. Miguel Bayaro, and I am the technical manager of the project. Uh, and this uh, uh, concludes my talk. I would like to thank you again for this opportunity to present uh, our work and our uh, vision uh, on uh, beyond 5G and uh, 6G networks. Thank you very much. John, thank you for this keynote presentation. Uh, I think it's a great beginning of the of the conference today. So thank you again. Uh, now I would like to invite you uh, for the panel discussion, the first out of five we have planned for today. The first one will be about security challenges in Beyond 5G. It will be moderated by Professor Jordi Mongai Batala from Warsaw University of Technology uh, from Poland. Uh, and the members of the panel will be uh, Dr. Elżbieta Andrukiewicz from the National Institute of Telecommunications in Poland, uh, Professor Raimo Kantola uh, from Alto University in Finland, uh, Ahmad Ilyas, uh, expert from VTT Technical Research Center, also in Finland, and Ian Goetz from Dell Technologies from the UK. Jordi, please take over from here. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are now uh, as presented about security in 5G and beyond 5G networks. Uh, I want to present the panelists today uh, for this first panel. Um, Dr. Zviet Andrukiewicz is the Chief of the Evaluation Laboratory at the National Institute of Telecommunications in Poland. She's evaluating, she's evaluating network and IT equipment under the common criteria scheme. Uh, the second panelist is Ahmad Ilzat, is a research scientist at the VTT uh, Technical Research Center of Finland. He's working on security of wireless networks as well as on machine learning in communication networks. Um, the third um, panelist is Raymond Cantola, is a tenured uh, professor at Aalto University in Finland from 2010. His current research is on cooperative security for the internet, trust management, software defined networking, policy management of communications. Uh, and the last panelist, uh, Ian Goetz, is a chief architect in Dell, in Dell Technologies, located in the UK. He's working for many years on the construction of mobile networks and now in 5G. So it's my pleasure to, to moderate the panel today. Uh, we are talking about uh, issues of security of 5G. Uh, as, we, as we know, uh, is one of the most important issues uh, in the construction of the 5G networks and in the future networks. Um, it has been, uh, in 5G, it has been provided the idea of the security by design uh, that uh, should provide much more security in the network than in previous generations of mobile networks. So uh, under this vision, I wanted to, to ask to the first uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Admar Ilias, uh, Ahmad, in your opinion, are there any security issues that have not been suffi sufficiently addressed in the current 5G network developments? And if if yes, which ones? Mr. Ahmad, we cannot listen you. 
you are mute. Okay, hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you also for this uh, opportunity to talk in this panel and uh, overall for, for this conference. So the uh, in terms of security in uh, uh, future wireless networks uh, beyond uh, uh, 5G. So there are um, uh, still, I think, uh, some challenges uh, and uh, that need uh, uh, research. Uh, the first one I will start from is the uh, use of AI or machine learning to be specific. Uh, they started early on in 5G and the security aspects uh, when the machine learning started uh, in wireless networks have not been uh, taken uh, very well. Uh, in my opinion, concerns related to data integrity and confidentiality on which the models uh, will be trained uh, is one of the uh, remaining issue when we talk about using AI. Um, uh, I would also like to uh, put into the uh, uh, view of the audience that uh, machine learning, uh, the use of machine learning start, started pretty um, uh, early in the domain of wireless networks. However, the main challenge that uh, remained with this, uh, the use of machine learning was that uh, borrow and use uh, strategy of uh, machine learning techniques from other well uh, researched and matured uh, disciplines such as machine vision. Uh, that led to kind of using the machine learning models and algorithms uh, which were uh, kind of common in uh, kind of uh, closed systems uh, started being used for open systems like wireless networks. So um, there are inherent limitations in machine learning and that will uh, kind of exacerbate the challenges of uh, wireless networks. Uh, in terms of security. So that is one of the main uh, issue that still needs like uh, further research. The other issue is like in uh, 5G, um, uh, this um, the use of IoT was very uh, prevalent and it was like one of the main uh, kind of selling point of, for 5G beyond uh, after 4G. Uh, the users' uh, data rates and those were like pretty much good already in 4G. Uh, the integration of IoT is um, still not in uh, in that shape as it was uh, imagined, like by 2020, how many IoT devices will be used. IoT devices, when they are studied and uh, there are now proper research uh, uh, carried out in uh, IoT devices. So they have um, uh, security problems already in their operating systems and uh, uh, even their firmware. So if uh, those are integrated into the mainstream wireless networks, they can cause uh, many challenges. And the two most prominent one I would like to bring in front is the, um, using kind of uh, uh, them to launch DOS attacks because they are not secure enough itself. And the other one is uh, uh, kind of pressing more an existing challenge, that is the signaling uh, problems. So the signaling storms, IoT devices, uh, if they are connected in such a huge number, which people kind of, uh, in some research, in some research papers, um, the researchers uh, brought, uh, kind of uh, thought that they will be in millions. And so if you connect them into a network and they start signaling attacks, it's, uh, it's going to be still a uh, uh, prevalent research problem. And uh, when, if, um, for example, we combine the AI and IoT, uh, kind of both having problems, uh, the security challenges can really exacerbate. So these are the, uh, my main thoughts on the uh, existing challenges um, that, uh, that will still uh, remain in, uh, beyond 5G. So uh, did I already? Thank you, Thank you very much, very clear. Uh, I wanted to, to add another question to uh, Professor Raimo Cantola. Uh, 
as we know, the concept of 5G is quite wide at this moment. It is accepted that 5G will integrate several radio access technologies, such that a common packet network will be deployed. In your opinion, uh, Professor Cantola, is this concept of integrated network bringing in new challenges to security and which are they? Uh, Professor Cantola. Uh, yes. Uh, uh... Good morning to everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I'm sorry about the lack of video. Uh, my uh, web camera is broken uh, yesterday, and uh, I couldn't replace it in time. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, at least the audio is uh, 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 normal quality. Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. No problem. All right. To the question. Um, uh, basically, uh, the more complicated a system is, the more complicated is the supply, supply chain, and the wider is the attack surface, more options for configuration errors exist. Uh, and we should also be aware uh, of the well-known issue that backwards compatibility requires that it is possible to fall back to all the procedures uh, that may be less secure than the new ones. Uh, so uh, sometimes we need to be maybe need to be uh, ready to sacrifice compatibility for the sake of security. Uh, also, the cloud system that runs the core uh, needs to be uh, uh, secured properly and very professionally. Uh, and this also applies to the private networks. In private networks, uh, we expect that there will be new players uh, building mobile uh, cellular networks and whether they are able to uh, handle the rather complicated cloud security on their own private platforms uh, is uh, a worry. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your concrete response. Um, to, to Dr. Zviet Andrikevich, uh, Mrs. Andrukovic, security and security assurance, we know, are two terms related but not identical. Uh, which is the co current situation of security assurance for 5G infrastructure? How can we understand the term security by design? Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. And first, obviously, I... Uh, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me here. That is really challenging. And everybody is talking about the security at the moment in 5G from a few years. And that's to go, I would like to just give you some broader uh, perspective, security versus security assurance. Security, it's everybody says is the data confidentiality, integrity, etc. This is really a good, a very old definition definition, preservation of uh, confidentiality, integrity and, co and availability of information or data. That is a very philosophical uh, definition and uh, that it represents some sort of state, you know, to be, to be secure or not to be secure. That is some sort of Shakespeare in my brain. But uh, from the Practical perspective is a rather um, complicated to to introduce security um, as a philosophical term. It's rather something like a set of activities, not state, but rather activities to identify, to detect, to protect, to respond, to react, and to respond. So that is a simply a, some sort of framework for <clears throat> for many many. Uh, standards uh, describing security requirements. And this is a security. Security is some sort of, of, of the characteristic of the object or the, the system, whatever, yeah, people even. Coming back to security assurance is some completely different thing. We have at least two dimensions of the assurance. Assurance is the state that the, somebody would like to specify security requirements and uh, build the product, the service, the system based on those security requirements and implement them. And uh, somebody else would like to check, prove, demonstrate 
that the object is secure enough according to the specification, according to security requirements. That means uh, this some sort of uh, uh, demonstrating or, or even, even prove that security specification is sufficient, security requirements are sufficient and properly correct to implement. And this is the some sort of confidence to somebody else that this state is proven, uh, the status is proven. So you can see that in, in describing security, you have uh, only one actor, I am secure or insecure. And in the security assurance, you have at least three actors, three stakeholders. One is the customer who is confident that everything is correct, that is secure is proven. The second is developer, the vendor who design and, and implement security specifications, requirements. And the third one, the evaluator who checks and even prove that all those requirements are correctly implemented, correctly uh, working functionality is proven, security functionality is proven. So coming back to this landscape at the moment, very, very last question, sorry for prolonging my, my speech, is that um, at the moment in Europe, we are developing at the NISA, this uh, 5G uh, cybersecurity certification scheme based on the um, well-known and widely recognized standards for, uh, for security specification, in fact, developed by 3GPP and uh, TC Cyber and some other, other um, standardization organization that is the first thing is that if you have a security specification in widely recognized uh, standard that is a base for for proper evaluation that could be probably uh, explained later on so at the moment the, the project is ongoing and uh, the first phase for implementing uh, European cybersecurity scheme, cybersecurity certification scheme is scheduled for next year, but works are, uh, are, are developing, the group are, are being set up and, and we can expect some, some first result on this work uh, at the beginning of next year. Security by design, that could be probably explained later on. Jordi? Thank you very much. So, uh, good response it was clear. I wanted to, to ask to Jan Goetz. Uh, um, Jan, one of the issues of security in current and mobile future networks is the problem of trusted certificates in the network. Mm -hmm. How is it mm -hmm. currently solved this in the network? Um. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, present and talk on this panel today. Um, I've only been in Dell a, a short period of time, so uh, this is my first uh, outing on a, on a conference uh, for Dell. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's certificates at the moment. I, th I think probably one of the most uh, recognized areas where certificates are used in the current networks on 4G is the security gateway situation. So you've got in um, 3GPP the recommendation to at least secure this control plane traffic on the backhaul between the base station and the core. Um, so on the S1 interface, the, the signaling into information would be in an IPsec tunnel. The IPsec tunnel is originated at the base station, terminated on a security gateway in the core network before it's passed into the um, MME, EPC, etc. Um, it's also uh, recommended that uh, you can do the user plane traffic as well. So many oper operators actually just do both and you end up with about a one gig tunnel from a base station to the core. That certificate situation is managed by PKI server sitting in the core. Um, so the base station picks up, security gateway picks up the certificates and that's managed. Now that rolls on into a 5G situation. So now that, ten, that one gig tunnel is at least a 10 gig tunnel. So significant amount of bandwidth increase and also IPsec capacity increase, but the same basic process applies. Um, it's also used for 4G small cells. So, you know, when you turn on a 4G small cell, it will automatically generate um, a request for PKI certificates and is, is verified that way. When you get into the, um, the, the kind of the new areas, uh, it, it, cloud RAN and uh, probably more likely open RAN, 
Um, you're now splitting apart that base station, RU, DU, CU, as we heard earlier. Um, and now there's the option. Uh, most of the operators I've spoken to want to use this option, which is to put IPsec on the mid-hall interface between the DU and the CU if they are separated. And in some cases, even if they are uh, on separate servers inside the same cabinet. Um, so that means another set of certificates have to um, go through, but obviously that would use the same basic capabilities as we've seen on IPsec tunneling um, from, uh, you know, from the, the backhaul uh, IPsec situation. I think if you then open it up and start looking at some of the points I think Professor Cantler um, raised about the core and the cloud, obviously you have to make sure your core network cloud is secure, i.e. from attacks from the outside. We have the basic firewalling instances, but also how do you make sure that if you get a, um, a, a virtual function um, that's in that cloud and it gets compromised, how it doesn't infect all the others. Take those concepts and then how do you take that to an edge cloud that's now potentially in a remote dark site, no people there, um, where the CUs are, are located. That could be a building, nice lock on the door, et cetera, but still a remote site with no people. And then you get out to what is now a, basically a very highly distributed cloud, which is servers running at base station sites to, to do DUs and CUs. You've got to make sure that all of that cloud capability is protected, that you can bring that server up. Do you let the software for that server come down once the server is turned on, or do you ship it pre-configured? What we're starting to see is people want to see that shipped, pre-configured, and tested so that you know the software that on it, that's on that server is the right software and it is trusted. And then picking up, I think, the first uh, discussion, then there's the other problem of we say 5G is inherently more secure, but one of the uh, the large open doors that has never been fixed even since 2G, is that once a device is connected to the network and authenticated uh, up in the core on the, um, you know, the, the HSS, et cetera, it's trusted. The traffic coming through that device is assumed to be trusted traffic. Now, in the case of a, a handset, you can run um, a cafe or so, you know, some other software on your handset to constantly be looking at, uh, at the uh, in terms of security. On an IoT device where it's battery operated and you know, uh, you, you don't really want to be running security software 24-7 on that device, and it probably hasn't got the processing power to do it. You do have to be concerned about that device being compromised. It's out in the wild. Um, you know, people can access it without anybody noticing, and then they can mount attacks. And you either spot that through the signaling patterns, which was suggested earlier, if it's a, a DDoS or a signaling type attack, but if it's actually buried inside the traffic, at the moment, there aren't many ways of getting access to that traffic before it hits a core network function, the UPF, if you put that at the edge. So maybe there are other techniques. You know, people uh, debate the bump in the wire model from uh, from Etsy Mech being able to inspect IP traffic inside GTP before it gets to that core network UPF. Um, core network guys don't tend to like uh, Etsy Mech, but um, it does give an opportunity to open up the GTP, look, see if there is a um, any kind of attack in there, and obviously deal with it before it hits anything critical like the the UPF, which would then transfer that traffic on up into the uh, core network functions and potentially uh, take down the network. So I don't know if I've completely answered the certificate question, but um, hopefully you. Yeah, sure, sure. Many thanks. You 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 spoke about. Uh open RAN about multi-provider networks. I think this is a very interesting concept in, also in, the, in this conference mm -hmm. especially. Uh, I wanted to ask which kind of challenges you see for this uh, kind of network where we have many providers of uh, different parts of the infrastructure and um, I don't know, also related with accountability or with, uh, with these problems you, you touched before? Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing, uh, you've probably seen in the in the telecoms press, Dell's had some success this year with uh, deals in open RAN space using our uh, open RAN service. As I said, what we're effectively doing is creating a highly distributed cloud where that cloud could be thousands of instances of one server or maybe two servers or three servers, depending on the model right out of the base station site could be distributed with the DU and CU out there, or it could be the DUs at the base station, the CUs in an edge cloud, or indeed a split model where the RUs at the radio site, the DUs in a street cabinet, and the CU is in, a, in an edge cloud site. Um, what we're seeing is operators uh, and ORAN in general looking at the issue of I could have a, an RU from one vendor, 
DUCU we're seeing quite often is coming from the same vendor, but then the O-Cloud software, somebody else, the uh, the security software could be from somebody else. The server is a completely different vendor. NIC cards are from different vendors. Um, you've got uh, the, the, the potentially the RIC and the SMO coming from other vendors as well. And that is a massive integration issue. Uh, and when you think about the way operators consume base stations today, you know, um, a, a lorry will turn up um, from either Ericsson or Nokia or one of their partners for delivery, and everything's in a cabinet, and it literally is lifted off the lorry, dropped into position, power, backhaul, and radio heliax plugged in, and away you go. Um, that's the operational model that operators are used to, particularly when they're growing. They're growing at a rate of hundreds of base stations a month. They don't necessarily want to adopt a new model. So how do we fit this multi-vendor cloud capability into that model? And it implies there needs to be a systems integrator uh, who is able to pull all of that together, um, work with all the individual partners to bring those functions together, pre-integrate, pre-test in a CI, CD type environment so that as each vendor in that systems roadmap produces another software release, which means you have to go through and retest everything. You can do that and you can then roll that, that new software out to the already installed base stations, but also update what you're doing. And as I said earlier, ship stuff from a, the, the factory with the servers pre-configured, pre-racked, all the software is in there. It's tested so that you've got the minimum config to do at site, because obviously this base station is being put in somewhere because there isn't an existing amount of coverage. And therefore, you're probably not going to want to download it over the backhaul link um, and, and sit there with a little man with a with a laptop um, doing all the work, trying to configure it at the side of site. So I think those are some of the issues moving towards that. There is a role for that kind of systems integration, one throat to choke type organization that sits in front of the different organizations that pulls it all together and makes sure it's ready to go out. Thank you. Mm, thank you for all this information, very practical, very interesting. Uh, remaining in the issue of multi-provider networks and open run, I wanted to ask to Dr. Andrukiewicz, uh, which are also the challenges uh, of security assurance in these kinds of networks and how security by design could be provided in open run and multi-provider networks. Can you give yeah. us some guidelines? Yes, uh, that's it's a really interesting thing that Jan said about this biggest challenge also in the uh, area of uh, of assurance because uh, at the moment seems to be we are really we can what we can do uh, speaking of the people responsible for assurance for example labs testing labs and audit organization that could check various part of the process of, of developing the let's say network element that is fine that is already covered by standard evaluation standards uh, and seems to be sufficient seems to be sufficient although not everybody would agree that is uh, mm, inexpensive enough for example and time for consuming a process uh, all drawbacks related uh, with assurance activities so the temptation to to do it uh, at the easiest level as easy as easy as, as easy level as easy as possible it's one one side of this this process on the other hand this uh, extremely uh, complicated ecosystem uh, consisting of uh, many many products from many producers from vendors in, in operational uh, phase uh, maintenance issues all those things seems to be not not covered sufficiently by current and existing methodologies and that it's uh, open a floor and a good space, what is already, mm, I would say, mm, at least partly implemented in the product assurance schemes mm, is the multi-assurance uh, mm, approach to evaluation, but in the product, in the product only and on the level of product only that could be extended to the 
cloud, that is a really a challenge, and then could be extended to multi-layer, multi-provider, multi-everything uh, ecosystem of current 5G network or the future current uh, future 5G network. So multi-assurance is the key, a uh, key issue and key challenge for, uh, yeah, today's uh, assurance schemes. Obviously, that is the first thing is to have a standard with security specifications, security requirements. That is another challenge. And then methodologies for evaluation. So, yeah, a lot of things to do before people and for people who are really think about the multi-assurance in such a complicated, uh, complex uh, systems. Thank you very much. Uh... I wanted to go a little further, to go in the future. I wanted to ask also to Professor Cantola, which do you see uh, which uh, challenges will uh, appear for security uh, in the networks beyond 5G in the future? How do you see the situation? Right. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, 6G uh, goes beyond communication. It is also about sensing and programming the world. So the physical world and the digital world will be interleaved and connected very tightly. Uh, this actually requires end-to-end -end communication security. So end-to-end, -end, it's not enough that the uh, 6G network itself is uh, secure. It also uses a data network and uh, uh, to reach the end-to-end, -end, we need to uh, look at uh, this uh, segment, 60 segment and the wide area segment. Your moderator, can you If you don't, then fake Dear information... Dear panelists, uh, uh, kind reminder that the time is running up, so um, very last minute, please. Thank you. So fake information could cause uh, failure modes that are catastrophic. Uh, so, uh, the 6G industry uh, needs to get to the driving seat in terms of the wide area as well. And, and also, we are trying to do ultra-reliable uh, communications in uh, 5 and 6G. Uh, what's the point unless our uh, wide area is uh, on the same level? And to end, uh, it's still needed in order to get the thing done, get a use case running uh, in an ultra-reliable manner. Uh, at the same time, we rely on IP in the wide area, uh, which has a focus on single path and in, uh, needs routing convergence. Uh, so the, uh, uh, for a single flow, availability performance uh, is limited by these factors. Uh, the uh, Gs, these are starting for 2G to 5G, they have become bigger in terms of handling the uh, device to uh, mobile network operator relation in terms of trust. Um, and in, in, in 5G, even we are doing better than 6G or uh, in, in, in a 4G. Uh, but uh, the relation device to device, user to user has not been tackled. So in order to uh, really uh, upgrade the networks for this world where sensing and programming the world are part of the picture, I think we need to sort of uh, take a wider view on uh, security overall. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so we, we saw a little bit the, the uh, environment of 5G security. Thank you for all your comments and we can go ahead with the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.
Thank you, Jordi, and uh, our panelists. We'll now move to the second debate of our conference on Central and Eastern Europe approach to beyond 5G networks. The debate will be led by Adam Flizikowski, head of R&D at IS Wireless. Adam will be joined by Professor Viktor Melnik from John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin, Poland. Professor Arturas Medeisis from Vilnius Gediminias Technical University in Lithuania. Professor Libor Michalek, uh, VBS Technical University of Ostrava in Czechia. And last but certainly not least, Janes Sterle, PhD from the Internet Institutes in Slovenia. I hope I pronounced all your names correctly. Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ola. Can you please pass me the divisive okay if i may welcome uh, dear panelists uh, i'm very happy to be the moderator of this panel uh, as ola already introduced this panel is about uh, the eastern europe region and its contribution to the 5g and beyond 5g especially so we have collected um, great uh, panelists so basically uh, I will, I will not repeat, of course, the uh, introduction that Ola gave about all of you gentlemen, uh, but uh, from my point of view, I would like to just mention to, the, uh, to our audience that uh, uh, our uh, presenters, our panelists uh, actually represent various uh, aspects related to 5G and beyond. I would just mention that on one hand, we'll be dealing with the hardware elements and uh, FPGA and some programmi programmability of dynamic programmability of devices. Um, in combination with IoT and um, uh, cyber physical systems. Uh, this is some uh, perspective that uh, Professor Viktor Melnik will be representing. Uh, Professor Libor Michalek will be also mentioning aspects and, and actually presents the 5G uh, related to real use cases and the campus usage of 5G in the in the Czech Republic. And from uh, our uh, third uh, guest, so uh, Professor Arturas Medeisis, uh, will be more seeing the perspective of radio spectrum management and more um, strategic planning and supportive, uh, supporting of the regulations point of view or expertise, basically. So just to give you an additional view um, to what uh, my colleague uh, Alexander has presented. And Janes, Janes will be um, uh, representing the side of the industry, so Industry 4.0, private networks, um, also the, the uh, link to the IoT and the gateways that uh, will be somewhere behind the 5G and, and the, be between the user, the user equipment. Also, he represents the, the point of uh, 5G test automation, but also is able to deliver the full stack solutions. So gentlemen, I would like now to have a first question to you. Uh, I will be asking you the question and then I would um, highly appreciate if you could more or less control uh, that we can stay within a couple of minutes, like three minutes would be very optimal. So first question I would like to ask you. Oh, we can see Victor, Professor Victor Melnik is also joining us. So the first question I have to you is, what is the current focus of the research um, in the region regarding the 5G and evolution? So I would like to ask each of you one by one. I think we'll start with uh, Arturas uh, to answer this question. So Arturas, the floor is yours, please. Thank you and uh, good morning everyone. Indeed, as mentioned uh, by Adam, uh, we uh, locally here are very much interested in uh, spectrum access issues because uh, we still see that uh, there is a lot of demand for spectrum for 5G and especially evolution uh, beyond 5G. It will demand uh, new bands, new uh, spectrum access possibility, both in licensed and unlicensed spectrum. And also we see that even with current bands, we still have some unresolved issues regarding coexistence with existing legacy systems. Until now, we have some uh, cross-border issues which are preventing our uh, universal deployment of even 3.5 GHz band. And even if you move further to 3.8, 4.2 GHz, 6 GHz band and so on, it clearly spectrum access is very critical in our view. Uh, another aspect which we see uh, requiring a lot of attention also is time of uh, type, type of modeling of uh, new radio networks, uh, new radio and beyond, uh, such as uh, things like how to express quality of experience of end users, how to measure it, because definitely with uh, beyond 5G systems, we will have uh, uh, many different scenarios uh, and in different uh, type of uh, applications also. Uh, 
universe and also different verticals. So how all this combine into uh, some kind of uh, contiguous uh, quality of service is really something which needs to be uh, defined and properly measured. And uh, finally, even such classical things as wave propagation and emissions of antennas is still something which is demanding attention because, for example, new active antenna systems are still a big challenge for modeling, for understanding, um, and even, uh, for example, aspects such as uh, EMF, human exposure compliance. It's a very politically sensitive issue with a lot of uh, uh, people, so that's why it is really important to learn how to model it and how to uh, verify this. And also, uh, uh, speaking of pass loss modeling, is new elements such as 3D pass loss modeling, things like indoor modeling, things like different artifacts such as bridges, uh, viaducts. Uh, still, it's actually not so simple and requires some further research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Uh, so let's have the same question. So about the current focus of research in the region, uh, I would now ask the question to Professor Viktor Melnik. Viktor, please. We cannot hear you. I think you are muted. I can see you are muted. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry, sorry. It's good. It's fine now. Yes, yes, yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, good morning again. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in the, this event. Uh, I'm grateful to my uh, colleagues from uh, IS Wireless for the invitation. I will try to brief, briefly present uh, the experience and focus uh, of myself and my team, which I'm uh, honored to represent today uh, in this field, uh, focusing on activities regarding 5G. Uh, we have been researching and developing computer systems hardware for over the, the 20 years last. Uh, and uh, it is important that both our previous and uh, recent uh, experience finds uh, direct application in 5G uh, during the complexity and uh, multidisciplinarity. Uh, since uh, late 19th uh, and some of uh, our team much earlier, we designed specialized processors for various applications, uh, among which are telecommunication, uh, signal and image processing, cryptography, and, uh, and more. Uh, we developed uh, an approach uh, to design IP cores uh, from this, uh, from the basic RTL level and uh, created uh, IP core generators and afterwards uh, system level design tools. Uh, one of them uh, is a chameleon system which is able to automatically generate VHDL specialized processor descriptions from a high level of description uh, specification of the algorithm. Uh, this uh, system utilizes a new processor architecture and uh, a new model of uh, computation. As a result of a number of scientific works in the last decade, uh, on the basis of this chameleon system, the concepts of design of uh, self-configurable FPGA-based computer systems were developed uh, for general purpose high performance computing, for embedded systems, uh, and for real-time systems. Uh, in recent works, uh, the basics of creation of self improvable computer systems based on reconfigurable hardware have been also developed. Uh, our current focus of uh, research is the study of uh, possibilities of applying our technologies uh, and tools in uh, 5G and beyond systems. Uh, among them are following. A basic one is uh, specialized processors designed for 5G devices. The second, I see a specialized processor automatic remote synthesis for FPGA-based devices uh, of edge computing in uh, IoT. Uh, the third one is IoT node self-configuring with cloud-based uh, automatic design and synthesis tools. Uh, uh, the next one would be self-improvable embedded systems and uh, for edge computing devices uh, in IoT. Uh, of course, uh, the list doesn't close here, and uh, the prospects of the use of automatic remote creation of computer devices uh, in 5G and beyond systems are very interesting and promising. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Uh, so the same question about the current focus of research, uh, I would ask, like to ask to Libor. Libor, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, welcome from Ostrava. Welcome from Czech Republic, Hi. from the Eastern part of Czech Republic. Uh, so I would like to present, uh, or I want to tell you something about our joint research and future development. Uh, our university in Ostrava provides uh, 
uh, most than one year uh, the campus network, 5G campus network, which is private network, one of uh, the first private network in Czech Republic. Uh, we are mainly focused not on research directly, uh, things about 5G, like like optimization or, or uh, new, new things about 5G, but we want to use and find a real use cases, uh, which will be uh, helpful and which uh, 5G can help uh, for for providing new 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 use cases. For that purpose, we have a new building, uh, which is something like a test bed uh, for new things connected uh, with the uh, future and connected with the industry 4.0. We are mainly uh, concentrated on uh, three research areas. Uh, one of the research area is smart factory with the elements of, of uh, uh, industry 4.0. Uh, the second one is automotive. Uh, automotive, uh, we close cooperate with Skoda Auto where we want to uh, develop a new type of autonomous driving system. And the third one is, is uh, uh, the area of e-health, healthcare. Uh, this uh, all areas uh, offers us a lot of opportunities where the 5G, where the, uh, where the uh, let's say uh, challenges can be can be done, and uh, this is the area where we uh, want to cooperate. What can, what can we uh, contribute? Is uh, of course uh, a lot of uh, research areas, including digital twin, uh, edge computing, uh, robotics. Uh, we are good in IT, IT sensors, uh, in in a smart living uh, and positioning, and uh, the joint research and development is crucial for us in the field of 5G, and uh, that's the reason why we want to use uh, 5G network, our 5G campus networks in real, real, use, case, real use cases and, uh, and cooperate uh, with, with some, uh, some potential, potential partners. Yeah, uh, that's, that's maybe all for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Libor. Uh, it is very interesting. Uh, so now uh, we, are we are looking for the response from Janes. Last but not least, La Janes, please tell us about your, the research focus in your area. Yeah, good morning to all from Ljubljana, from Slovenia. So first, it's my great pleasure and honor to be here with you on this exciting 5G event. As in being introduced by you, I'm leading a young and technology intensive SME located in Slovenia called Internet Institute. So let me first talk a little bit about what we do. So our core business is in providing 5G products and services for various vertical industries such as smart factories, industry 4.0 ports, and other, let's say, industrial sectors that needs reliable and, of course, forward-looking communication solu solutions. But let me start our story from the beginning, how we actually started with 5G, because I think this is quite interesting, you know, uh, because we are actually a startup. So we started our company in 2014. Um, we saw, let's say, a 4G and upcoming 5G technologies as this disruptive that will replace, let's say, legacy in many cases, vendor proprietary and close professional communication systems such as Tetra and DMR. But if you're a startup, you know, for sure, uh, only good idea is not enough and you need also capital. In, and of course, in the capital, I mean human knowledge and also money resource. And from our previous positive experience from university, we saw a lot of potential in strong international partnerships and of course in this Horizon 2020 project funding. Therefore, we have embraced this concept fully. So uh, we were quite lucky that we started our first, let's say, international 5G development project in 2017. Today, we have six ongoing 5G projects, which are all related uh, to ports, PPDR, Industry 4.0, smart factories, and automotive verticals. But what it is really, really and more important are the actual results. Based on that, even though we are a startup, we were able to build three key 5G products. Now we have our own private 5G mobile system running on commodity hardware, supporting cloud-native principles with run virtual run capabilities. And all these components are fully orchestratable with OSM Mano. In addition to that, 
because of the state of the art or because of the state of the market of the industry we have also built our own industrial IoT gateway of course which is uh, with all the backend components and which is operating in 5g not just standalone but actually also in the standalone so and last but not least we already have also in the production our 5g test automate solution optimized for mobile cloud and fixed environment which is also supporting full 5g stack so all these products actually already support not just only non-standalone but also actually standalone operation um, which is of course our target and will be tested in real industrial environments such as sport utilities factories ppdr and automotive and um, this wouldn't be possible without, uh, let's say, today's motto, which is 5G mates together. So, Adam, I give you the floor back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Janes. Uh, yeah, this is very interesting, and yeah, we share many of your uh, expressions about the challenges that uh, the SMEs are facing. This is this is fully true. Um, so. Gentlemen, uh, with this question now, uh, we have a uh, couple of minutes more to speak about additional topic I would like to ask you for, for commenting. Mm, so actually the question is, uh, because, uh, okay, we are all Europe, but the question is, what are the key strengths of the Eastern Europe, especially when we look into the future of beyond 5G networks towards 6G and next generations? So can you please uh, give your thoughts? Uh, what is the strength of, of our region of, from your point of view. Uh, I would again like to ask uh, Arturas first. Please, Arturas. Uh, thank you, Adam, again. And uh, uh, speaking of uh, key strengths, I would uh, first of all highlight uh, uh, that I see a very rich R&D environment in a small and medium enterprises, especially a lot of uh, startups. And all this uh, create very highly dynamic and highly diverse ecosystem, which uh, uh, spans the entire spectrum from uh, hardware, especially in IoT. I see a lot of activities uh, to software applications and software solutions. So overall, this creates very dynamic and very open uh, to novelty, to uh, innovation uh, systems, uh, such as, for example, Open Run and similar similar developments regarding beyond 5G. Uh, also, uh, I personally, uh, speaking of soft kind of uh, issues, I would see that we have very good and positive hands-on engineering attitude, which uh, also coupled with some local uh, contextual issues uh, helps to devise new deployment scenarios, new deployment models, uh, finding new solutions, which all enrich the overall kind of portfolio of available 5G and beyond um, solutions and frameworks, such as uh, finding specific solutions to local telecom infrastructure challenges, uh, specific addressing issues, for example, with digital divide, we still have some remote issues, remote areas, which require some novel approaches, for example, fixed wireless access at gigabit uh, rates. I mean, this is something where uh, systems uh, 5G and beyond could be definitely helpful. And overall, uh, definitely uh, what we see also sometimes that being uh, uh, this agile, it allows us I'm to jump sure over some generational issues. Some so, for example, we could uh, jump uh, maybe already to beyond 5G, even sleeping some of the, for example, non standalone 5G in some of our solutions. So that's why I believe that we are very kind of well posed for uh, participating in uh, beyond 5G development. Thank you. Okay, I, I don't know if you can still hear me. I'm looking here. Yes, okay. So, Arturas, thank you very much. So, I would have the same uh, question uh, and ask Libor to comment about the special strengths of uh, Eastern Europe for the beyond 5G going into this direction towards the 6G. Please, Libor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, I think that uh, the special, we have a special position uh, in Eastern Europe because the uh, development of 5G started and this is the right and good uh, place uh, how to uh, start thinking about, uh, uh, let's say, a real use cases. But because what I'm missing is that uh, if still the 5G networks are, are growing, uh, still I think there are no real enough of real use cases and of uh, real uh, implementation where the 5G is uh, for sure necessary. We think we, we still hear that 5G is, is coming, 5G uh, will be will be better, but uh, from uh, my perspective, I think that uh, we, we need to find real solutions, uh, real use cases where the 
5G can be can be can be provided and can be uh, really used. Uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, the uh, parameters of, of such of such system, like uh, uh, very high throughput and uh, moreover very uh, small latency. Uh, we are talking about ultra low latency systems. Uh, so uh, uh, these these the, the are the challenges. Uh, we are uh, uh, the uh, we are the partners of, of National Center of Industry 4.0, which combines a lot of universities in, inside the Czech Republic. And uh, this is the uh, good field to, uh, let's say, uh, consult and discuss uh, all these things where the, where the 5G can be, can be, uh, can be used. And uh, I think that uh, the perspective is, is, is really, really good, but uh, uh, first we need to, to discuss it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Libor. Uh, so now directly I would like to ask Victor to have the comment to the same question about potential. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you. Uh, I see two key strengths of Eastern European region uh, which are following. Uh, the first one is uh, availability of uh, skills and expertise in developing solutions for 5G and beyond. Uh, we see that representatives of different countries in the region have rich, uh, diverse and uh, complementary experience in the skills uh, needed to create systems for 5G and beyond. Uh, industry uh, members need to know about that and uh, join forces in the future to gain better results. Uh, it is important to form uh, associations and a consortia of industry players uh, and uh, actions like today's uh, contribute to this. Uh, among our key strengths, uh, I would single out the uh, mentioned before new processor architecture, which seems to be particularly effective for IoT nodes uh, in 5G, uh, and the availability of system level design tools, uh, as well as uh, developed concepts for self configurable uh, FPGA based uh, computer system design and self improvable computer system design. Um, the second, the second strength uh, that I would mention is uh, availability of uh, support for leading, uh, for, for realizing ideas and uh, implementing technical solutions, uh, conducting research and practical implementation of the results. Uh, Today is uh, available mostly through uh, grant funding, uh, with funding programs like uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, it is uh, important that uh, grant programs create uh, opportunity for stakeholder cooperation and implementation of uh, applied projects. Uh, along with this, uh, there are also issues, uh, one of which uh, is uh, not uh, fully adequate funding scheme, for example. Uh, we know that uh, the amount of allocated funding, the grant funding, is calculated using uh, some coefficients in accordance uh, with the adversary, uh, with the average salary in the country. And uh, in, in countries where average salaries are not high, uh, such as uh, here in Ukraine, uh, we have a situation where IT professionals are not enough motivated to work in grant projects uh, because uh, in commercial IT companies the salary is higher in times. Uh, the solution uh, here may be to take as a basis not uh, the average salary in the country as a whole, but salary in the field of IT. And uh, uh, I hope that in time it will be solved. So thank you. Thank you, Victor. So, Yanis, um, please uh, comment uh, about the challenges, so not the, sorry, not the challenges, but the key strengths, of course, of the Eastern Europe partners from your perspective. I would appreciate if you can be, uh, let's say, finishing in the two minutes because our time is really short. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. So, I believe that our key strength should be knowledge, openness, innovation, transparent collaboration, and for sure, in strong business partnerships. If we want to be competitive in the future technologies that will, that will have the biggest impact in the next years, let's say, on the development of our European international industries, this is the only way to go. You know? 6G, future cloud system, and artificial intelligence are actually on the doorsteps. You know? And with each new technology, complexity of our ecosystem is growing. Therefore, it is hard to be super excellent in every single domain. So, 
this is why we are currently, let's say, heavily investing in strong international partnership to develop ahead of time this advanced know-how and this technology, let's say, core areas. For us, and I believe also for this Eastern, uh, let's say, teams, Horizon Europe is one of the main instruments for the future collaboration and beyond 5G development. And it should be, let's say, heavily exploited, you know. But what is the main point I would like to stress out? We shouldn't forget that all the new technologies are by the nature disruptive. If we want to move to this space early, we can get, let's say, this needed recognition and competitive advantage. And this is something that should be exploited by the young and innovative teams in Eastern Europe. And let's my, do, do my final thought, you know, uh, which go also to the entrepreneurs and established professionals, I would say. It's never easy to go out of the comfort zone and verified patterns. So, but if we do it, the final reward can be so much higher. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great summary of uh, our panel. So I would like to very much thank you for your participation and uh, sharing the view of the uh, key strength and also what the research uh, is per being performed at the Eastern Europe part. And we can definitely see, although the sample is small, uh, we only have uh, four panelists, but they represent a very strong and powerful uh, potential that uh, definitely should be and will be used for the beyond 5G and towards 6G and next generation. So, gentlemen, it was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, and we are now having the next panel. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Hello. Thank you, Adam, and uh, our panelists. Uh, this was not the last panel uh, of today. Uh, I would now like to welcome uh, our speaker, um, who is uh, Professor Sophie Polin from uh, KU Leuven in Belgium. Um, Professor Polin will tell us about Massive MIMO in uh, cell-free and future front call capabilities in the Beyond 5G run. We welcome questions. Uh, you're welcome to post them on YouTube channel, and if time allows, we will ask them. Sophie, the floor is yours. I'm sharing my screen. Um, voila. I think you can see my screen now well. Eh? Yes, thank you. OK, thank you. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this uh, very interesting uh, conference on a topic that I personally enjoy working on a lot. So today I will talk a little bit about uh, Massive MIMO cell-free and what it means for um, the beyond 5G radio access networks. Um, so yeah, first of all, what is Massive MIMO? I think you're all quite familiar uh, maybe with the concept, but the idea of Massive MIMO is that uh, starting from the traditional cellular concept, we would add um, many, many more antennas to existing cells. So here you can see, and I'll make my pointer a bit more visible for you. Um, here you can see a traditional cellular network with base stations with a lot of processing power and here also for massive MIMO a lot of antennas. And in this case I have here um, shown three cells, five users and n is the number of antennas per cell but that's that for all the massive MIMO performance models. But what is the most important thing is that in the state of the art most of the papers consider uh, the pilot contamination, uh, the interference only during the pilot contamination. So they say all these cells can reuse the same spectrum. And only during the channel estimation phase, you should make sure that there is no interference between neighboring cells. And if you can get a good channel estimate, all these massive MIMO base stations can precisely direct the signal towards the users and there will be no remaining interference. What we did, uh, we tried to, to, to verify this assumption. So we created a, mass, a massive MIMO setup with two massive MIMO cells, and we were one of the very first um, to, to quantify actually if this is true. If, when you have a perfect channel estimate, you can uh, really assume there is no interference. And we've shown that there is still significant intercell interference even with perfect channel estimation. So here you see some more um, results of our setup. So of course, um, we are at the university building, so our measurements are not perfect. We try to eliminate, 
emulate as much as possible a realistic setup. So we set our base stations at the top floor of our university building, not at the roof. We tilted them down uh, eight degrees, which is more or less uh, realistic. And we created two cells next to each other here on the ground. Here you see how the performance scales as a function of the number of antennas. So we had 30, 64 antennas in total, which means we had 32 antennas per cell. And we scaled the number of antennas from 18 to 32 to serve. It was a quite dense scenario that we tested here, 18 users per cell. And here you see what happens if we do uh, with single cell MMSC. So here, which means every cell is doing the processing independently without any information sharing. And with a multi-cell MMSD, every cell is still doing the processing locally. So we only use the antennas available per cell, but there's some information shared between the base stations so they can eliminate interference from neighboring, neighboring users. In this case, we, we assume we have perfect channel state information. So there's no pilot contamination or interference happening during the channel estimation. First thing you see is, of course, the more antennas you have, the better the performance. But the most important message from this figure is, if I only do my single cell processing, my spectral efficiency is really significantly lower compared to the case where I do multi-cell processing, which means that the massive MIMO neighboring cells to collaborate. Then we went a step further and, and, and uh, quantified the case where the two base stations would not only share information, but really do the processing together as if they were one big 64 antenna cell. In this case, if you have 64 antennas, uh, the number of antennas per cell is bigger. So you have a, a more, process, more array gain that you can potentially create. The most important is uh, that you compare these two lines. So here is the case where the two cells share the spectrum, have perfect channel state information, but do the, lo the processing locally per base station. And the best possible spectral efficiency you can get is almost 20 uh, bits per second per hertz. Well, if the two base stations would collaborate and do the processing together, you see that you get um, up to um, <laughs> easily higher than 70 bits per second per hertz. So this motivates that with massive MIMO, there's still a lot of interference, and it makes sense to make neighboring cells uh, collaborate, right? So this is where the cell-free MIMO ID popped up. So in cell-free MIMO, the idea is I have many access points, possibly with many antennas per access point distributed in a, in a region. I, combine all the received signals together in one big processor, and I process everything together as if it was one very big access point. It's exactly what we did in the previous one, but in the previous one, we were only combining the knowledge or the signals from two such cells. And with a selfie concept, you really go a lot further and you combine the, the signals from all access points. Another advantage of the cell-free system is that it naturally links to the ORAN terminology. Because with ORAN, you could do your central processing here in the ODU, and you could do still some processing in the ORUs here um, to kind of relax the capacity constraints of your front hall. Of course, if you start with this cell-free concept, you easily see some people in the state of the art notice that Sometimes it does not make sense to combine the signals from all the access points, because here this user is located only to two access points. So it does not make sense to use the signals from these far away access points for this user. So people have proposed some methods to reduce complexity, um, even for the self remind case. The first uh, type of methods that we can find in the literature are what we call user-centric clustering. With user-centric clustering, we will select the best access points around our user. So you can see this here. I've drawn some uh, zones around our user. And we only consider these access points for every user. The disadvantage is that this, the, the number of signals that you have to combine for every user uh, type processing uh, depends on the location of the user, and it, it becomes a bit complicated from a management point of view to see uh, how we have to combine all these signals. 
So some people have then uh, proposed what we call the, net, the cell free with network centric clustering. In this case, you just go into all predefined somehow which access points you're going to combine always, and it makes your network management a lot simpler. The disadvantage of this uh, network centric clustering is, of course, that there can still be users that are somehow in the middle of two clusters. So this is again the same problem as we had with cell edge users. No, it's not cell edge, but cluster edge users. So they still um, have a significantly lower interference than cluster center users. Eh? Also, if you look into this uh, cell-free with network-centric clustering uh, methods, you see that it easily leads to a concept where we have not only one ODU, but you could have two ODU, which I draw here. So here, if you have network-centric clustering, the processing could happen easily per cluster, right? But then if you do the, the, the processing per cluster, and so this cluster processes all the signals for the users in its cluster, and this uh, ODU processes all the signals for the user in this cluster, you have a problem with the cell-edge user. So what you could do, you could start from this distributed uh, network-centric clustering method and instead add cooperation. So by adding, by adding cooperation between the ODUs, they could share some signals or some information, which, which could be uh, channel state information, it could be estimate, signal estimate, it could be decisions, uh, de decoded bits. Uh, it's still open to see what's the best way to collaborate. But by doing some information sharing, we could enhance the performance for our cell edge users. Of course, in the limits, even with uh, ODU cooperation, they could share all the signals and we could find methods, um, cooperation methods, that in the end result in a full self-free um, processing because they really share all the possible. So what we did in the Marcel project, and it's also our focus, is really to start from this distributed self-free with network-centric clustering methods, but then see to what extent we have to add cooperation to get as close as possible to the best possible performance. First thing we did is, of course, try to quantify what kind of performance improvements we can expect uh, with all these kind of cooperation methods and, and etc. So we set up a self-free network in our um, office. Uh, it's a bit quite dense, uh, but it was a lot easier for us to set it up compared to an outdoor measurement. So uh, what you see here is you see basically um, eight cells, so eight access points with eight antennas, and you see a positioning system on the ground with here four uh, users, but we can move the users to basically any position and can have virtually uh, thousands of users emulated. So with this kind of measurement setup, we can, we can create a lot of channel databases. And from these channel databases, we can, uh, we, we can do all kinds of methods. So we can split the network in this dimension or in this dimension, uh, allocate this access point to this user or the two closest to this user. So we can, we can do a lot of user to access point allocation methods, um, signal processing here, uh, methods to, to compare actually the performance of different methods. So uh, to make it a bit more visual, so my access point from the previous slide are these. My users are here on the ground. Uh, my processing, my distributed processing is here uh, there, for logistic reasons here at this. Uh, so one is there and one is here. You don't, so here is the second one, here is the first one. And we connect them uh, dynamically and try to benchmark uh, several options. Voila, so this is uh, the result. So we, we started with several options, option one, two, three, four, five. And this first option is actually the simplest one. And the first option, we do all the processing on the RU. So it, I think it links to a 7.2B ORAN split. And so we, we, we have 10 users, it's RU, and every user is allocated to the closest RU. The RUs don't collaborate, there's no coordination, and this is the spectral efficiency you get. The second, option is still doing local uh, signal detection per RU, but we exchange some information between the RU to improve the performance of the users that really are at the cluster edge. 
So really in between two are you. If you, if you see that by this cooperation, you get a significant improvement. And so the black is an option too. This is with cooperation. Um, the, the curve shifts here. Then we have um, option three, four and five. So these options, I think I made an error in the numbering, but anyway, so option three, four and five, yeah, it doesn't matter. Option three, four, and five, they are together, they are with central processing. So in this case, all the signals are co combined in the DU, but remember we have two DUs. Huh? So it's not central processing in one big DU, it's central processing in two DU, because we still have two clusters. And in the third option, we have um, two clusters where the processing is not happening at the access point or the radio unit, but it's happening in the central unit um, without coordination. So we have two clusters with cluster edge users that then have a worse performance. So this is um, the option you see here. So this is the black one. If we do cooperation, so this, this means in this case, if we do some cooperation only for the cluster edge users, then we see that we move to the pink curve. So it's already significantly better. If we do full cooperation, which means actually emulating this case, the white one, then we see that we have um, a really, really the best possible performance. So what we can conclude from this here is that um, it really makes sense to collaborate. And it also makes sense to do centralized processing at the DU and not so much on the RU. Of course, in reality, um, it's a, lot, a little bit more complicated eh? because we have a lot of things to decide if we have many users and many distributed radio units, because we have to decide which radio unit to allocate to which user. And also in the central processing, we have to decide which interference to cancel and uh, for which users. So here I kind of uh, did a um, um, performance analysis of different mapping of users to antennas or to radio units. And here we have different methods. Uh, so the full MMSE is really con cancel all the interference and the partial MMSE is cancel only some interference, right? Okay. To make a long story short, um, the best is of course uh, using all antennas centrally all together. There you get the best possible performance, and also there you could decide to reduce the complexity and only uh, process some signals. This is then the performance you get. By clustering, making smaller clusters, so two clusters of 32 antennas, you, your performance drops. And by going to eight clusters, so eight antennas per cluster, your performance drops even more. The, the real challenge will then be, how can we still do clustering? and collaborate between clusters so we can get to the same performance as we have with the full centralized process. And we're going to zoom in into more details. It's a bit too technical, maybe. Um, just to say cell-free uh, and practice, the summary of all this, uh, from our studies, we see that centralized processing is offering really higher spectral efficiency, and it should be uh, considered. Of course, if you do local processing, um, the performance is significantly lower, but it's a more scalable architecture. And we need really more challenge to more research to see how we can get to a scalable architecture with the performance that is as close as possible to the centralized processing. So we need to think how to share information, what to do locally, what to do centrally, because if you have to do everything centrally, it really becomes um, expensive for your front hall, but it also becomes expensive for the processing because there's a lot of matrix uh, processing you have to do centrally. From our view, inter-DU cooperation is critical because uh, here you see the effects you have just by simple uh, cooperation between processing units and share some information. Um, the question that remains is, how much could we gain if we could make our clusters more flexible? And because now we have our eight, and eight access points, we split them in two, four here, four there. If we could uh, dynamically um, allocate our use to DUs in a more flexible way, depending on where the users are, 
maybe we could um, get a better performance. However, in reality, that's a bit difficult because we cannot really do this easily, except if we would have some kind of millimeter wave um, front hole or X hole. The idea being, so I'm almost done with my last slide, that I here have a millimeter wave phase array. I can create multicast beams to my different access points, sending the same information because they, they're basically um, serving the same users. Uh, so this is the first thing we're trying to work on at this moment, how to do this multicast flexibly. And I could then dynamically decide to allocate this access point to the blue cluster by just creating another blue beam in this direction. But we not only want to do multicasting, we also want to create different disjoint clusters, two of them. So we should do multi-cluster multicasting. So we're, we're now working on some uh, millimeter wave technology to achieve that. But that was my last slide because I'm already over time. So here, um, the conclusion is um, we need cell-free MIMO to solve the inter cell interference. But even if we have cell-free, we still have clusters. So then there will be interference between clusters, right? It's the same problem. There are two solutions that we're looking at. The first solution is a coordination between clusters, or the U coordination, we call it. And the second solution is flexible clustering to make sure that the clusters are better around the user. And for that, we need a flexible allocation of the ORU to the OD. Thank you so much. And sorry for taking a bit more time. Thank you, Professor Pauline. We are up against the clock, so we will skip the questions. But thank you for sharing your interesting uh, insights. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to welcome our next speaker, Professor Geir Horn from the University of Oslo in Norway. Uh, Geir will tell us about core challenges in the workload placement for beyond 5G. Geir, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm in a place where the network is, is really bad, so I will... Um switch off my video, probably when we um, keep going. Uh, let me see if I do this one. And then it should be possible to do like um, this one. And this one. Come on. Come on. Uh, okay, I'm sorry about that. Apparently, my virtual box has stopped. Um, mm -hmm. um, does this work? Sorry, it's completely dead. You can see the slide, yes. But the problem is that it, it seems to have, uh, I have no response here. So uh, wait a minute, I will stop sharing and then maybe, uh, I'm sorry about the delay. Um, is it possible to have a coffee break or something? It seems that my computer is hanging. Okay, so let me then uh, fix this problem somehow. Um, then let us have a small break. Yeah, five minutes, please, if that is possible. That will be excellent. Ah. Okay, sorry about this. I. I, I need a restart, it seems. And it's a demo it's effect, so we know that.
Dear audience, apologies for a delay. Due to technical issues, we will switch the order of um, our speakers. So uh, let me welcome Professor Ana García Mada from University Carlos Ferd of uh, Madrid. Ana, it's great to see you again. Uh, Ana will tell us about non-coherent communications from Massive MIMO to RIS. Um, let's, uh, let's keep to the agenda uh, in terms of duration. So, Ana, the floor is yours, uh, 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am a professor at uh, University Carlos III of Madrid in Spain, and I work in signal processing for communications and I have the pleasure to share some projects also with IS Wireless. Let me share my screen so we can start with the, with the presentation. Let me know if everything is okay. I hope it is. Okay, wonderful. So then um, I'm going to talk um, about um, non-coherent communications from, from Massive MIMO to reconfigurable intelligent services. Uh, so first of all, let me say what are non-coherent communications, because probably you are more familiar with the coherent uh, usual approach. Coherent uh, detection is what we most usually do, and it requires to have a replica of the carrier at the receiver with frequency and phase synchronized with the transmitted one. And it also needs to have an estimation of the channel attenuation and phase. This is what we usually call channel state information. Once we have all this, then we can uh, have uh, the receipt signal to be correlated with all the possible uh, transmitted signals and then decide what was the most likely to have been uh, sent, right? However, there are other um, ways to do this, and there is non-coherent detection that doesn't need any reference wave, doesn't need any carrier phase to be recovered in the receiver, doesn't need any channel state information at the receiver side. And it is possible with several uh, modulation schemes. However, there is some penalty right in the performance. Because there is some penalty is probably why we are more used to performing coherent communications because this leads to an improved performance with respect to the non-coherent, but at the expense of having to acquire this channel state information. So what we usually do is we send some known, known signals, some pilots. These pilots go through the channel and at the receiver, we will have some kind of function of the known pilots and the channel. So we can guess what was the channel and use it for our demodulation. But of course, if I am sending pilots, I am not sending information. And maybe we are facing some cases where this information is very much minimized due to the pilots. And that is why we think perhaps it is now a time for non-coherent communications again, because communication started being non-coherent and then we went through to the coherent ones. Why? Well, because when we consider the needs of obtaining and sharing the channel state information, then there is a theoretical loss that uh, may become negligible as I say, we, when we consider all this channel state information. We know already by also some theory that this channel estimation can be wasteful in many circumstances, in particular with channels change fast or when we have a lot of noise, so low SNR. Uh, and we know that in current communications, channel state uh, information estimation and sharing can become quite complex. And in particular, this is the case of massive MIMO that was presented by Sophie. On the other hand, uh, non-coherent approaches may solve this bottleneck of the channel state information for massive MIMO, and they can benefit from what I call the magic of massive MIMO. What is this? This self-interference cancellation that we have when we have many antennas may improve the performance of the non-coherent approach and make it close to what we are used to uh, obtain with, with channel state information. So then um, it makes sense 
to concentrate on uh, the use of non coherent approaches for massive MIMO. Well, we already have uh, seen a presentation regarding massive MIMO. We know it means to have many antennas, many more than what we usually had. And this brings a lot of benefits, right? In as the number of antennas increases, then the data rates and the reliability can increase because of the multiplexing and diversity gains of the MIMO. We can decrease the transmitted power. And we can do all that with very simple precoders and decoders because it turns out that precoders that were very suboptimal for a reduced number of antennas become almost optimal when we have a large number of antennas. Usually we put this number of antennas at the base station, either concentrated or distributed, and usually we keep um, single antenna users or, or, or maybe two, three, four antenna uh, user equipment, but not, not many more. So this is uh, in general massive MIMO, but again, in massive MIMO, usually we need to obtain this channel state information. And since we have many antennas, we have many channels. At the end, we must switch to the TDD, time division duplex, because this is the only way of practically estimating that many channels with calibration, but still with the other pilot contamination issues, and Sophie was mentioning. Well, of course, there are solutions, right? There are solutions in the literature, but what is clear is that obtaining a good channel state information if massive MIMO is problematic. So then we would probably like to move. And if you look at the possible requirements for site for 6G, I've seen 1000 kilometers per hour written somewhere. So this is high mobility. And high mobility worsens the problem. Because if we are static, then okay, we can of course transmit a certain amount of pilots, and this will decrease the throughput of our useful data, but maybe not substantially. But what happens if we move very fast? Then the channel changes very fast, and we need to send pilots very often. And then the amount of pilots can be overwhelming, and at the end, our throughput is really really reduced. So if the channel changes fast, we need more pilots. And if we need more pilots, we have low efficiency and low data rate, low throughput, which is against where we want to go, right? That's why there are some uh, recent researches about using non-coherent approaches for massive life. And there are essentially two approaches in the literature. The first one uh, consists in using ASK, amplitude shift killing, which is an energy detection at the receiver. You don't need the channel, you just detect energy. And uh, this, uh, there are very interesting theoretical papers that show that really we can achieve in terms of rates, nothing different from the coherent schemes, of course, asymptotically. So if we have many antennas in a large uh, massive MIMO uh, system. However, if we want to do something practical, these schemes really need too many antennas to be feasible. And there are uh, other approaches that are based on differential PSK, which is where uh, my group is working. And here we can see that uh, with respect to single user performance, we require much less antennas than in the ASK, but also we have ideas to multiplex multiple users through the constellation design. So what I'm going to explain from now is our approaches uh, of differential PSK. Based on the, some preliminary paper that you see here, and also some other papers that I will, I will mention. So how does this work? If we focus in a multi-user uplink, we will have several users that are going to transmit a signal that has to be PSK, PSK, whatever number, and then we do some differential encoding before transmitting. We will have a base station with many antennas, so at the end, more antennas than users, as usually in, in, in massive MIMO approaches, and we will have a channel at this point in the Preliminary uh, work is flat fading, but later we will see that it doesn't have to. Well, what we're going to do is 
uh, with the signal that we receive at each of the antennas at the base station, we are going to perform a very standard non coherent demodulation. That is, we compare the transmitted received signal with the previous one and we obtain the phase difference. And we are going to perform an average of all we obtain with all these antennas. And then we obtain here a decision variable that hopefully will be useful, right? This is what it should, okay? Um, and it should, but let's see what we get here, because we get a, a mixture of many, many terms. And we obtain the user's information from all these many terms? Well, yes, we can, right? First, let's see the first term. This is a joint symbol. So this contains the information of all the users that were uh, transmitting simultaneously. So if we uh, make um, use of a concept of a joint symbol to demodulate the individual uh, information, we can work with this. But we have many other things. We have the channel here, we have a lot of interference, but we have a lot of antennas too, right? And based on the properties of these large uh, matrices with a lot of antennas, uh, we can get rid. We can get rid of the channel effect because it will go to one. And we can also get rid of many noise terms that also will decrease as we increase the number of antennas. And we can see this when we estimate what is, we evaluate what is the signal to interference and noise ratio. We can have asymptotes for lower SNR, for higher SNR. But anyway, what we see here is that this SNR increases with the number of antennas, the same as if we had perfect channel state information asymptotically. So this is good. And actually, we can compare with the ASK approaches, and we can see here a couple of our approaches in, in black and in red require this here in X is the number of antennas, require much less number of antennas than the previous approaches with ASK, which require thousands and thousands of antennas. Today is still a, a too high number to be feasible. And as I said, we can also multiplex several users. The problem here is we start multiplexing many users. That means several users in the same time and frequency slot just being separated by spatial uh, properties. We really need too many antennas. But this is our preliminary work of like five, six years ago. And later, we added some coding. And then we found that actually through coding, you can have many schemes that can achieve uh, good prop, uh, performance with a number of antennas that is feasible, below 200, below 250, which is what today is a state of the art massive minus. So this is perfectly feasible. And then if this is feasible, one may wonder, well, OK, but channels are not flat fading, right? Can we have an OFDM system? And can we also have high channel variability? And it, it turns out it is not difficult. What we need to do is we need to add the OFDM at the transmitter and at the receiver per antenna. And uh, having that, uh, the rest is more or less the same I explained. And we have uh, evaluated what happens if you have very high mobility, meaning 500 kilometers per hour. And also, uh, of course, a frequency selective channel and also phase noise, nonlinear amplifier. I mean, the usual impairments that you have in, in real life, not in the theoretical studies. And here you see uh, in pink and in, in red what happens with the coherent uh, detection, which fails, right? It, it saturates a bit of rate that is completely uh, uh, not practical. Even though there is no coding here, but there is no coding that uh, is going to get you below this 10 to minus one. While the non-coherent approach works, right? And it is true that it saturates. It saturates because we don't have a huge number of antennas. Increasing the number of antennas, it will go down. But anyway, it can reach a bit of a race that, after coding, will get you a very good performance. So no problem with channel variability. No problem with uh, frequency selectivity. What about beamforming? Um, here we show how we can combine this in the downlink with a base station that performs beforming. 
Of course, the bin forming needs some channel state information, right? But it may be slow. So the approach here is once you do the bin forming with the normal means, reporting the um, CSI reference signals or whatever you do in 5G, then you don't need any more pilots, so you get rid of the, the modulation reference signals. And here we have um, a couple of scenarios because, of course, the performance here will depend on how the users that you choose to uh, be multiplexed together, how close they are in space, so they can be very close or far away, how is the channel if there are clusters that are reflecting the signal of one to the other? As this is the case, for example, here with user two, and this is a, a worst case situation that may happen, right? But what we have seen is even in this worst case, and if we consider the throughput, uh, again, the non coherent approach will, will be this, these two lines. That the first ones works much better than the coherent, that is uh, the other one, that would need very high SNR to start having a reasonable throughput while our throughput is higher and uh, with lower SNR. So, also applying this to be informing, we found that it makes sense. Then, what is next? Well, now it is very uh, hot topic the reconfigurable intelligence services. What is this? We, we have many situations where we have a base station, a UE, and then the link is blocked. It may be completely blocked or partially blocked. So at the end, it is very difficult to use this uh, UE from this base station. We can find help in a surface that is made of small elements, many small elements that uh, reflect the signal and we can configure how we want this to be reflected. So we can configure what is the phase actually that the signal is going to experience in each of these small elements. Of course, to reconfigure, we need somehow a link that controls this surface, but well, it, it can be quite a reduced compared to what would be a new base station with all the RF and all the uh, complete equipment. So this is an approach to change the channel, right? If we don't like the channel, can we change it? And uh, yes, we can, right? But of course, to change the channel and make it look as we want, the first we need is to know the channel. So still, of course, we need the channel state information for these reconfigurable intelligence services. And usually what we do is we split the communication in several phases. We will have some phase where we need to do some training, we need to do reference signals, and as minimum, we need as many as reconfigurable elements we have, because we need to estimate the channel of each of them. And then once we do this training, there is, of course, some period where we need to do the processing and the feedback, because then we are going to decide what needs to be the phases of each of those, and also what the base station needs to do. And the base station needs to inform somehow the reconfigurable elements to reconfigure, right? To put the phases that were decided. And then once this is done, we are ready to transmit. Even if we consider that this processing at feedback is uh, negligible, which is not, but even if we consider that, this training takes a long, long time. If we have many elements, and also in case the channel changes, because if the channel is static, then okay, you train and then you keep it forever. But this rarely happens, right? The channel usually changes. And here in this table, we have estimated what would be um, the efficiency factor? So a number that is Excuse going to me, multiply. Professor Armada, yes? this is a kind reminder. Yes. We are up against the clock. So one last minute, please. Thank you. OK, no worries. It is almost my last slide. Yeah. So then what you can see here is if you have a big number of elements or you have a changing channel, then your efficiency goes to zero. So you are just sending pilots you are not sending any information. Can we do this in the non-coherent 
uh, scheme? Yes, we can. And actually, what we can see here is the first, the ones um, above are the coherent ones that don't work well. In the non-coherent, we can even um, use very large panels because this doesn't incur any overhead. We can afford, in this simulation, we have 32 times 32. But we could go to whatever we want and increase extremely our performance. And uh, of course, one we may wonder, well, are we going to replace coherent by non-coherent? Well, not necessarily. What we propose is to find a combination and use the best in every situation. If you have a fast channel, you use a non-coherent. If you have a very static channel, you use a coherent. And there is something hybrid in the middle that you can always use, right? So just to finish, uh, this differential PSK doesn't need channel state information. It is massive but feasible number of antennas. It can be applied when you have high mobility, when you have frequency selective channels. It can be combined with OFDM, with informing, with reconfigurable intelligent surfaces and other features of, of, of beyond 5G. And it is clearly an alternative, not to uh, completely suppress other skills, but to combine. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. It's great to hear uh, your insights. Thank you. With that, we will uh, get back to Professor Geir Horn from uh, Oslo University uh, in Norway. Um, Geir, we hope uh, the techniques are working this time, so the floor is yours, please. And let us, uh, with due to respect to, to other agenda items, uh, please let's, let's finish this point of program at, uh, at noon. Thank you. Yes, this time it should work. Um, we tested it and it should work, so I hope that you see my screen now. I will try to be brief, um, and uh, I will also try to um, I will switch off my video if there is a problem with the bandwidth so in, in uh, south of France, where we do not have that good bandwidth, unfortunately. So I'm taking a different perspective on this. I'm talking about this from the perspective of the application. And I think we need to master applications in a good way in order to um, make a good uptake of uh, 5G and, and beyond technologies, because otherwise uh, we will sort of just be a data pipe uh, with no real uh, interest to, to the users. And the point, the starting point of this is the application orchestration view, which is um, basically uh, coming from uh, the system uh, or service-oriented computing. And it has basically two targets for, for the orchestration and for the management. It's the computer system itself and it's the software. And it is an automated perspective, so we have to do this in an automated way. And in theory, it is, or in practice, it will be by two phases. It will be one for the resource acquisition, and it will be one for the optimized use of the resources. And uh, I will talk about a little bit about, uh, especially the last point in, in this talk, because this is where we really have to do a, a difference. And for the application point of view, we are looking at distributed applications, because if you cannot distribute the application, then there is really no point in having uh, this going across uh, a broader room. So, so we have a, an application which consists of some kind of components. It could be services, it could be microservices, it could be whatever functions uh, in, in the cloud world. Uh, and all of these are to be executed and distributed where they have the, the most uh, benefit for the overall application execution. Furthermore, the application is assumed to have a variable resource demand because otherwise it would be some kind of optimization problem that we can solve once and, and keep it for that for the longer duration of time. And this means that it also has to be reactive to the change in context. So if, if the number of users of the application changes, then we need to take that into uh, consideration when we are doing the optimization. And the application will typically also have data dependencies. So as we go along, there will be a shift in the data that processed by the application. 
and there will be a shift in how the users are using this application. Things can happen, so many people go on their mobile phones at the same time, and then you have a peak in load for the application, etc. And furthermore, we should not know anything about the application itself, because that is uh, confidential uh, and, and a competitive advantage for the owner of the application. So our approach must assume that there is no code changes necessary and, and that we only base our decisions on the architectural knowledge of this application. So with this application view in mind, uh, the question is how can we manage the computing system? And the computing system I'm talking about here spans from the cloud in one edge, um, one end to the fog and the edge and, and, and the radio access network and actually the world outside there. There is a world out there. Um, the fog is understood as some kind of smaller cloud uh, installations that are uh, closer to the ground. That's why it's called the fog. And uh, typically, Nokia has a, a project to install this kind of data centers at the city, city level with up to, say, 100 servers. And if you need capacity beyond that, well, then you have to scale out to, to the real cloud. So this is the computing system that we are talking about. And one way to look at this is to look at this as just a data pipe. So data is flowing from the physical world up to the cloud, being processed in the cloud, and then shifted back to the uh, physical world. Um, However, the computing power here along this line is, is quite different. So in the cloud, you they claim that we have infinite uh, amount of power in the cloud, whereas in the fog we have uh, somehow more restricted. In the edge, there will be very restricted uh, computing power. And of course, the radio access network itself has no um, accessible computing power for the user applications. I also claim that in the physical world, there will all also be almost no um, available computational power because you have uh, everything battery powered and everything needs to be taken care of from, from that perspective. So how can we distribute computing tasks and what kind of computing tasks are we looking at to, to distribute here? The classical example is, of course, content, which has already been distributed uh, close to the users, close to the people accessing this. And, and this can take different forms. It can, of course, be production in the uh, cloud area and then down to content caching close to the users uh, watching YouTube videos or whatever they, they do. And this will be um, benefited and, and enhanced by, by storage virtualization. And I think this is a main topic of what we are talking about here, that by storage virtualization, we are able to uh, manage the way data is stored in a much better way. Content can also be the basis for uh, artificial intelligence training. And, and the use of artificial intelligence at the fog level, for instance, to process and, and categorize content before it's being cached and, and delivered to the users. In order to do this AI training, uh, of course, we, we could benefit from concepts like high-performance computing or high-throughput computing that are uh, requiring a massive amount of computing resources, and those resources must be tightly connected, so they can really only be carried out in specialized data centers or in uh, data centers belonging to a geographically restricted regions. On the other hand, in the physical world, we, we do typically event monitoring, and this is the IoT, Internet of Things concept of, of the world, where you have a lot of uh, events coming in, and hopefully you can also do some event filtering in the cyber physical world. As I said, with the battery capacities, with the uh, capacities available in that uh, area, I don't think that is a realistic thinking. I think it's much more realistic to think that event filtering will actually be distributed to the edge. So in other words, the events, the raw events, will be carried to um, the um, radio link and, and processed at the edge. Then again, we have also have another class of application which belong to the uh, autonomic control uh, domain. And time is too short to, to talk about that here. But basically, uh, for instance, Toyota now will have a car with a drive by wire, which means that your steering wheel is not connected directly to the wheels, but it's connected to the onboard computer, which takes care of the steering. Of course, you will not delegate that kind of computations out of the car and, and shift it to the edge or to the fog or to the cloud, because that is of the lower level of automatic control, and you need to do that in a local loop. However, the event filtering, so how the, the, the number of, uh, or the speed you run through a bend, for instance, that can be uh, 
done at the edge level and taken care of at the higher levels. Uh, and then again, in the fog, you can do even more complex event processing and, and look at correlations between these. And in the edge, you can also run higher level control. So we can set new set points. For instance, if you look at the heating in the house, the heater will have its own local controller, but you will set the temperature for the room from the edge maybe. And then again, you can do the same at higher level of, of control. So, so this is basically the, the, the split, I think, is realistic for most application types and where we really need to find the optimum of, about where to place the computation task. For the communication part, we have the radio frequency link, which is, um, of course, a bandwidth constraint uh, device, uh, link, which means that we cannot transmit as much as we want across this link. And uh, even though the radio modulation techniques that we heard about uh, have made great efforts over, over the last few years or over the last decades, it's still a shared medium, so we need to access the management of this medium, and we need to manage the bandwidth for each application for each single user over that medium. On the other hand, my claim is that the, card, the, the fiber network, which is going from the radio access and then up to the cloud, is so unlimited in capacity and, and can really be used efficiently if we also uh, exploit uh, network virtualization in that area. Now, there is also software-defined radio. So the, the big question and a big challenge here is, can these be combined so that we can look at this as one single um, domain, networking domain, where we can uh, sort of overcome this uh, shared medium bandwidth constraints of the radio frequency link by network virtualization techniques known from uh, the Peach Network. Also, there is a lot of talk about the latency aspect of um, the application view, and that applications that have uh, requirements for low latency should be shifted towards the edge or, or the fog. Now, latency, is it really a problem? I mean, if you look at the speed of light, which we talk about for, for the fiber optical communication here, then you can uh, go around the world in uh, 0.1 seconds basically. So you need an application which uh, is requiring lower latency than this. And then you are uh, quickly into the domain of uh, core uh, control application, which means that this, this kind of application uh, will not necessarily be shifted, as I said with the Toyota example, will not be shifted from the car to the edge. However, if you talk about uh, an application running on Mars, then of course you have a delay between four and 20 minutes, depending on where Mars is in its orbit relative to the Earth. And, and that means you really have an issue with the communication to, to Mars. So on this perspective, uh, I think we need to look at this from where does the latency in the internet come from? And uh, this is where I am now, very close to a new one. And when I'm communicating to my home network in, in Oslo, at the University of Oslo, uh, I should expect the latency at, at around six milliseconds. But when I measure it, then I actually measure it as almost 10 times as much as this theoretical latency. So this additional latency comes from the way the internet is structured and the way the internet is managed. And if you look at the, um, the steps I have to take in order to get to my home computer in at University of Oslo, it's already 15 hops that I have to go through in order to get from here in France to the University of Oslo. And these, um, these problems are what creates the uh, the latency problem, and this needs to be taken into consideration. So the routing of the internet is actually what comes into play when you decide where to place uh, calculations and, and computations. So that this leaves us with the runtime budget, which is basically every kind of computing must receive data, do something with the data, and send back some results. This is sort of the basics. But then you have to look at the two aspects, the data transmission, which is the depending on the size of what you transfer, it depends on the protocol, because for instance, the TCP protocol, which is mostly used for, for many kind of transactions, it's an acknowledgement protocol. So uh, you have, need to look at the, the time it takes to get the acknowledgement back. And that is why, for instance, you would not use TCP when you communicate with Mars, because then you have to wait eight minutes for the, the, the response. Uh, it has to do with the link speed, uh, but that's not the only thing, because I think in the protocol and, and the site might mean much more than the actual physical link speed. And as we just saw, the, the router forwarding and the way the router is dealing with the data traffic 
is also depending, is also deciding on what you can do with the data transmission. And if we do not take this into account, then you make the wrong placement decisions. Then for the computation time, uh, which is of course the the uh, thing that is better in the cloud than at the edge, you have. We have seen that this can be data dependent. So unless you know what kind of data you're processing at a given time, it's very hard to predict how long, for instance, the computation will take. Uh, the same, uh, the application itself is multi-component. So for instance, for those of you knowing high performance computing, we have something called um, MPI message processing interface, which allows computations to be distributed across multiple processes which means that even if you have one computing component, that component can need or we might need to talk to a lot of other components uh, in, in the network. And, and that is creating a lot of communication among these components. And if you do, are not aware of this, it will be very hard for you to place them in, a, in, a, in an efficient way. Professor Horn, okay, no. yeah, it's a kind running. reminder that um, the, the time is uh, running, so you are still yeah. staying on the stage for the panel, but... Um, yeah. I, yeah. Give me one more minute, please. Okay, so we also have to take into consideration what is called non Amdahl's law. It basically says that there is a limit to how much you can uh, parallelize uh, an application. So, uh, as you can see here, even though you have an, an application with 95% parallel uh, work, it will not scale beyond 20 times what we achieve on a single core. So, this is something you need to take into account. So what we need to do is that we need to look at all of these things in one single uh, concept where we try to optimize the best possible placement of all of these um, application components across the full computing system. So that was the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Geyer. Very illustrative example with taking us uh, to the Mars. And let us uh, switch to the panel, which uh, Geyer will be chairing, the panel on uh, the main challenges of machine learning and artificial intelligence in the beyond 5G open run networks. Uh, Geyer will be joined by his panelists, uh, Professor Osvaldo Simeone from uh, King's College of London in UK, uh, Paweł Skrzypyk from Morphemic Project in Poland, uh, Tomasz Mach, PhD from Samsung UK, and Arifur Rahman, PhD from IS Wireless. Geyer, the floor is yours. Cool. Well, thank you and welcome to this panel. Um, I would like to start with a question for, for maybe for each of you. Um, and then we, we can start discussing among ourselves uh, following that. So the first question goes to Osvaldo. Um, my my talk was about event processing and, and the role of signal processing across uh, the large continuum. How do you see AI as an enabler for that um, processing? And, and where do you think it will be best to use AI? And what kind of AI techniques do you think is needed when, when moving processing closer to the data sources? Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, to this interesting event. Uh, well, that's a lot of questions. Um, First of all, I should say that I am, uh, unlike maybe the other panelists, not much of a networking person. I, my field of expertise is information theory and uh, machine learning. And I've been working mostly on the lower levels of the protocol stack, so physical layer and Mac. So that tells you, you know, type of problems that I'm exposed to mostly. Um, so I, I think there are a number of things to say uh, here. I mean, at a very high level, um, you know, machine learning is all about induction. Artificial intelligence is all about induction, at least uh, in its current version. Um, so induction means that, uh, you know, we have data for some specific instance of our problem, and we hope that uh, whatever model we optimize based on this data will generalize outside this data to real world situations. So that's the problem of induction from data. And you know, we know by the free lunch theorem that doing this efficiently or effectively or successfully anyway, requires us to make assumptions about the problem. And these assumptions must necessarily relate to the nature of the problem we're trying to solve. So if you're trying to solve a networking problem, we should have enough domain knowledge to understand what are the right models, what are the right inductive biases 
that should be used to solve that problem. So what I'm trying to say here is that I think the first question is what are the right inductive biases? What are the right models? What are the right assumptions that we can make uh, in order to have efficient and effective machine learning and AI models in networking? I'll give you some, just an example. Um, in some problems, I mean, I guess the classical example is, uh, uh, is uh, image processing, image classification, right? The only reason why this, one of the only reasons why these techniques work well is that we know that there is translation on invariance, right? that uh, no matter where an object is in an image, the output of certain inference tasks is, is the same. And by leveraging that knowledge, we have very efficient and effective solutions. So what are the right structures that we should uh, leverage when studying networking problems? Of course, this will depend on a specific problem we have at hand. And just to give a simple example, in many networking problems, we have graph structure data. So, and there are you know, specific AI tools like graph neural networks, for instance, that encode invariances to you know, changes in the neighborhood of nodes of things of that sort. Um, so I think the first challenge is to identify the right inductive biases, so the right models, the right you know, properties that we want these machines to have. And this necessarily, I think, requires us to think about which parts of the existing algorithms and models we want to incorporate and how we can incorporate those into these you know, data-driven solutions. So I think this is my you know, first kind of challenge, which necessarily cannot come from people like me, but needs to come from people who have domain expertise. And actually, it should come from a discussion between people who have researchers and practitioners who have experience in the problem and machine learning experts who know which kind of models can actually be trained efficiently, right? Because that's the other big question, right? You can come up with a very complicated uh, model, but then it can just not be trained efficiently. And that, that defies the purpose of the, the whole enterprise. Mm, I don't know how much time I have. Should we switch to yeah, we, we, we will return to you, I think. I think we, yeah, so we, let's, let me stop here and then we can, yeah. then we can continue later. Thank you, very, very, very insightful. And that brings me on to Pavel, actually, because I think that uh, Pavel has knowledge both from the training of AI uh, systems and, and from distributing uh, computations across the continuum from, from edge to, to the cloud. So uh, what is your opinion, Pavel? What, are, what do you think is the uh, role of AI both um, to be used for application management, but also to, um, to be trained and to be facilitated throughout this uh, continuum on, on the data which is available. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gail, for the question. And also thank you for the invitation. I will use the, the opportunity to, to say thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I talked before this panel because uh, from my perspective, this introduction of the 5G is, um, I think, uh, very important, of course, in many aspects, but for the machine learning and AI, uh, the one obvious thing is that the more data will be available able yeah because we can transfer them much faster they will be re um available in the real time uh, but that's the obvious thing the, the more let's say subtle one is that uh, i think that it will enable thanks to the uh, moving the at least part of the application or part of the service near the user uh, it, uh, will enable to uh, make the hierarchical models yeah with the some let's say bigger models which uh, uh, resides and are trained in the data centers in the on the cloud uh, resources and smaller models which uh, are located near the users and yeah share the knowledge from the bigger knowledge uh, from the bigger 
models, but can be trained more uh, yeah, personalized to the given user and even uh, some other models which are located on the mobile phone or so, yeah, which can utilize that, uh, uh, that knowledge. So that's the, in my opinion, very interesting opportunity about this hierarchical uh, model structure. Also, it um, brings the opportunity for using the transfer learning, meta learning, and this kind of approaches. And I think it will enable the, the whole new set of the services, abilities, yeah, to, to, to provide uh, uh, more interesting uh, things to the, to the end user. So that's from my side. Thank you, Paul. I guess we can come back to that, um, picking up on uh, also all those um, a discussion on, on what kind of models can we train, so we can then uh, have a closer look at how to train them in a distributed fashion. Um, I would love to turn to Tomas, um, because uh, you have been working with um, 5G and development standardization, and, and what do you think is the greatest potential for AI in mobile radio networks? Yes, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the question and thank you for the uh, to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, event. So uh, I think the, the, the story about the AI or machine learning is, is, is uh, the, the way I see it in the, the 5G evolution. I think it's, I see it more as a, uh, rather than disruptive change, it's, it's, it's a kind of continuation of the evolution in the, in the network architecture. And uh, it it uh, if if for the people who who like myself been in in the wireless for for a while i think for, for me the 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 introduction of uh, machine learning ai is kind of continuation of this or extension of what it was called like a self organizing network concept which was introduced and started by 3GPP around 2008. So, and and the, this is if you look at the, there are some technical reports published. If you look at the problems there, there were discussions on centralized, distributed, hybrid, so on, and so on functions coordination. So, so this 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 all now applies to AI, right? Uh, one, one of the things I wanted to mention from the Samsung, uh, what is the Samsung vision or, or beyond 5G is that uh, Samsung recently published like a 6G vision white paper, which I encourage you to, to look at. And it basically, th 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 there are a few, few uh, things I'd like to highlight in this paper. So it, it mentions both AI and this mobile communication openness, which is what uh, Oran is doing also the uh, open network automation platform, they are highlighted as, as, as two mega trends towards 6G. And the second aspect in this white paper is that uh, the comprehensive AI, uh, which is kind of the ultimate goal of the AI, which is like a end-to-end -end AI effectively, which was earlier mentioned by, by the colleague, uh, is, is also considered one of the 6G technologies uh, by, by Samsung. So, so I think, and, and the point the point you made about the, the uh, workload place, placement and virtualization and how, where the, the work uh, workload should be placed, I think uh, I think the whole the whole aspect of virtualization and and considering the the processing power of a network is effectively becomes like a new network resource and the ability to flexibly move it within the network architecture. It, it, it basically gives a new angle towards the whole uh, optimization of the network. Because for example, if you take just, just a basic mobility procedure like a handover, in the past, it was basically looking at the resource, radio resource management aspect. So what is the signal between serving a neighbor cell? And then you need to make a decision. But now another angle is what is the load on the serving and the neighbor cell, which wasn't considered in the past. So that's another angle on the optimization. But the, the difficulty here is, I think the AI has a lot of benefits for wireless, but, but there are also limits. And the limits are, for example, that AI was not like, a, Included natively in the beginning of 5G, it, 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 there are discussion that 6G may be more like a native natively uh, include uh, this this native AI concept from day one, and obviously there is still a lot of in terms of training and and challenges there. Uh, for example, availability of the training data. 
uh, which is representative and suitable, which is not not al not always the case. So, so I think that that's uh, this, this kind of new angle and complexity adds, adds another complexity to, to the whole whole discussion. So, uh, but but I think it it will be important uh, in in general in in the but but in from from the implementation point of view, I think it's. Uh, it's important to, to see it as evolution. So fr start from this, let's say, like a local AI uh, towards this kind of, uh, towards evolution, towards this end-to-end -end AI. So I think it, it's, it's, and that this, this concept of evolution has been in, in 5G, 4G, 3G. So this backward compatibility assumption was there, and I think it will apply to AI as well. So I think it's important to, to kind of build on what, what is there rather than kind of challenging the, 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 the status quo. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. A lot of things to pick up in the discussion. Uh, so let us introduce the um, last panel member, Arifur. Um, you have a lot of experience in um, you, from the access network side and, and up to the cloud and also um, multi-access edge um, computing. So what do you think is the role of AI in this integration? First of all, I mean, AI as an enabler for uh, doing this integration uh, along the, the processing path? And second, what is the uh, role of AI in designing this, this allocation, this path? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Gear, for introducing me. Uh, first of all, I would like to say why AI is uh, needed for 5G and beyond networks. So there is AI and machine learning technique is not a new technique. It has already been applied, let's say, image processing, pattern recognition, and others like real-time problem. But in a sudden moment, like people is start talking, we need to use AI ML for 5G and beyond networks. The main reasons for my perspectives to adopt like AI ML for 5G and beyond networks to solve very complex problem. Uh, the complex problem is coming towards the new demands from the users, new services asked for like different 5G triangles. Even for 6G, like we are thinking for extreme uh, enhanced mobile broadband or like extreme lower latency and extreme uh, ultra reliable low latency communications, then how we will be achieving these targets? Uh, and then one of the way to think that we could use AIML uh, techniques to solve the networking problem as also in your presentation you have mentioned the computational problem as well, where to like deploy, let's say, monolithic VNF either in edge or cloud. So those kind of automated decision based on like service asked by users, it could be decided by uh, automated algorithm based on AIML techniques. Now my main concern is that which particular problem we will be solving by AI? This is the main challenge that we need to identify the real problem where the AI ML technique is fitting. And the second concern is that how we will be like using the data from the real network and making the interference as the uh, AI ML model. And how to make the decision faster, which is actually, let's say, very critical in, in a like radio access networks, like we have to see the millisecond level TTI decisions in a part TTI. Sometimes we even need to go far like beyond uh, uh, limits of the delay in the radio access network side. So I see there is a huge potential of AI ML techniques for 5G and beyond networks, but there are huge challenges we need to solve before actually we really implement AI ML algorithm in a real network. So one of the critical problem is the complexity of the algorithm itself. Somehow you need to reduce the complexity of the algorithm to deploy in a practical network, which actually we are, uh, can envision. So I as well as I'm very proud of introducing that we are having a 6G project, which is Marshall, where we are actually investigating AML techniques for radio access network, for like the computational no nodes uh, in a optical radio convergence, where we are potentially using uh, machine learning techniques uh, and deep learning techniques some way. We are also considering some orchestration uh, based on AIML algorithm. So like a full into in architecture uh, envision in the 6G, particularly for the Marshall project, we are actually trying to deploy or try, trying to imp implement AIML algorithms everywhere in the network. Uh, 
So this is actually uh, my perception that there is a huge potential of implementing or like using AML uh, algorithm for the network, but actually we need to think a logical uh, implementation and we also need to think the real problem where the AIML technique is particularly fitting. So th this is the things in my opinion I believe that we could uh, like rethink the problem and we can also rethink how to utilize the AIML algorithms in the real networks. So thank you Gear for, for uh, this question. Thank you, Arifur. Um, that brings me back to Osvaldo. Uh, so what do you think is the potential of having sort of distributed AI algorithms and AI models? Mm. Right. Well, um, so I guess we talked about uh, the, uh, the, the spatial aspect, the sc spatial scales aspect. So we have the cloud, the fog, and so on. And one needs to distribute these algorithms suitably I would also point to a different uh, dimension, which is the time dimension. As, my, as my, in my understanding, all these open run architectures have two different types of controllers. Uh, there is a slow moving one and a fast moving one, which were also mentioned before, right? Trying to mimic the kind of the slow and fast thinking, right? Of uh, some machine learning approaches and also approaches studied in neuroscience. Um, and I, I think one interesting aspect is how to uh, integrate these different scales of learning, which will correspond to also different types of data collection, uh, feedback, even modality of learning. Uh, at, the, at the lower scale, at the faster time scale, we may not have, for instance, access to open loop uh, feedback, whereas at the slower time scale, at the, in this low learning process, we may have access to feedback at, uh, and so how to integrate these different scales, temporal scales, with uh, the spatial allocation of these machines in the network, right? So it stands to reason that faster processing should be done at the edge and slower at the cloud. And But how to do this properly, I think, is an interesting question. And I think another interesting question is, and I guess this goes to experts in networking, is what happens when these different learning agents are owned by different entities, uh, which may have different goals. And um, so how, what happens when maybe agents learning independently or maybe following different goals by different you know, organizations uh, stray from some common goal? How do we ensure that and this goes back, of course, to the usual question of how we interpret uh, the operation of AI. Uh, how do we ensure that each individual organization contributing to the same network with different AI algorithms behaves in a way that is compliant to some common goal? And uh, so how do we stop the network, for instance, from misbehaving? How do we stop these AIs from misbehaving? How do we monitor um, these learning processes at the lower time scale, at the larger time scale. I think these are all interesting questions that may not have been studied as much in machine learning or in AI, because I think they don't really come up usually in these you know, large data center uh, architectures that are used for data processing. But I think once we start thinking of deploying AI for real, at different uh, time scales, at different spatial scales in communication networks, these aspects may come up. And there may be also space for integrating technologies like uh, smart contracts and blockchains just to, as a mechanism to ensure again that there is some compliance to some pre-established rules that can be checked, right? By checking that some, some KPI, for instance, are met or things of this sort. And this may be, again, uh, agreed upon and encoded in some blockchain-like architecture, could be. I mean, these are just the idea. I think there is also another interesting aspect here, which has been Please pointed be out. brief, because um, I would also like okay. to have the question from Pavel and, and Thomas on that. Please, yeah, I think this is uh, maybe, it would be interesting to hear what others have to think. Thank you, about okay. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Pavel and Tomas, what do you think about this um, problem that was also just raised about the distribution in both time and 
in with distributed agents, AI agents that could actually contract in the network. Hmm. Should I start first? Yeah, please, okay. please go first. Maybe very briefly. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that probably the, there are a lot of the issues to, to be solved, but on the other hand, I prefer to, to focus on the opportunity yeah, because it gives a great opportunity. I'm pretty sure that all of these problems can be solved yeah, in the better or worse way, but can be solved. But uh, the, the, the potential, the upside is very big. Yeah? Having uh, uh, as the latest development in the reinforcement learning shows the multi-agent uh, um, approaches with the many agents cooperating with the different way, yeah? with the different algorithms, different knowledge, different learning process uh, are usually the most efficient in terms of the solving different problems. And uh, here we can put that on the even higher level. Yeah. So from my perspective, the opportunity is huge. Of course, there are some, some uh, issues to be solved, but I rather see it as, uh, let's say, engineering issues, not uh, scientific issues to be solved. Uh, but the, the upside potent potential is great. So, Let's finish on that and let Thomas also say something about that. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, just just wanted to add to, to that. So, so basically, I think that uh, the potential of this distributed AI is, is as I mentioned, is, is a kind of extension or the evolution of the, the current approaches. But but I think that I think we probably need to take a step back here and, and look at what are the goals of of, of, of uh, introducing uh, or applying the machine learning or AI, AI. And obviously, the main goal from the service provider point of view is the, the network control improvements and both capex opex reduction. And if you look at the examples where you can use this um, AI mechanism. Too. It could be things like network planning optimization, like site location, for example. It could be network management, things like energy consumption reduction, switching of resources, configuration automation, things like uh, also some discussions on uh, intent-driven management and networking and in, in 3GPP, for example, and obviously managing like private networks for enterprise, for example, with, with limited telco experience and network management experience. Obviously, on a lower level, you can have performance kind of improvements, better handover, I already mentioned, taking into account some network deployment context or geographical environment, some scheduler enhancements in the run, and the, the other application is uh, detecting, predicting, detecting network anomalies, self-healing. This kind of area is, is quite interesting also. And obviously, the intelligent dynamic spectrum sharing is another opportunity for the AI. So I, I think the, the, uh, the yeah, I agree that the opportunity is, is, is there and it's huge. I think that I also agree with this, this issue of the time, uh, time and the kind of um, how how quickly the, the the KPIs are updated, right? And when we talk about this end-to-end -end, uh, opti AI-based optimization, obviously there will be conflict. There may be conflicting optimization goals and and different time scales. So that that's that that doesn't help. Uh, but and also, if, if you look at the network from like layer point of view, if uh, the closer to typically the closer to the radio part, the latencies are lower. And obviously, you need to take this processing, AI processing, um, machine learning model, training, update. That, that takes, there is some latency involved in updating it. So, so the challenge will be the closer to the radio you want to use it, mm -hmm. but this latency will be more and more important. So I think it's, it's another aspect to look at. Thank you. Thank you. So I thought I would like the last quick reaction from you. Unfortunately, we only have 30 seconds left, so okay, please sir. be brief. So I will be giving the brief example what actually Oran is envisioning in terms of using a machine learning algorithm. So Oran is actually using uh, two types of controller. One is like a near real-time controller and one is non-real-time controller. Um, among them, there is an interface. So some like control loops is very faster, some control loops is like very slower. So in order to like implement distributed uh, learning concept, which has been introduced by Osvaldo and uh, Thomas and other uh, Pavel is talking, so I think uh, there is a way we can use it. S 
there is a problem of like uh, accumulating data, train them, and let's say uh, executing the decision in real time. But uh, I can we can see like by the use of open RAN models and some like faster uh, open uh, like interface, it is doable. Like the satisfying the latency requirements still in in our hand, and by some engineering we can solve this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you all for participating to this panel. Um, I think our time is up, so back to the organizers. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Guy, for uh, leading the panel. Thank you all members of the panel. So now let's move forward. I would like to uh, ask you to uh, meet uh, Dr. Felipe Conesiao from InterDigital Future Wireless Europe, Europe Lab in the UK. Dr. Felipe will have a presentation entitled Data Driven Future Radio Access Network Supported by the Distributed Edge Fabric. Uh, Dr. Felipe, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just please confirm that you can hear me well and that uh, you can see my screen on presentation mode. Uh, we can hear you very well. I'm waiting for your presentation. I can't see it yet. Okay. Uh, so I am sharing my screen. Let me just... Uh, okay. Yeah, you should be able can, to see we it. We can see it now. And uh, is it on uh, presentation mode? No. So just... Uh, it's in the presentation Okay, should mode. be now? It is in the presentation. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So thanks very much. I, uh, I uh, uh, was following the, the previous panel with uh, uh, a lot of interesting, uh, uh, a lot of interest. Uh, it's nice, nice discussion, and I think my presentation fits well uh, in here. Thanks a lot for the organizers of the conference. This is a very nice conference from what I've seen so far. Very interesting. The, the uh, interesting to see the, uh, all the uh, interest that was uh, gathered. A lot of people uh, showing interest, and uh, this is a very nice opportunity uh, for us. So uh, thanks very much for that. My name is Philippe Concession. I'm representing the digital for this presentation, and my presentation is on data-driven uh, future run supported by the distributed edge fabric. So the main topic of uh, my talk is uh, about uh, future run and how we leverage uh, uh, AI techniques into building a, a better, more a smarter uh, future run. And it's also about the, the realization that even though not fundamental, it is a very important, the data is a very important component to realize this, uh, this uh, vision. And uh, it's also the realization that the distributed edge fabric is actually a key enabler uh, for this uh, intelligent uh, future run. So this is what my uh, talk will be about. And uh, first, I want to talk a bit about ourselves as uh, interdigital uh, future wireless uh, Europe. So who we are, what we do, and uh, I want to show you a subset or a sample of our uh, 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 enormous portfolio on H2020 uh, projects that we use to disseminate our uh, technology. Then we're going to set the uh, stage, let's put it that way, for this uh, future run, uh, uh, intelligent future run to happen with the support of the distributed edge fabric. So we're going to look uh, specifically at this uh, distributed edge fabric, uh, general framework, how the 3GPP systems uh, see the uh, uh, edge, uh, edge interactions, and also um, the connection with the uh, all run architecture. And then after the scene is uh, set, I'm going to show you some of the activities that we do at the Future Wireless. Uh, uh, Europe uh, Lab of InterDigital, so a brief overview on our platform, how we take some of the equipments of our platform and we put together this use case called uh, Zero Defect Manufacturing, and uh, how from this use case we collect uh, telemetry data that we use then to leverage to bring this intelligence uh, to the run. So I will be showing uh, three examples there, one for the IoT with the telemetry we collect from this uh, use case in particular, and two examples for the future run. And then I'll just uh, finish with some uh, uh, main takeaways. So Future Wireless Europe, the, the we are a center of a uh, research center in Europe from InterDigital. We lead the research innovation and innovation component for the company uh, in the whole uh, Europe. And uh, our main goal in this company is to develop technology that impacts tier one standards. So this is what we try to target and uh, achieve every day, develop our technology, push it, uh, uh, show that it's uh, good, show that it's better, uh, push it into these uh, tier one standards. 
We also do uh, partnership uh, uh, projects. We collaborate with other companies and uh, we do proof of concepting of our uh, technologies and we demonstrate those. And those help to promote uh, interdigital's uh, thought leadership in the uh, wireless field. And also this is a nice opportunity at the conference to do this uh, point number five. So again, uh, thank you. Uh, so we are uh, heavily involved in the main wireless research forums and you can uh, consult a list and the slide. Uh, we have uh, multiple, uh, as I said, EU projects, uh, Innovate UK uh, uh, projects and initiatives. We do, uh, as I said, joint, under joint undertakings with other companies uh, for our proof of concepting and uh, uh, dissemination purposes. And we also have uh, very active collaborations uh, with universities on different topics. But as I said, uh, we disseminate our technology through different uh, means, but uh, we definitely, our target is these uh, tier one global standards and uh, we are very active contributors at 3GPP, Etsy, uh, IEEE and uh, IUTF. This is a slide that captures a subset of our uh, uh, H2020 uh, uh, portfolio of projects and uh, Innovate UK. And uh, I ask your attention for the left side where you can see there's a, a track on 5G advanced, so shorter term uh, uh, impact in terms of time, and then a 6G uh, track. On the 5G advanced, uh, I would highlight uh, uh, these projects, growth, dive, and clarity, because these are projects where uh, AI techniques, uh, uh, data-driven AI techniques, are a fundamental uh, uh, component for, for improvements in different uh, uh, parts uh, of the, the 5G system and vertical, uh, 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 vertical industries, but also important to highlight on the 6G track, we have this uh, AI-enabled uh, massive MIMO project, quite an important project uh, uh, for us. And very recently, uh, we have actually started, uh, uh, we proposed and it was accepted, so we started this industry specification group on reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. And uh, we are working on bringing AI techniques there to leverage the, the, the RIS as well. So this gives you a nice overview of uh, um, our activities as a, a lab in uh, uh, Europe. And now um, let's set the scene then on how we do this, uh, or how we try to achieve or bring this intelligence for future run, uh, supported by the uh, edge fabric. So let's have a look at the edge fabric. I like this diagram a lot because I think uh, I think it shows in a very nice way uh, uh, the distributed edge fabric and all the uh, important aspects that uh, indeed were being discussed uh, uh, in the previous uh, panel. So uh, a very interesting uh, link there from the panel to this presentation. So we have uh, a network layer. We can start with that. We're just depicting the, the uh, basic 5G components, so devices. UEs, this, this can, include, can include smartphones, Internet of Things, uh, objects, customer premise, premises equipments. On the run side, uh, uh, NG run nodes that can be a regular base station or can be a, a part of a, um, or can be uh, uh, so constituted by a, a um, disaggregated run uh, uh, element. Then we have this computing layer where we have on the left what we call the far edge, so edge computing resources that are closer to the uh, 5G devices. The 5G devices can use these resources for uh, uh, computing tasks. Then we have the uh, edge cloud in the middle that uh, includes the uh, uh, telco edge. So this telco edge is when the uh, uh, edge servers are actually located within a mobile operator's uh, premises. And so here I'm highlighting Vodafone and Amazon because the use case I'll be showing uh, was actually an experiment we did with the uh, uh, edge computing resources from Amazon that were actually located inside uh, Vodafone UK's uh, core network uh, premises. So the idea is obvious is that uh, we put the edge inside the uh, uh, operator's domain so that we can reach it uh, faster. And then we have the uh, uh, actual cloud at the, uh, to finalize the computing layer. At the intelligence layer, this is uh, because this is data driven and you know that data, uh, telemetry uh, data needs to circulate and uh, be communicated amongst uh, different endpoints. So we need the telemetry uh, framework there that is captured at the uh, intelligence layer. We need to have the ability to train models, update them, perform inference, and then the intelligence distribution because the, uh, depending on the application, whether it's time sensitive or not, uh, or depending on the goal, you might want to put this intelligence on the device itself, at the edge, at the far edge, at the cloud, it really depends uh, on the use case. 
And uh, finally, on the same edge fabric, uh, uh, it is important to realize that as we move from the far edge towards the cloud, we are increasing the uh, storage and computing uh, capabilities for our intelligence. But unfortunately, we are also increasing the uh, telemetry upload uh, latency. So if devices are generating data and you want to put them, uh, upload them into the cloud, it will take longer than if you use uh, uh, the edge center. Um, this is uh, uh, so that's that's for the uh, uh, distributed edge fabric, and this is a slide just to, that uh, captures the work that has been done on the uh, SA side of 3GPP, so the services and system uh, architecture working groups, and you have there from one to six the work that has been developed so far in release 17, and uh, release 18 is about to start, and uh, there will be a stage to work on uh, uh, oper uh, interoperability between 3GPP systems and the edge hosting uh, environment. So this is to say that the 3GPP systems will be able to communicate with the uh, edge nodes. And then from an ORAN uh, perspective, we have uh, uh, the disaggregated run with the central uh, distributed and the radio units. And uh, we have, as the panelists mentioned, we have these uh, uh, two uh, types of controllers on top of the radio elements. So we have, uh, uh, they are called RAN intelligent controllers, so RICs. And uh, one of them is for near real time uh, um, uh, optimization and control of uh, radio functions. The other one is for non real time. So they can be seen in a way as the uh, uh, edge cloud and the cloud uh, uh, itself in terms of time sensitivity. And uh, the RICs are, uh, uh, can be seen from an AI perspective, they can be seen as hosting platform, platforms for these uh, intelligent applications uh, over the top on the uh, uh, networks. And um, just a final note to say that uh, if we deploy them at, them at the near real-time RIC, they're called X apps. At the non-real-time RIC, they are called uh, R apps. So this sets the stage on how this distributed fabric is uh, helping the uh, deployment of uh, uh, AI techniques for future run. And so now I want to show you some of the work that we do at, the, uh, at our lab. Data-driven uh, between brackets, just because the uh, um, main concept here is the future run uh, activities and as i said in the beginning it's the realization that data is indeed a, a, a very important component but uh, it's not actually um, might not be fundamental in some cases and some of the work because uh, we do much more than this but unfortunately the, uh, there is no time so we have to be uh, selective to show you some of the work so this is an overview of our platform. I uh, ask your attention for the left side, where we have different UV types. So some of them actual user equipment, some uh, uh, consider the Internet of Things uh, objects. Then we have multiple connectivity options to connect these devices to uh, the elements that you see in this box. So at the edge, or uh, for example, at the cloud, we have this data lake that is uh, 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 absorbed, is capable of uh, uh, storing uh, ridiculous amounts of uh, uh, data. And we target in our works real-time AI, so deployed on device, near real-time and non-real-time as, uh, for example, in the, the Oran case in the two different uh, rigs as we've just seen. And then we also, we have uh, uh, user applications and run applications or X apps for the uh, Oran architecture on different topics. And I'm highlighting here the ones that I'm going to show. So as I said, one for the IoT with the control of our camera, uh, another one for traffic steering, and then uh, uh, last one on positioning and, uh, and uh, mobility. So, as I said, we take some of the elements in our platform. This looks like a complicated slide, but let's break it down. It's actually easy. Let's look at the left side. We take some of the elements of our platform and we form this factory, we put together this factory or simulated factory. We have this arm robot that picks up objects, puts them on a conveyor belt. And then we have this uh, camera here filming the uh, factory process. The camera films it and streams the video over 5G to the right side where we have the edge node. As I, I said, there's the uh, wavelength component from Amazon that provides edge computing uh, resources located inside the Vodafone UK's core network. So the edge node gets the stream of the video, and then we have a YOLO engine running there that tells us uh, basically whether this object is defective or non-defective. And if the object is defective, we get rid of it. If the object is non-defective, we let it go uh, out of the factory. But based on this uh, detection here on the YOLO, then the edge sends a command towards the factory and controls the factory 
uh, on what to do. So this is actually a, a, an automated uh, process. While this use case is running, we are collecting telemetry from basically all of the uh, elements that you see on screen. So the, our telemetry framework is quite rich. We collect this telemetry, and then we're going to see next how to, uh, an example on how to leverage this telemetry from an edge perspective. But I just want to say uh, one more thing, that uh, this was a, a pilot, first pilot in Europe where uh, a test like this has been done with the edge computing resources inside the uh, uh, mobile operator's uh, premises. But we can replace that with a GPU, have the same functionalities, and say, look, this is our computing, edge computing uh, uh, resources. So this is an example here of uh, the telemetry that we collect from the uh, YOLO detection uh, engine. So we actually have some, I highlighted the uh, most important aspects uh, of this uh, telemetry for the purpose of the presentation. So we have a timestamp when this data started to be generated. We have the object that has been deemed non-defective with 99% confidence. We have the input timestamp of when the video stream actually reached the YOLO engine. And we have here, this is a, a quite an important component, the detection time, which you can see is around 20 milliseconds. So what it means when we actually average this over a long period of time, and the average is 20 milliseconds, the YOLO engine takes 20 milliseconds to detect whether this object is defective or not. So this opens the door. Just by looking at the data, we understand immediately that we can do some interesting stuff, uh, things here, like bandwidth uh, utilization strategies, overheating avoidance uh, strategies, or power consumption uh, 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 reduction strategies from a camera uh, perspective. How do we do this? As an example, again, we have our camera streaming towards the edge node. We, it's streaming the video in the lowest possible resolution by a, an enhanced mobile broadband slice. Then what we have at the edge is that we have some uh, uh, we have the ability to predict when this kind of object is going to uh, uh, or might show up on screen or be captured by the camera. So we predict this input timestamp here, and then based on the prediction, we have the edge node telling the camera, controlling the camera, and saying, "Okay, now I need to do an actual detection." So camera, please put your uh, uh, resolution settings and frames per second, put it all maximum because I want to have the best possible uh, uh, image quality. The camera starts doing that, streams the video in high resolution. The edge node does the actual object detection. And then after that, it sets the uh, instructs the camera to go down to low resolution again. So you can see very easily how this uh, simple mechanism can feed into this bandwidth, uh, overheating avoidance, and the uh, power consumption reduction strategy. So this is an example on how we leverage this uh, data uh, uh, through AI for, uh, um, for IoT. And now uh, a couple of examples for the run side of things. So in public networks, there's this concept of conditional handover. And I'm not sure if everyone in the audience is familiar, but I expect that at least you are familiar with the handover. So we have a UE here on this point one that is moving towards the right side. So the legacy handover would be that the UE would be instructed via, so it would send some radio measurements to the base station and then be instructed to uh, commute or to move between cells. The CHO is the uh, uh, slightly different. Instead of, uh, 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 instead the base station here, A, will tell the UE, will give the UE a list of cells, B, C, and D. It will give some evaluation criteria and then the UE will constantly monitor this uh, uh, to see when this criteria is met. And when the criteria is met for any of the cells, it means that cell it is, is the, the, the perfect target cell for the UE. And then the UE actually triggers the handover. And so we have a, a, a CHO X app that we can deploy on the uh, Oran rig. We have our uh, cloud uh, data lake with Amazon, where we can store data, do analytics, train models, do inference. And uh, we have the access nodes here and UE devices. So in order to train some uh, 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 this type of app, we collect telemetry from access nodes and from UE devices, put it in the cloud. Then we train a model and we can deliver either deliver that model or the inference results from that model into the CHO uh, X app. And the result is that the X app is capable of telling us what is the set of optimal cells for this uh, conditional handover. And then the last, uh, 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 the last example I would want to give you is similar-ish in the sense that we still do the same things in our data lake, but now we have a traffic steering X app. And what is this? 
uh, we have imagined a, a 5G new radio, uh, radio interface, Wi-Fi interface, and uh, one of them is, for example, congestion. And uh, you want to be able to switch or to kind of split your traffic between different uh, uh, radio access technologies. And so we do the same process. We collect this uh, telemetry from UE devices, from access nodes. We have the results of the inference of the model deployed at the RIC. And then the RIC is capable of deriving the optimal traffic steering rules for the particular use case. So it communicates with this multi-path TCP proxy that is located in the core network and is responsible for, for, or, uh, for this uh, traffic uh, steering rules uh, in coordination with the uh, uh, client here at the UV. And this results in the SLA robustness in general and the uh, uh, SLA in general. Why? Because we might be wanting to look at throughput, we might be wanting to look at uh, reliability. So we may have different uh, um, objectives with our uh, uh, use case. And uh, that's why the, the leveraging of the, the telemetry can serve different uh, aspects here. So, so, so this sorry, is a, sorry Felipe, to interrupt. We need to be wrapping up. Yes, this is the, the last slide for conclusions. I, I, I hope that my presentation was clear, but I wanted to emphasize that we target these uh, tier one standards and that's the main purpose of our goal. We develop technology and target these uh, standards. For the edge fabric, there's a framework that is in place that uh, uh, enables this intelligent run uh, development. And uh, this fits very nicely into the tier one standards. We have a, a very capable platform with a lot of telemetry and a lot of intelligence that we are using and uh, we have disseminated some of that work. We will disseminate some more uh, soon. And the main takeaway from us is that we are heavily involved in these things and we see the benefits that can be attained from AI in future run are very, very relevant and uh, important. If we design the, the, the correct test methodologies, uh, we can show these benefits very clearly. And as I said, as a company, with them, after we have those results, we disseminate them in the order that you see on screen. So the standards, the international projects, and the proof of concept, concepting and uh, demonstrations. So thanks for uh, your attention, and uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Felipe. Thank you for the presentation, and thank you for those interesting use cases. Um, now let's move forward to our next speaker. Please allow me to introduce you to um, Professor Osvaldo Simeone from King's College uh, London. Uh, You've met uh, Professor Osvaldo before in the panel discussion. Now it's time for his presentation entitled Neuromorphic Computing and Communications. Osvaldo, the floor is yours. We can see you, but we can't hear you. OK, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. OK, fantastic. And you can also see my slides, so I can get started. We, yeah, All right. we can see them. Perfect. Fantastic. OK, thanks again uh, for having me. Um, so my talk may be a little different from uh, what you've heard so far. I wanted to introduce you to, if you haven't been introduced to uh, this topic before, to the emerging computing technology of uh, neuromorphic computing and then speculate about possible applications of this technology to communication systems. Um, so I will uh, focus on the following questions, again, assuming that this, is, this topic is new to most of you. Uh, so the first is, what is neuromorphic computing? What is it good for? And then what is its potential role in the type of uh, you know, next generation wireless networks we've been discussing so far? Yeah, so what is neuromorphic computing? Neuromorphic computing is actually not a new idea, not a new technology. It originates back in the 90s with work by Carver Mead at, Cal at Caltech. And it uh, really is motivated by the following observation. Um, the, you know, the architecture of uh, artificial neural networks, of uh, deep learning networks, the networks that we've been discussing up to now as uh, enablers of AI, um, have much in common with uh, biological neural networks, but is with brains, in that they are both made of um, uh, computing units, which, is, which are in principle identical, uh, that operate in parallel, and they're connected in a graph with a large connectivity, but also sparse uh, connectivity. Now, however, you know, this, this 
analogy between this parallel between uh, artificial neural networks and brains only goes that far. You know, if you look at how individual neurons operate uh, in the brain and uh, in an artificial neural network, you'll notice that they operate quite differently. The uh, neurons in an artificial neural networks are simple static nonlinearities. They take real numbers in, they uh, multiply them by some weights, they apply a nonlinearity, and out goes another number. The neurons in the brain are much more complex uh, machines. They are dynamic systems that uh, take as input and process spiking signals, that is, uh, signals whose, in which information is encoded in the timing of spikes, also known as action potentials. Now, the, the question that motivates this field is whether we can improve on the cognitive capabilities of machine learning systems by trying to mimic more closely the way in which biology works, in which this, you know, this brain, uh, is biological uh, neural networks actually work. And interestingly, the question extends also to sensing. So on the, you know, for the, if you think about communication systems to the type of IoT applications that, again, were talked about in previous talks, uh, in that uh, uh, biological sensors do not produce uh, frame-based uh, bit uh, you know, encoded information, but as shown in this slide, they produce spikes uh, in an event-driven fashion uh, based on a predictive internal model. So they, they again, they encode information in the timing of spikes, and this is the way they are also information is uh, processed in the brain. So now, again, I, I mentioned this is not a new question, this is not a new observation, it's been around for some time, there's been a lot of also funding uh, uh, granted on the topic, but you know, in recent years, it's become uh, of increased interest because of the successes, but also of the limitations of uh, deep learning. So, if you compare, you know, a state-of-the-art artificial neural network, deep neural network-based artificial system, say such a drone, with a biological counterpart, you know, this parrot, you'll see that uh, in terms of cognitive capabilities, the parrot, you know, is beats uh, hands down the, the, the drone in terms of uh, its capability to adapt and to learn new tasks. And it also does so with, uh, you know, an energy consumption that is orders of magnitude smaller um, than that of a drone, at least like four orders of magnitude smaller than that of a drone, and also with much smaller weight. So, you know, even the spatial resources are used more efficiently. So in light of, you know, the margin of improvement that there is if you compare artificial and biological systems, again, much work has been done in recent years to bridge this gap. And what we have at the moment are a set of chips that uh, hardware solutions, hardware platforms, that uh, take some steps towards biological realism. And what they do is that they implement, instead of conventional artificial neural networks, they implement spiking neural networks. That is networks in which the neurons are the dynamic systems that I mentioned before that process and communicate using spikes. Now, the fact that we, you know, engineers have decided to focus on the spike aspect first, right, to in, in implement uh, neurons uh, that implement this, you know, spike-based uh, processing and communication is well justified uh, from a neuroscientific perspective in that, you know, spikes are well known to encode information very efficiently because they can, you know, encode information with time rather than over time. Uh, they can, of course, provide information very quickly, right? Uh, as soon as something happens, we can emit a spike and this propagates quickly to a receiver without the need of, you know, framing and bit encoding and so on. And we also know that uh, spike-based communication is very efficient, uh, operates at very low SNR, so you can communicate far. And that's why apparently biology uh, settled on uh, using spikes. So again, as I said, there are several uh, chips that um, you know, are currently uh, implementing spike in neural networks. Some of them are you know, models for the brain, but what we're interested in are really chips that implement um, uh, spiking neural networks for cognitive applications, for machine learning applications. And some of these chips are fully digital. Some of them are analog, uh, mixed analog digital, possibly implementing uh, non-volatile new memory uh, new memory technologies like memory stiff, uh, memory stores. And so these chips are you know, event-driven as compared to conventional parallel computing, right? They're event-driven, so they operate processing spikes. They take as inputs these sparse, spiking-based signals, which may be produced by dedicated sensors. 
and they implement in-memory computing. So the very same uh, elements that uh, store memory, so they store the synaptic weights, uh, are also the same elements that carry out computing. Right? And this again stands in contrast to standard parallel computing systems that are based on von Neumann separation of memory and, and computing. So the field is quite active, as I mentioned. The, some of these chips are prototypes. Some of them are commercially available. There are several startups that have received funding for both the sensing, uh, you know, developing of sen development of sensors, neuromorphic sensors, and development of chips, the chips I mentioned. And there are also major players in the field like IBM and Intel. Intel released just last week the new version of its Loihi chip, Loihi 2, um, that you know is, is available for, uh, for research purposes. So what is it good for? And we have these chips, so they have been used to, you know, uh, to benchmark various solutions. And the key point to note here is that the benchmarking is not done in terms of accuracy, you know, going from 99.9 .9 to 99.95 on whatever data set, but it's done in terms of resources needed to achieve a certain level of accuracy. So what is done and what is of interest in this field is to reduce the to improve the efficiency, so to reduce the amount of resources needed for uh, you know to achieve to carry out some cognitive tasks. So, in this chart, you can see, and this is work done by Intel, compiled by Intel, the amount of time and the amount of energy needed to solve certain problems, and you can see that you know the promise of orders of magnitude improvements can is actually realized in quite a number of benchmarks. Now, I should be mentioned that this is. Uh, but one should not take neuromorphic computing as a panacea, right? As a solve-all solution, but rather, in a similar way, you know, to quantum computing, it is actually meant to solve specific problems. And these problems, as again compiled by Intel, uh, have some spe specific features that I think it's useful to keep in mind. So, uh, neuromorphic computing can be useful for when data is streaming. So think of a situation where you have. Uh, you have to monitor a certain area for drones activity. Uh, so, you know, data is always on. You keep, you have to keep monitoring the area. There is a need for adaptation and fine tuning and learning on chip, which is uh, something that can be implemented in these type of solutions and cannot be implemented in most solutions I'm aware of for conventional neural networks. So say, you know, the adversary in the situation here can an adversary can build drones of different shapes and you want your machine to keep adapting to the new shapes that are observed. There is a need for low latency response, right? Like in the monitoring scenario, as soon as a uh, drone is uh, uh, observed and detected, this should be uh, communicated as quickly as possible. So maybe latency due to framing and encoding and decoding and passing through multiple layer stacks um, is, uh, you know, stack. Uh, layers of the protocol stack is not acceptable. There is typically a need for the application to be power constrained. So maybe again, the uh, the monitoring device is a mobile device that is battery powered, and typically we want the um, the problem to be a sufficiently small scale. So the cost associated with you know um, uh, within memory computing, with the fact that the computing elements are also memory elements, which are more expensive, is manageable. So what is the role of uh, neuromorphic computing in light of all these in communication systems? Well, the most obvious uh, role, and I think this should be probably abundantly clear by now, is that uh, they potentially are very useful coprocessors to implement learning machines, machine learning tools on devices, on mobile devices. So basically it can be think, thought of as a replacement for mobile edge computing where processing is done on the device and learning is done, adaptation is done on the device, um, but with, you know, in an energy efficient fashion and in a con always on continual fashion. And this can enable things like neural prosthetics applications where there is a need to tailor and uh, personalize the machine learning solution to the need of a specific patient, of a specific uh, individual. Another uh, application that we have been looking at in my group, and this is less obvious, I believe, is similar to the talk we have seen before, uh, concerns the problem of remote sensing and inference. So imagine you have uh, devices that are always on and uh, make some observations of the environment. 
Um, and they report these observations, again, in an always-on continual fashion to another device that is also battery-powered. So both sensing devices and inference devices right, are battery-powered. So there is a need to be power efficient, and we want the application to be always-on and constantly adjusting to changes in the environment uh, that, again, may take place because of adversarial reasons, like I mentioned before, or for you know environmental uh, reasons, you know things change in the environment and, and they need to be accounted for. So, if you wanted to implement such a system, you know, using conventional technologies, you would use a you know fully digital chain across computing and uh, communication, so and sensing. So you'd have a, a digital sensor uh, sampling the input and producing some frames of bits, which are then passed to a CPU. The CPU would uh, you know, encode this data, pass it through multiple layers of the protocol stack, send it to a transmitter. The transmitter will encode it, and the receiver will have to undo all these chains of uh, processing. So everything is digital. And while, of course, the solution may work very well in many cases, it I think it's, it's, it's clear that it has some drawbacks. It has a potentially high energy consumption because it, when it needs to be always on, and that it needs to keep producing all these frames and producing and, and, and processing these frames. Of course, there are mechanisms like wake up uh, mechanisms that can be used, but I think this general conclusion is, is valid. <laughs> and also there may be latency constraints, which are associated, latency concerns that are associated with, again, this frame-based process. So one thing we have been studying in my group uh, and has been somewhat picked up as far as I can tell is the idea of replacing every, every digital block with a neuromorphic block. So you can have, instead of a digital sensor, a neuromorphic sensor. Those can be bought today from various startups. I mentioned them earlier. And uh, this can be connected to a neuromorphic chip that does the processing fooling in spikes domain without ever converting it into bits. Everything is asynchronous event-driven. The spikes are directly sent on the wireless channel using impulse radio. So we don't need to pass these spikes in, in a digital domain, we can just communicate them using time-based uh, modulation schemes like uh, impulse radio, uh, ultra-wideband communications. And then at the receiver side, again, processing is done by another SNN, by another neuromorphic chip. So in this chain, there is no digital component. All the comp I mean, there can be digital circuitry, but everything is done using spike-based processing and communication. And so because of the reasons I mentioned before, this type of solutions turns out that to potentially have much lower energy consumption because it's event driven and sparse, sparse operation, and also can operate with very low latency in that as soon as an event is, um, is observed, it can be communicated to a receiver. And I think this type of solution is quite well um, aligned with the evolution towards 6G, where we will be looking at the use of large bandwidths in the terahertz domain, in which impulse radio is a valid and useful solution. It can also be integrated with sensing very naturally. My final observation here is that, you know, digital communication has evolved hand in hand with digital computing uh, from the transistors and the time of Shannon. Uh, we have two emerging technologies for computing now. There is quantum computing and neuromorphic computing. They both pertain to different areas for different uh, niche applications, different particular applications. And I think while there has been some work on uh, combining you know, leveraging quantum technology for communications, quantum key distribution, the quantum internet, I think the neuromorphic field is quite open. And I hope to see more activity uh, in this domain, or maybe in line with the work that I presented here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Osvaldo Simeone from King's College London, perfectly on time. So thank you very much for this. Uh, thank you also for your presentation and for examples of, of applications. Uh, I would like to remind um, all uh, uh, to you who, who, who are watching us that you can ask questions uh, to our uh, panelists, to our speakers. Um, sorry, speakers, not, not panelists. Um, just use the uh, chat window on YouTube, so we will try to uh, ask those questions to uh, to our speakers. So let's move forward. Let me introduce you our next speaker, uh, who will be Professor Pedro Merino Gomez from University of Malaga, Spain. Uh, Professor uh, Pedro Merino Gomez will have a presentation about uh, deterministic communication for beyond 5G uh, end-to-end view new, new use cases. Uh, 
Professor, the floor is yours. We can't we can't hear you. Okay. Now it's now it's no? okay. Yes. No? No, it's okay. We can we can hear you, yes. Okay, thanks a lot. So thanks to Ice Wireless for the invitation. I will try to keep in time. My my discussion is about uh, adding something more than the pure 5G network to get deterministic communications. So my message is uh, we cannot uh, just keep end-to-end -end communication as an over-the-top communications on top of the 5G network, but we need to add something more in terms of protocols or in terms of some kind of intelligence. This is a work uh, that is mainly reported in these three European projects, uh, 5G Genesis, Evolve 5G, and Affordable 5G within the 5G PPP. And it's a, a collaborative work at the University of Malaga with, with the colleagues. I will cover these four topics. Uh, first, uh, some motivation to do this um, integrated approach to deterministic communication in the network. And then two specific research lines that we have in the University of Malaga. One is a new protocol, end-to-end -end protocol, for supporting deterministic communication over a number of multiple paths. This is MTIP. The second activity is uh, working on time-sensitive networking over 5G and adding some kind of uh, smart configuration on the 5G network to support this end-to-end -end, uh, that deterministic uh, TSN uh, networking. And finally, I will provide some conclusions on how to relate these two activities with um, uh, ORAN, with the ORAN solutions. So let's go to the motivation. Uh, our assumption is that uh, most of the new use cases over the 5G or even over the, the full internet, global internet, considering 5G as part of the global internet, is uh, shifting now from traditional, let's say, consumer applications to new use cases where latency and the error rate are two main constraints. So as you can see in this table, we have a number of uh, new use cases like this tactile internet or cyber physical system or solutions in the factory or games networking gains that are requesting latencies even below one millisecond and most of them in the ranks five to ten milliseconds. This is end-to-end, -end, not only the 5G segment in the network, with a reliability in terms of errors that should be more than even the, the classical five nines. And we are expecting to have better latencies and better reliability end-to-end. We provide a number of uh, related papers in this reference that you have in this paper at the, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, making an analysis of all this related uh, literature, we found that uh, many of the actions, many, many of the features that are included in the 5G network are actually oriented to get this low latency and high reliability. So in the 5G network, compared with the 4G, we have uh, some intelligence in the edge close to the radio, which is oriented also to, to provide this low latency. For instance, in the previous presentation by my colleague Philippe, it was mentioned in multipath TCP how the intelligence close also to the open run can be used for this end-to-end -end solution, multipath TCP, and how some features should be located close to the station. We have a number of functions in the edge. We have all the virtualized infrastructure to implement also features oriented to this low latency and high reliability, features in the core network, um, many features in the end-to-end -end protocols uh, represented here by this alternative path over 4G, 5G, and so on. We specifically study the end-to-end -end solutions. Um, Keeping the focus in the NTN -end solutions, we identified that most of the literature was focusing now in a number of emerging features that uh, we are addressing also in the research at the University of Malaga. So when we are talking about the 
data plane management, we found that apart from talking about congestion control, traffic shaping, or retransmission, caching, and so on, there are many, many papers working now on how to consider a number of different paths in the end-to-end -end communication to have uh, more reliability, to reduce latency, or even to increase bandwidth or other features for the communications. So this is an area, multiple paths, where there are some well-known protocols like multipath TCP or multipath Quick and, and other solutions, but we identify this uh, specific area as one of the most interesting for covering in, 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 in further work. In the transport protocols, in the end-to-end -end transport protocols, we identify multi-connectivity also and extensions for multi-connectivity, in particular combining wireless connectivity with different technologies also as a promising approach because many devices will be multi-home devices with the capability to connect to a number of networks at the same time. In context awareness, we identify cross -layer, classical cross-layer solution, but also an emerging technology, intent-based networking, as a really interesting feature because it's uh, also connected, for instance, to time-sensitive networking that I will introduce later as a main technology for uh, um, linking what is happening at the application level with the requirements and the configuration at the network layer, including the whole path, the radio, the transport, and the core network. So uh, I will provide you these slides as uh, background information where you can check a number of features. And I will now focus on two main uh, lines of activities. Uh, before going this, to these two main lines of activities, uh, let's review that also a lot of work has been um, standardized. So uh, we are not talking only about scientific papers, we are talking about a number of features that has been included in three GPS specifications, mainly in release 16, but now moving to release uh, 17, and many of them are also work items in the uh, release 18 coming in the next uh, years. Most of the features are related to ultra-reliable low latency communications, most of these features are in particular uh, decided to be implemented in the run. Uh, there are a number of features also under the name time-sensitive communications, but in the context of 3GPP, this is uh, more about exposing timing information to the core network and to the application through the interfaces in the core network, so that applications can be aware of what is happening in the network with the timing. Uh, this timing will be also be, uh, very relevant, for instance, to implement the TSN over 5G. There is also a lot of work done in terms of updating the classic uh, QCIs in the 4G domain to what is called now the 5QIs, the qualities of the flows, to be standardized also for the new applications. And this is uh, very relevant for what is called the tactile internet and all these kind of applications. Um, there are many standards, and there is a lot of information in the standards, but as you all know, many informations here are still to be implemented. Uh, for instance, the flows defining the 3GPP standards should be mapped to the actual configurations in the RAM, in the transport, in the core network. And this is something that is not standardized, and this is something that will be implemented by the vendors. Um, we still have a lot of work to be there. Anyway, even with the standards, we need to consider that the end-to-end -end communication by the applications is not just a matter of 5G. We still have the fixed part of the internet, or we have more segments in the network beyond the pure 5G segment. So the end-to-end -end, uh, discussion to get deterministic communication should be more than 5G. And we need to address this topic and this challenge in the uh, transport protocols or in the IP level communications, or if we plan to replace IP or the transport protocols, we need to address this challenge as an end-to-end -end solution and not just as a pure 5G solution 
or even as a pure fa uh, solution in the running, the transport, and the car network. And this is what I will try to, to introduce now. First uh, topic, uh, we are working in MT. This is a new protocol to exploit multiple connections, multi-home de devices to exploit multi-connectivity. The idea here is to have something different to multipath uh, TCP, for instance, because there are many applications where latency is a real requirement. We cannot expect a full reliability. We just need uh, high reliability, but partial reliability to avoid latency. So we need to think on a protocol where we can exploit multi-connectivity to send data over multiple paths with timing information and trying to get a message uh, with the low latency at the end, at the reception. So we spread the capability to have backups in the transmissions, but also to spread the capability to use the faster paths in order to avoid latency. And this is basically what we are doing with MT. It's designed to have awareness of the information in the network, awareness also of the information at the application layer, exploiting a number of interfaces, Today, working over IP, but can be uh, uh, in some way implemented over other different technologies. And uh, we rely on what is uh, available for supporting deterministic communications on the underlying network. For instance, what is exposed by Open RAN to offer also this functionality. What we have in this example is uh, MTIP working with over three technologies, 5G, Wi-Fi, for instance, advanced 5G or vision 5G to cover, to, 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 to communicate uh, from the, let's say, controller, the human controller to a number of remote uh, devices to be controlled with this approach of the tactile internet. And what we have in the right is a, a typical sequence diagram with two connections where timing is relevant. What we are using here are sequence numbers, but also timing information per packet, assuming a strong synchronization between the sender and the receiver. We are assuming that we are using global clocks. We know that using global clocks through the internet is not uh, an easy feature, but uh, we are assuming that uh, there will be a number of solutions to synchronize both sender and receiver. Empty is a protocol that is already designed. Uh, we have uh, uh, currently an implementation that will be fully available by the end of the year as an open source solution to be tested by the community. And before having the implementation, we made some testing, and in particular, we made functional testing, assuming a number of multiple devices and assuming uh, multi-connectivity. Uh, this is a picture where we are uh, abstracting what we are representing in terms of channels or links, in terms of timing information, in terms of buffers. We uh, provide this um, Felix examples on a, as, a, as a paper to be available in the conference in, in Spain, this, in the QR security and wireless uh, a mobile networks conference in Alicante, in Spain, by November. In this work, we are using uh, well-known verification technologies like uh, Promela Language and XPIN Model Checker. We provide the first full model of the protocol using this language to model multi-link communication. And we performed a number of testing campaigns where we can ensure that the protocol is correct in terms of uh, the functions that the protocol should provide over the number of links. The second activity that we have in terms of end-to-end uh, -end deterministic communications is related to how to map the TSN uh, networking over 5G. TSN is an emerging technology from uh, factories uh, is designed to have wide technologies in the factories and is based on a concept similar to intent based networking. Uh, if we saw it in this feature, in this sequence, again, and the token and the listener, what we are representing here is that uh, communication between token and listener as the application level is uh, previously communicated in some way to some central entities 
so that we can define what are we expecting in terms of latency, throughput, packet loss, and so on, so the network can be configured in advance to provide such requirements. The picture on the right is showing how 5G is linked to this concept of intent-based networking or the time-sensitive networking with decentralized uh, configuration. We have the pure 5G network, and in green we have the new components, which are the TSM components and the translators defined by 3GPP. Everything in green is a standard, and what we are proposing here is to create some kind of a smart controller or a smart configuration end-to-end -end using this information declared by the listener and the tokener. So we can provide uh, an advanced configuration to be ready prior to the traffic between the token and the listener. And to create this smart controller, what we are planning to do is to have some kind of machine learning technologies with prediction, configuration, and so on, um, to be uh, demonstrated over realistic 5G network that we have in the lab. I mean, over the real 5G standalone network that we are operating at the University of Malaga. Currently, we have a prototype with an indoor deployment, in particular with the KISAI 5G emulator, where we are getting information with real TSM traffic over this uh, 5G emulator. We are capturing the traffic, we are processing what is happening and relating what is happening at the application layer with the configuration that we have in the network. We are learning about these uh, traces. We are representing the traces with some automata. And we are now starting with algorithms to um, make predictions and to make configuration. We have a first testbed uh, available. And this is something that is uh, in a publication under review that we hope that should be available in the next uh, few weeks. OK, so from these two complementary lines, end-to-end -end transport protocols, and time-sensitive networking of the 5G, we are getting some conclusions. First conclusion is end-to-end -end deterministic communication is more than the 5G, is more than implementing ultra-level latency communication in the run or in the full 5G network, because there will be an impact in the full path, in the full transport protocol, or in the full implementation of the TSM or other approaches. Uh, we also discovered that the designers of this solution should take into account, uh, let's say, classic uh, problems like uh, protocol modeling and verification as a first step to the implementation. And we discovered also that uh, we need to work uh, in an integrated solution with the network. These solutions cannot be over the top solutions over 5G. It should be integrated in the network because we need to know how to configure the network, we need to expose the network to these end-to-end -end solutions, and we need to have more integration, for instance, with the open run solutions. And here, for the open run developers, there will be an opportunity. Because, for instance, uh, you can provide new APIs for network monitoring, and you can provide new APIs for configuration and mapping qualities to the network. That's that's all in the, in the discussion. I hope this in, in time. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro, for this uh, insightful uh, view on the end-to-end -end system deterministic communication and on the use case. And yes, thank you for being uh, sharply on time. Uh, we don't have questions uh, right now. So with that, uh, I would like to, um, to thank you and uh, invite our panelists on the stage. We will now move to the topic on the service management in beyond 5G network uh, in terms of OSS, BSFs, uh, MANOM and energy efficiency. And the panel will be chaired by Professor Wojciech Burakowski from Warsaw University of Technology. And uh, Professor Burakowski will be joined uh, by Line Larsen from Technical University of Denmark. Good to see you again, Line. Uh, Professor Jordi Perez Romero from University Politecnica de Catalunya in Barcelona, Spain. Łukasz Mendych from Komar in Poland. Good to see you again. 
And last but certainly not least, uh, our Robert Gdowski PhD from IS Wireless. Professor Burakowski, the floor is yours. Do you see me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear and see you. Okay. So, in this conference, I have the pleasure to, to uh, be moderator of this interesting panel session. Session, uh, of course, the, the subject of this panel session touches the future. The future because we will speak about the, the possible problems corresponding to, to uh, the technologies beyond 5G. Yes, I have prepared no, yes, some questions to, to direct the, uh, the panel. Uh, okay, so let me start with the questions. At the end, I have also one additional question. Question. So the first question is, yes, we have management network, network management, and of course, in each operator has OSS, BSS, network management. So what challenges exist here to match the needs of beyond 5G and 6G networks? Yes, so, let me start. Uh, I will kind of ask uh, Professor Jordi Perez Romero to start. Hey, thank you uh, very much for the, the introduction to this uh, to this panel and for this for these questions. Uh, so, uh, okay, first let me just uh, introduce myself and let me say my name is uh, Jordi Perez Romero. I'm coming from uh, Universidad Politeña de Catalunya in, in, in Barcelona, in, in in Spain. Let's say I have worked, let's say in 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 different let's say projects, let's say in relation with uh, with uh, network management, resource management, cellular networks, and so on. And then concerning this uh, first uh, question that you were raising, let's say for the for the panel, let's say uh, I think that when when thinking, let's say what are these uh, these challenges that uh, that we have nowadays, let's say for the for the for the network management systems, I think that we have to to put the things a bit into 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 the scope. And I would say that okay, our current trends, the current trends that we have nowadays is that okay, the networks are really becoming much more complex, let's say than we had in the past. I mean, with the five G, and this will go uh, even let's say. In, in beyond 5G will will increase this, this complexity. So we will have, I think, much more tunable parameters. We have many more uh, operation scenarios. Okay, so we have, I mean, it's not only, let's say, for mobile broadband, but also, let's say, uh, many, let's say, services that are uh, requiring, let's say, stringent requirements for, for delay, et cetera, et cetera. So we are expanding the, the, the degree of, 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 of uh, operation scenarios where we can work. Also, I think that another interesting aspect to point out is that, I mean, for 5G and beyond 5G and in the future also, private networks, let's say, will be relevant. So this means that uh, from the perspective of management, the owner of the network may not be really the, the operator. So it may, will not, it may not have the, the same background, let's say, like a, like a cellular operator when managing this, uh, the network. And for this reason, I think that there are several challenges for, for, for this purpose. In this respect, I would mention first that clearly the network automation, let's say, is something like a, like a must. I mean, so basically, when, when managing the, the network, we need to do more extensive support of this uh, previously called this self-organized network functionalities or some sort of uh, functionalities in which the system, let's say, is, is able to work somehow autonomously. And I think it's important that these uh, functions are really, let's say, trustworthy for, for the operator of the, of the network. So the, the, the operator must be able to really trust the decisions that are made by this, by this autonomous system. So I think that this is really, really, really important aspect because perhaps this, this has been one of the issues that, okay, has somehow 
stopped a bit or has uh, made the, the, the introduction of this type of techniques, let's say it's a bit, uh, let's say shorter than, or a bit, let's say slower than, 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 than perhaps one would have expected. So eventually I think that with this, we have to go for something like, sometimes this is called this uh, zero touch uh, management so that we can, uh, let's say, uh, manage the network without, let's say, playing, let's say, I mean, we, by, by, by letting the network be more or less, more or less autonomous. So this is one thing. Also clearly here, the machine learning, I think, will very will be very very critical. I mean, will play a very important role. Let's say in order, let's say to 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 tune the the the, the operation, let's say of these uh, techniques that are able, let's say, to autonomously manage the the network. And on the other hand, also in relation with what I was mentioning before about this uh, private network and this idea that the, the network must be must be managed in a simpler way, I think that uh, simple management uh, user interfaces, I mean, are, 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 are maybe required. And in this respect, I could like perhaps to, to mention something that is used in one of the projects in which I'm participating, which is, by the way, the 5G Clarity project, which makes use of or proposes the use of what they are calling the intent-based uh, network technology so somehow like creating an interface in which what we are doing is just telling the, the the network what do you want and then it's a it's a, it's a network who by, by making also use let's say of these artificial intelligence and so on uh, the network is really able let's say to 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 do what it has to do in order let's say to to achieve the the, the goal that is that is specified so in the way is just to specify the 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 intent by means of a in a simpler or, or plain language and then this can be translated by the by the network to different uh, let's say operations so here we have an issue i mean how to develop this this type of, of systems and eventually i think this will come up with the, with the fact that okay we have to to achieve somehow a, a very important agility in reconfiguring the network so we have to be able to deal with this multiplicity of scenarios of operation so we have to be able to quickly reconfigure the network so we have to be able to anticipate to forecast the situation and also we have to bring agility let's say when 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 bringing the the new services okay so i think there are in summary let's say quite a a, a number let's say of of things let's say that that have uh, that can play a a role here and that there are many many challenges let's say that are let's say uh, existing let's say for this for these future networks so we think more or less this is my my point of view in <coughs> question okay thank you so I can ask uh, Madame Nina Larsen maybe to, for adding something. Yes, um, I think that um, in future ne networks where we will have a, a lot of more base stations, um, this uh, we, we probably solve the, the problem of energy consumption in the base station by uh, the introduction of uh, cloud RAN networks, but. The studies that we have made um, indicates that the 5G and beyond networks will put a large burden on the uh, cross hole uh, network energy consumption. And uh, I think that uh, in, in that regard, uh, future uh, network manage management systems sh should uh, consider uh, how we can utilize uh, the resources uh, in a good manner so that the um, that, that we can reduce the overall energy consumption. So I think it's all about the uh, agility and uh, resource utilization. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Lukas. Hey, welcome everybody. My name is Lukas Mendig. I'm a former product manager for Comarch OSS uh, portfolio in particular for service uh, fulfillment and service orchestration. And in respect to the question, I think that the main challenge for OSS and BSS is to transform the systems to help telecommunication service providers to provide services to, uh, to enterprises, various um, industry verticals. And what is crucial here, I think, is um, provide a tool to design products in the way that um, delivery of the solutions could be automated and I would say intent driven. Okay, intent driven is probably the most overused buzzword, but here by intent I mean high level intent um, provided by the verticals. Uh, by this, for example, I mean if we are talking about small business who, who should be targeted, they might define their needs not in respect of the network. Uh, network slices, but driver would like to define the needs in respect to, for example, how many assembly lines they need, 
uh, what kind of actuators and, or sensor mm -hmm. they closed loop con control subsystems uh, need. And then the system should be able to automatically translate it into the network needs, uh, what network slice it should be instantiated. And, and that should be automated. So that means that uh, probably the BSS OSS stack should provide the design studio where prior to customers ordering the products, you need to be able to design the the end-to-end -end, um, service and um, bridging the gap between verticals and the network uh, and network itself. The second point probably is a problem is transformation of OSS BSS towards cloud native applications. And it is not only to enable to um, host the OSS BSS in, in the cloud, but also to reposition um, OSS and BSS system as a as a part of an intelligent network, meaning that OSS and BSS system could be treated as a network functions co-hosted, co co-located um, co with a real network and being able to support intelligent decision um, um, taken by some smart algorithms um, at the edge and um, uh, augmenting orchestration or, or the control. And the third thing, which I think is related to that, is from business perspective, is to enable to um, tackle the private 5G concept where telco operators should be able to provide um, private private networks to their customers, uh, leveraging network slicing, but also providing the OSS BSS stack instantiated at the edge or regional, or regional data center so their customers can um, have a tool for managing their end customers. Okay, that, that, that's all. maybe the three main points from my side. Okay, thank you. Yes, we, uh, maybe very important point would be standardization. That's all, I suppose that, that now when we, if we are working for 5G, 5G, we, we see that this lack of standardization. We have many vendors in, of uh, slices and it will be it is now quite difficult to manage virtualized architecture. So, my few cents. <laughs> okay, so let me pass to the second question. It is very important. It touches energy efficiency. Yes, so what should be direction for largely improving the energy efficiency of the future beyond 5G networks. So to answer or to, to, to comment to comment this question, I will ask uh, as the first person, Madame Ine Larsen. Thank you. Um, I think I already touched upon that before. I'm sorry, I had some uh, sound issues. Um, but I think that um, the important thing here is that uh, future networks require a lot of uh, capacity um, and courage. And beyond 5G networks will have a large impact, not only on the radio access network, but also on the cross hall network connecting um, the, uh, the radio access network to the core. Um, and I think and a very important matter to achieve energy savings in future networks will be to utilize uh, the resources we have. So both in terms of, of the RAN, so we, we need to ut utilize the bandwidth we have, we need to utilize the spectral efficiency, um, maybe even before deploying new base stations, as, as they will, this will save energy resources. Um, but another important parameter to consider is uh, how we will get the energy supplies. So um, if we use uh, renewable energy resources, um, what if these resources are not stable? How can we have a resilient systems uh, in, in that uh, regard? Is it possible to use AI um, or is it possible to store the energy uh, so we can use it, uh, use it when it's needed? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, hello. Uh, let me uh, let me just uh, 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 answer this question. This is uh, uh, Robert Gdowski from IS Wireless. I'm the senior R&D 
engineer here, uh, focusing on Mano and uh, and VNFs and uh, virtualization in general. Uh, I, uh, in terms of the energy efficiency, uh, we have uh, we have one part which is uh, which is the uh, let's say the radio access network itself uh, for example the the techniques like cellless uh, communication is um, is something that can improve the energy efficiency uh, in the future uh, but um, for um, then let's say networking side or the or the orchestration side uh, we have, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, you know, the, the, the backend side. Uh, we have uh, several techniques that can be improved in, in the in the future um, uh, generations of, of network. Uh, one of them is uh, is uh, uh, basically uh, use or, or the natively use of the acceleration or or the or the uh, let's say ARM processor or ARM servers uh, uh, to to reduce the energy uh, footprint. Uh, but uh, another another technique is is for the orchestrating uh, systems to um, be able to uh, deploy the network in a way or, or, or the uh, virtualized n network services uh, in a way that uh, that uh, the energy consumption is uh, is minimized so uh, for example we can uh, we can um, uh, it, it can be a prior uh, priority so we are not uh, deploying the the network uh, in the um, in a, a cost-effective way, for example, or, or, or we can uh, sacrifice some some other components, but we can put energy efficiency uh, to the highest point that that needs to be uh, satisfied. Also, uh, we have the uh, artificial intelligence that allows us to uh, to have predictions of the future state of the network, so we can predict the failures. In advance, so that uh, that can be uh, helpful in a sense that uh, this prediction uh, can give us some um, some additional time uh, to perform some actions. For example, to deploy uh, the VNFs, the virtual uh, network functions, uh, uh, again and and configure them and attach to the uh, to the rest uh, of the network. So. Uh, this is important because it can reduce the need for the redundancy nodes that that can um, that can be always up and consume and consume the resources. So that's uh, uh, that's from my uh, uh, my part. I I jumped in. Sorry because uh, uh, I I I was added to the panel in the in the last moment. So um, you may not be uh, aware of uh, uh, of that. Sorry for that. <coughs> So thank you for presenting the offer of ICE Wireless. Wireless. Yes, if uh, there are some questions to, to you from other parties, or maybe and then and then. So uh, I will ask other other panelists if someone wants to add something to this what uh, Mina Larsen. Professor Jordi Perez Ramero. Romero. Yes. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Concerning this this aspect of the energy efficiency, I think it's a it's a very relevant uh, point. I think overall, I would say that in general, the let's say the 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 technologies are becoming let's say greener. I mean, if we compare, for example, five G with uh, previous technologies, perhaps it's 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 greener from the perspective of how do they put the signals and and and, and how do they utilize the bandwidth. So in general, it's 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 good. However, still, I mean, because we will have to handle much more much more traffic. I think we need uh, other we need techniques in order to better improve the energy efficiency. And I respect in, re in this respect, I I see mainly the the directions of first of all uh, making let's say a, a smart let's say energy network infrastructure by including power saving features in the in the network, such as for example decide how to switch down cells at mm -hmm. certain times of the day, particularly in a small cells where perhaps the traffic is not very large. So here again, uh, artificial intelligence may may play a role. I mean, if we go in a more futuristic perspective, perhaps why not also incorporated somehow the, the the user equipment in the equation actually here uh, so i'm participating in one spanish project which is called artists that is a bit futuristic but the idea here is 
to use somehow the the the, the user equipment as a as a way of extending, let's say, the the radio access network in a way that the user equipment can be dynamically activated or not to become, let's say, like a like a cell, like a like a like a radio station, and in this way we can save the deployment cost, let's say, for the for the operators, and also let's say uh, we can optimize somehow the deployments in a more dynamic way. I mean, it's a futuristic idea, but could be could be useful. Also, from the perspective of the architectures in the system, I mean, developing ener more energy efficient architectures. Uh, here we have the main idea is the cloud run. So we are moving the computations to the data centers. But the point again is there is somehow a trade off. I mean, because we are putting, let's say, more energy in the in this uh, in these data centers. I mean, um, is some sort of, uh, of let's say, trade off here in where to put the, 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 the different functions from the perspective of energy consumption. Okay, I don't know. Here, just open question. Also, I guess that the possibilities of doing multi-tenancy network sharing that, that may also lead to, to more efficient deployments. And lastly, I, I could also mention perhaps this idea of these alternative sources of power. I mean, for example, solar or wind energy and so on. The point here is I think it would be very useful if we can apply them, for example, for, for feeding the, the radio access network. The point is that if currently they are already sufficiently reliable, let's say, to, to avoid these uh, energy cuts or, or so, or let's say if some more efforts that they are doing in order to, to achieve that they are a, a reliable source of energy for a, for a network. So basically, these are my, my, my two cents on the, on the topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And last panelist, yes, Mr. Lucas Mendic. You, do you want to add something? Uh, yes, uh, in fact, from maybe different uh, angle point. Mm -hmm. um, I think that energy efficiency is not only about network being uh, energy efficient, but also whether um, 5G networks can help to transform the industry towards the energy efficiency. And I think it's even more important because we can imagine the situation that network consumes a lot of energy, but if the intelligence um, sourcing from the network can help to reduce energy consumption in the industry, that can be a good, good solution. So I think um, this is, I think, the most important thing, whether we as an industry can, can prove that Telco can really transform our surrounding, in fact, towards more sustainable economy. But that's, I think, that's one of the most important challenges. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would like only to recall that the, the IT sector sector consume about four percent of the total energy consumption over the world. So it is important. It is growing and growing. <laughs> so we say about the how to save uh, save energy, but no. <coughs> We should remember that that our sector is growing and growing, and we consume more and more. Okay. <laughs> if I may say uh, one thing, then I think it's important that uh, they find the right trade-off between uh, performance and and cost, energy efficiency, and of course reliability. Yes. <clears throat> Okay, so let me pass to the last round. And the question is the following. Service orchestration, network orchestration, ML, AI orchestration, which will be the most crucial for being 5G network success. Maybe for this round, the first uh, panelist yes, will be Mr. Vukas Mendy. Uh, okay, I, I think that the most important is end-to-end -end orchestration. So, um, so what I mentioned earlier, but by end-to-end -end orchestration, I mean from intent, high-level intent down to the, being able to orchestrate the network and do it smartly. So, from that perspective, the end-to-end -end orchestration is important. If I to define where is the most difficult thing to do, uh, once again, I would repeat that I think that the most crucial and um, aspect is um, ability to translate the vertical requirements to the network because we here we can see the gap between uh, expertise of the network engineers from various verticals who, who does not understand sometimes the network so here i think this um, this orchestration um, i would position in the service orchestration is probably the most challenging and of course machine learning is something which should help with that um, at design time i still believe that human creativity 
is needed. Let's hope that it is. Uh, but machine learning can help and assist this design and 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 make it and make it efficient. So I wouldn't say that. Uh, so so finally, I think end-to-end -end orchestration is important, and um, probably machine learning is to help to to make it happen, uh, especially in the situation where you need to translate vertical needs to the network operations requirements. Thank you. <laughs> So I will ask uh, Professor Jordi Perez Romero for some comments, if any. Sure, yeah, definitely. I think that the, the the three elements you mentioned—I mean, the service orchestration, network orchestration, and the machine learning, artificial intelligence orchestration—I think all of them are really relevant for uh, achieving, as I was mentioning, this agility when when we have to to reconfigure the the network, adding new services, and so on. Here, perhaps if we, if we focus on the on the radio access network, I, I would say that with the with the current trend that we are now seeing, let's say, in different organizations such as the Oran Alliance and so on, or for example, even some projects like uh, in this case I mentioned affordable 5G, which is a current project also, that they are going in the trend of disaggregating the runs, the radio access network. So having, for example, the central unit, the distributed unit. I mean, bringing let's say some some stuff, let's say, to to data centers and so on. Here, definitely, network orchestration is 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 critical it's a, it's a very partic important let's say element let's say how to uh, specify where the different functions are placed and also in relation to this and um, with this artificial intelligence i mean it's also important let's say where, where to place the, the artificial intelligence if it has to go in the run if it has to go in the service management and orchestration layer etc so here we have many possibilities and Concerning this part of the machine learning, I think one aspect which is particularly challenging, let's say, for this, is how to to train, let's say, the the, the models. I mean, there is a lot of uh, hype, let's say, with with artificial intelligence, and in order to come to or to bring this to to the reality, I think one one aspect that we have to 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 overcome is okay. Machine learning requires that the, the models first of all they are trained properly, because if we are using a model which is not properly trained, this may have a large bad impact, let's say, on the network. So I think one key aspect here of how to or further evolving this uh, machine learning is, let's say, how to perform the training. How do we get the data for the training so that this is uh, the, the model can learn all the, the, the multiplicity of situations that can that they can have. So I think this is a, a relevant challenge. I mean, artificial intelligence is important, but let's say there are some issues, let's say, on, on how to, 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 to do the artificial intelligence work in a, in a proper way. OK, so basically these are my, my my comments on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So maybe something wants to add, Madame Nina Lersan. Um, I think that the, I agree in that the future network should be agile, and I think that probably this will be um, deployment scenario specific. Specific. So in some scenarios, we will need the more heterogeneous solutions and, and sometimes we also need to guarantee um, performance. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Now we have two minutes. As I announced, I have one maybe simple, maybe not simple question. But I'm interested what about what do you think? Yes. Now I'm I'm leader of very important national project. We build a 5G research network, national 5G research network. And we compared, we had to compare at the standardization level with this, what is available on the market. And we see that there are large distance between <laughs> this the standardization and this what is available in the market. So it means that the work of 5G implementation network does not finish. It's not finished. It's not finished. So we still should work on improving 5G. But we, in the time of the, the panel, was mentioned the techniques about 6G. So my question is, it is time to think about the, the, the future networks, but beyond 6G, or it is too, too early? <laughs> it is too early, we should focus on 6G, but I, I don't know, the, the time horizon for, for the techniques 
beyond 5G, I suppose, is quite, quite far. What do you think? Uh, if I if I may, uh, I think it's uh, it's always uh, um, good to think uh, what it's beyond of the beyond. It's uh, of course six G. It's something crisp that that's uh, supposed to be finalized within the next ten years. But uh, of course we should dream of what is uh, what is beyond that. Yes, but taking the account of the past time, for instance, it was time more or less ten years ago. This whole Europe, where whole Europe, Europe was thinking, but not Europe, were about future internet, future, future internet, and after ten years, we have no future internet. So Burakovsky, uh, apologies for, for interrupting. Uh, just a kind reminder that the uh, time is up. So uh, really, last last minute to sum up. Thank you. Okay. So I suppose that the discussion was very frightful. Painful. Thanks to our panelists and the colleague from the ES Wireless. Yes, there is no time for for asking for other people for putting the questions. So one again. I would like to thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Thank you. So we can finish. Or if someone wants to add one, two sentences, it would be nice. If not, thank you very much. Finish. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Burakowski, for chairing the debate, and uh, many thanks to our dear panelists. Um, with that, uh, I would like to remind you about the possibility to ask questions on the chat. We have uh, received very warm comments about our previous uh, presenter, which is uh, great to hear. Uh, please note that for the talk right now, you can ask uh, the questions in uh, real time. Um, please help me welcome uh, our next speaker, Professor Walid Saad from Virginia Tech in the US, uh, who will tell us about uh, AI and uh, ML in the future mobile networks, in the future wireless networks. Walid, the floor is yours. Much. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to talk at this conference. So today I'm going to talk a little bit, a brief overview, I mean, within the 15 minutes that we have on, on the role of AI and learning uh, in future wireless networks, say 6G, 5G, whatever you want to call it. So I, I will start with the kind of like the existential question, why? Why do we need uh, AI or machine learning in 6G? So first, uh, think of it, uh, if you want to think at a very low level, meaning that future networks will have or will accommodate autonomous systems. Whether we use AI for communications or not, AI will be there, right? So we will have autonomous vehicles or drones or even sensors. So it will be there. So it's a use case for 6G, whether we want to use it for 6G itself or not, it's going to be an application of 6G. So that's something that we cannot get, uh, uh, get rid of. Second is that we should move from what we call self-organizing networks, which are really uh, more or less they adapt to something that they see towards what I'd like to call a self-sustaining network, which basically lives from the data it sees, right? So it's able to sustain its operation, to remain operational, to provide the quality of service you need by learning and by, by kind of uh, uh, morphing as required by what it observes. And saying that simply means we need less rigid protocols. And we, we, we mentioned that in one of our kind of a couple of years ago in a 6G paper where we said that we need less rigid protocols. We need to get rid of existing protocols and replace them with data driven. And that has now become more along the lines of what the industry calls AI native, essentially. And last but not least, and I think that's perhaps the uh, uh, one of the more earliest uh, use cases of, of, of AI, which is being proactive, right? Think about caching uh, and how we go beyond that. So with that, we can articulate three use cases for AI and wireless networks in general. The first one is more along the lines of data analytics. So understanding, let's say, the environment or understanding application requirements. And that already started in 5G. And that's really, again, along the lines of user caching, uh, predicting blockage, if you wish, something along those very simple lines 
uh, where we can do some proactive uh, 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 intelligence, but it's not really fully intelligent. And I'm not going to talk too much about this in this talk. I think that's something that most of us already know very well. The second use case, which will be the focus of my talk, is more along the line of AI-native control, right? So instead of assisting uh, 5G with AI, how can we design a protocol that's really tailored to the, the, the use cases of, of wireless systems and the requirements of wireless systems? And third, but, uh, but not least, I'll talk briefly about it. It's more about this edge learning and going towards collaborative AI with, again, small data. I'll talk more about small data and most use cases, actually. So starting with use case two, where I will present, I mean, it's going to be the core of the presentation. So in use case two, ML and AI are not really used to just analyze data. It's really to instill native intelligence in the network, right? So as I mentioned, it's a living network. It thinks, adapts, and, and behaves as required or as dictated by what it observes. And that by, what I mean by that is including the wireless environment, including user behavior, including all the possible parameters uh, that the wireless system has to, uh, uh, to kind of like deal with. Why do we need it? I mean, why do we need AI in this use case? First, as I mentioned, rigid models and rigid protocols, which are pre-fixed, pre-standardized in some sense, while they're useful, they cannot really cope with the latency, the reliability, the heterogeneity of what we think of our future networks, right? When we talk about mergers of physical and virtual worlds, think of how many parameters and how many factors come into play from human intelligence to autonomous systems to all sorts of new you know, uh, uh, spectrum challenges and, 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 and wireless challenges in general. So data-driven solutions are necessary to replace basically the rigid models. Second is we always say that about wireless, they're heterogeneous and dynamic, but really we're merging, we're going towards somewhere where this becomes central. It's no longer an issue of a car moving on a street where you need to adapt to its mobility. It's more along the lines, everything is dynamic, right? Even uh, uh, factories will be automated with robots that are dynamic and that are heterogeneous. So adaptive and reliable solutions are necessary. And of course, the more complex we become, the more scalability becomes an issue. And that's where deep networks in particular can come into play. Now, there are many challenges, and I've heard some of them in the panel before and so on. But I think there's three substantially important challenges that we need to focus on when we think about AI or AI native control. So the first one is how do we reduce the dependence on training, right? So what happens if my system sees an unseen case, an unseen use case? Can we in some sense have reliable learning, not reliable wireless only, but reliable learning that can make sense of small data? That helps in many ways. First, it allows you to kind of operate in a, a, in a faster way, but also it helps in reducing transmissions because if you can work with small data, you don't need to transmit a lot of data as well. Second is, is slow convergence is a, is a staple of, of, of AI algorithms. And in, in the computer vision community, that's not a big deal because they can always have a stronger computer computational uh, uh, device and, and, and latency while important is not central. And wireless is slow latency that's central for us, right? Especially for future networks. Third is more along the line of multi-agent systems, right? So there's foundations and game theory uh, and other uh, uh, techniques where it allows us to understand how a multi-agent AI system can work. So let's talk a little bit more about this, these first two bullets in this talk. So I'm going to present a kind of a new concept we call Experience Deep RL for reliable low latency communication. So this is a TCOM paper uh, that appears, uh, appeared earlier this year. So we, I'm going to take a very simple system and just show you how we can kind of go beyond applying Deep RL. So what can we do more? So consider just the downlink of an OFDMA wireless network. Uh, we're looking at latency sensitive control messages, let's say to autonomous systems or VR or whatever you want. And then we're looking at the downlink. This is just the channel rate, so very quickly with the math here. So you have uh, resource blocks that needs to be allocated, and that's kind of the problem we're going to look at. You have a power, you have the channel gain, and you have basically the bandwidth uh, and the data rate, essentially. So reliability for us will be defined as the end-to-end -end packet delay. Uh, and maintaining that end-to-end -end packet delay within the threshold. Keep in mind that this definition is very uh, uh, general, and it allows me and, or requires me to model the delay at all the endpoints of the system, which means if I am to use a model, it's going to be very complex. So we're not going to make any assumption for the delay model. Instead, we're going to say, well, we admit that delay is 
hard to model. We can use MM1 or Poisson arrivals and things like that. But when we talk about end-to-end -end delay, that's too kind of too much of an approximation to the real world. So let's just say delay has many components. We don't know how to model them. And let's keep the model of the delay as data-driven. We don't know what it is. We're going to kind of learn it from the network. So the problem formulation itself is very classical, but I think that's the beauty of it. In some sense, I'm going to show a classical problem formulation and then show why it becomes challenging and how we can overcome it. So we're trying to allocate power and resource blocks here. So P, P, P I, J is the power allocation, resource blocks are row I, J, basically an indicator function. So you can see the, the, uh, uh, the constraint here. And I'm trying to minimize the total power, but the key point is this constraint. I'm trying to maintain my delay uh, 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 so I'm trying to make sure that my delay does not exceed a threshold, uh, no, I mean, within this bound, one minus gamma I star. Simply put, gamma I star is your reliability. So with gamma I star, which is the five nines or whatever you would like it to be, how, many, how much can I guarantee that my delay is within the uh, delay max that I wish? So this is the latency. And keep in mind, I don't have a model for the I, which means I cannot use some of the tricks that you see in some of the research, like Lyapunov optimization, using Poisson arrival, virtual queues, because I, I'm, I'm simply saying I don't know what the delay is. And then we have a few feasibility constraints here. Power should be positive, uh, row should be a binary variable, so these are simple. And we added to this a rate constraint, in the sense we're saying that the rate should be greater than the arrival rate uh, of the packets and the packet size, in the sense that we're not only doing URLC in the traditional sense, meaning ignore rate, have short packets, we're more along the lines, high rate, reliable low latency communication. So we have explicit rate guarantees. So this is challenging because of this uh, uh, constraint particularly. Again, if you model these constraints, you can, I mean, you can use uh, optimization techniques. So to handle model free, we first notice that this constraint gamma, the reliability, is nothing but this. One minus the ratio of the number of packets that exceed the delay divided by the total number of packets. This is something that the network can observe. This is data. So how, how do we do that? Let's let the network learn uh, this delay. How do we do that? People have proposed the enforcement learning because it's kind of natural and it allows you to solve such problems. Classical reinforcement learning cannot handle the large state space, but DeepRL came into play in the last few years, and it really allows us to kind of overcome the large state space. The state space for me here is the channel, uh, the packet arrival, the packet link. So essentially the, uh, uh, the traffic and the wireless environment. So with DeepRL, with existing DeepRL, we can handle that pretty well, but that's still not, not done. So this is the framework we propose. We have a DeepRL framework. We have two challenges. State space challenge is solved through the deep aspect, but we have, we have also an action space challenge. We solve it through what we propose. We call it an action space reducer. It's an optimization toolbox, if you wish. And it has two steps. In the first step, we use a PPO algorithm. It's a well-known uh, learning algorithm to kind of find the desired rate that optimizes my, uh, uh, that solves my optimization problem. And then to map the rate to power and RBs, we use what we call the action space reduce. So I'm not going to delve too much into this because my interest is, lies a little bit more uh, elsewhere for this presentation. So this is, again, it's important. Uh, we worked on it. You can see it in the paper. So we define the reward function based on the optimization problem. And then we can, again, I'll be a little bit quick here. Uh, we can show that given this RL algorithm that we defined, given this reward function and the weight that controls your reliability, we can show that when you converge, reliability per user is guaranteed, assuming the problem is feasible, of course. If you don't have enough resource blocks to solve the problem, then, then you cannot guarantee reliability. But assuming feasibility, then you can guarantee reliability. Now, as I mentioned, the action space reducer goes back to the idea that in computer vision, the action spaces are usually small, so up, down, left, and right. But in wireless networks, usually we ignore that. But here what we do is we use, again, PPO plus optimization. But now I'll go into the more uh, challenging question. Is DeepRL reliable and suitable for low latency communication and reliability? No, because it can be slow to converge. And since it relies on training, if it sees an extreme case, which is important to be reliable, then it might not converge on time. What is the solution? Using what we call GAN. So the idea is the following. Since I know that I will have scarce data, can I augment this data in a way to allow my DeepRL agent to, to have experience enough 
so that it can handle deep fades, what I call extreme cases, which is deep fades, traffic surges, something that it has not seen before. So I'm reducing the reliance on training by improving the training phase and stuff. So what we do is we create this virtual environment. So we train offline the deep RL agent, but not like everybody has done before. So we don't train it only with real data. What we do is we create a virtual environment that use GANs. If you're not familiar with GANs, GANs have been used like, like to kind of generate fake celebrity photos, to generate fair deep fakes and so on. Here we use it to generate data for our training. And I'll tell you how in the next slide. So what we do is we say we have limited scarce and limited and scarce real data. And we have ability to simulate data. Can we create a combination of the two? And that's what we do with GAN. This is how it, it works. So we use something called the Refiner GAN, which was proposed by Apple for computer vision. The idea there was that they have unlabeled real images, let's say, of eyes looking in different directions. And they have a simulator that can generate synthetic eyes. They wanted something that can combine the synthetic eyes with the real data to generate real-like eyes that look in directions that do not appear here that we can control here, but they comply with the real data. We have the same problem. We have always, we always complain as wireless that we don't have enough data. So we have a scarce real data that's unlabeled. We can generate a lot of things with models, right? With synthetic data. We use them as input to the refiner so that we refine the synthetic data in a way to comply with the real data and generate as much as we'd like information that is real, as real as it could be. And that's also controllable through the synthetic data. This allows you to gain experience as an RL agent, and then you deploy it in the field. And I mean, I'll skip this quickly. I mean, we can prove that there's a lower bound on where you could be trained, and there's a lot of theoretical results you can show here. But the idea is that we can control synthetic and real, and we can make sure that we generate these extreme use cases. How does that translate into performance? So you can see here a comparison of our red proposed vanilla deep RL without, I mean, classical one, one that's trained only with real data, which is blue. One that's trained with only simulated data that's free. You can see that ours, the red one, is very quick to converge. Usually, prior work on RL ignore this transitory phase. You can see we're very quick to converge. You can also see we're better than the real, uh, pre-trained with real data only, better than the others. More interestingly is the next result. Here, we insert at Epoch 100, we insert a uh, artificial traffic search. And you can see that all algorithms eventually adapt to it. But if you don't train it like we do, if you don't have experience like the green and the blue curves, it takes forever to train. And this contradicts with the latency. This is where training becomes an issue with classical AI. And we proposed one solution to it. There are others, and I'm going to talk about them briefly at the end. Uh, so this is essentially what uh, we'd like to do. And I mean, since I'm kind of close to the 15 minutes now, I'm going to just briefly talk about edge AI and move to kind of conclude. So when we talk about edge AI, what we're trying to think about in the future is to have a multi-agent system where we can do small data locally and we can generalize locally without exchanging much data. And this feeds into ideas that are coming up for 6G, like semantic communication, uh, like uh, autonomous factories and things of the sort. And, and I mean, this would be probably a talk for a future kind of uh, a talk. So I'm going to kind of skip this and just conclude on time. So first, I would say that this issue of reliability, generalization, whatever you want to call it, is probably the most important challenge in AI. How do we do more with less? How do we learn with very little training? Can we, in fact, get rid of training altogether? Of course, the answer is not simple. It's not direct. As I mentioned, there are several ideas. We've been looking at the idea of meta learning. So learn from one task, map it to another or doing what we call, what some people call reasoning, which is a bit of a loose word, but the idea is, can you learn structure of the data and generalize? And, and that's kind of important. Another interesting area is more along the lines of the theoretical foundations, particularly for multi-agent systems. And of course, there are other issues like integrating with ORAN, how do we deploy this in an actual system? Energy efficiency is another aspect. Uh, and so acknowledging some of my students quickly, and finally, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Walid, for your presentation. And thank you also for taking the time to get up so early. We know it's 7 a.m. Uh, in your time zone. Um, I'm checking the chat, but we don't have any questions for you today. So thank you very much again. All right, thank you. Bye. 
And with that, it's time to um, start our last panel of today, which is on the topic of experimentation platforms uh, for towards beyond 5G networks. Uh, the panel will be moderated uh, by um, Ljubtro Jorguseski, PhD from the TNO in the Netherlands. And um, Ljubtro will be joined by his panelists, uh, Filippo Zugini, the professor from C. NIT from Italy, uh, with um, will be joined by Walter Nitzhold, PhD from the National Instruments in Dresden in Germany. Walter, good to see you again. Uh, Professor Pedro Merino Gomez from the University of Malaga in Spain. And last but certainly not least, uh, Dimitri Lakonstev, uh, PhD from Skokovo Institute of Science and Technology. Ljubcho, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, from uh, IS Wireless for organizing this. Uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, loud and clear. All right. Okay, so I think we have a, a, a good uh, uh, discussion uh, for, the, uh, for the panel and a good, uh, really great uh, group of panelists. Uh, uh, spreading across the Europe, uh, so from, from Spain to, to, to Russia. So I think it's uh, very important in this time to think about um, experimentation and, and, and test beds for beyond 5G systems and 6G systems. So I, I'm really glad to have the opportunity to share ideas and to see different views on this topic. So what I would propose is to start with some uh, first round of the panelists um, addressing the challenges we have ahead of us in beyond 5G systems, and so I would like to hear um, what your thoughts are about what uh, what we are dealing with and what challenging um, challenges and obstacles we are facing for beyond 5G or 6G experiments and testbeds. So maybe we can start uh, with uh, Filippo. Hello, hi, thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you for his wireless for organizing this very interesting uh, event. So my name is Filippo Cugini. I'm a research, uh, I'm a head of research area at CNIT. CNIT is a private research center based in Italy. And my, my field of expertise is on networking, uh, in particular on supporting 5G, 6G with the uh, underlying infrastructure from the metro area network, from the optical infrastructure, and also for the edge computing part. So I'm, uh, I have the honor to, to uh, coordinate a, a large European project, in which uh, is wireless is a key partner. And uh, the goal uh, for this project named Brainy, um, the, the goal is to bring the artificial intelligence at the network edge. So in our case, experimentation is uh, extremely relevant. We will build uh, from hardware an edge computing node that will serve uh, to both applications as well as to the infrastructure, for example, accelerating 5G functions. So for us, experimentation is extremely relevant and I'm happy to discuss about this topic uh, uh, in, this, in this event. Okay, thank you. Then maybe we go to Walter. Yes, of course. So um, also thanks from my side for uh, organizing this event to IS Wireless and looking forward to the discussion. So I'm here as the uh, part of NI and NI itself is like involved in many test beds all around the world with our USRP platform and also with the accompanying software. So we thought in the beginning we got many things right with 4G testbeds and we maybe got also a little bit of a glimpse of what to do and how to design 5G testbeds. And now I think this is also the, the key essence of the, of the panel. We are at the verge of incorporating uh, what 5G design has taught us to strengthen the design of 6G testbeds. And what I see is uh, an important driver in this area is the idea of virtualization and disaggregation in networks. So we see this with ORAN architectures and with the corresponding APIs. And seeing this happening already, uh, 
we think that there might be the idea of bringing this design idea also to test beds. And so as an eye, we always talked about software defined radio. Um, but question is now, what if we start also to talk about software defined everything within the test beds? And that could, for example, mean to have like interchangeable software at all layers of the stack of an end to end test bed, not only deploying, for example, um, let's say core network functions on different hardware, but even think of maybe uh, dynamically switching our F frontends, for example, switching from a terahertz communications node to a Zigbee node or something like that, just with a with a switch. So this this is an overall challenge that I see for test beds, and there are a few technology paradigms that I also see that are coming up and that we need to address. For example, terahertz communications. I mentioned this before. I think there are very simple test beds already at hand somewhere like peer-to-peer uh, -peer test beds, but how to combine these ideas, these terahertz communications with the overall softwareized test bed approach uh, before and, and actually with test terahertz, how to work on the hardware challenge. Joint communications and sensing is another thing uh, which has not yet been widely spread. So how to incorporate those ideas and also hardware challenges like uh, full duplex communications for these kind of things. And yeah, extreme MIMO is, Maybe the third thing to mention here, um, I think there we are actually quite quite far with the deployment of the hardware and software tools, but there are still some things to, to think of, for example, in terms of synchronization. If you want to kind of yield the, the gains of uh, a cell-free massive MIMO, you need to have a good synchronization, and this is a, a big challenge. So these are the questions that we kind of want to learn about and try to incorporate into the next version of testnets. Okay, thanks, Walter, for your uh, uh, views. So maybe the next uh, uh, standpoint uh, to be shared is from Dimitri. Okay, hello, colleagues. Um, thank you for inviting me. And well, yes, I uh, tell you about a bit uh, of our activities. Actually, I'm head of the next generation virus and IoT center in uh, Skoltech in Moscow. And uh, well, we actually uh, are responsible for the almost all uh, open run activities in Russia here. And uh, actually, we are performing our own uh, research and development. And mostly, as my center is a project center, is the development of the 4G, 5G base station. Well, we uh, do some research in uh, 6G. Uh, mostly in sub terahertz and a bit in uh, embedded AI in the 6G environment, but uh, main activities in about 5G. We are a member of FreeGPP, Oran Alliance, and the Telecom Info Project. Well, we have our own uh, 5G uh, uh, pilot zone, outdoor pilot zone in Band 79. It's more than two square kilometers, and we perform a lot of tests, I mean, drive tests and outdoor tests. And we actually actually work with uh, our operator, um, MTS, as the biggest Russian mobile operator, and we do some tests uh, in, on the real network called the operator network, and uh, that really challenge us to always have uh, kind of the full stack and full network uh, environment, test environment for our products and for the products of our partners, as far as we work in Oran um, Paradigm, and uh, actually the Skoltech right now hosting the Plug Fest, Open Run Alliance Plug Fest here in Moscow. And uh, the second uh, big challenge is to perform all these tests uh, remotely because of COVID, basically. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to, to do a lot of virtualization and a lot of work how to interconnect uh, the different parts of the solution. But anyway, uh, uh, looks like the managing the big infrastructure, I mean, outdoor and indoor tests, and the test different uh, equipment from different uh, vendors, I mean, and, uh, open run um, uh, compatible. Uh, this is the main challenge right now for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this introductory uh, words. And then uh, let's finish the round, the first round of the panel with, uh, with Pedro. Thanks a lot for the invitation. My name is Pedro Marino. I'm, I'm professor at the University of Malaga. Uh, here we are building test beds for 4G, 5G, and now also for advanced 5G. Uh, our activity is mainly in end-to-end test beds, including everything from both academic and industrial solutions. We are now active in uh, six uh, European projects where the test bed by University of Malaga is included. Five of them are from the 
5GPPP. And the other one is, the, is from FIRE, the FIRE initiative at the European Commission, in particular in Fed for Five Plus, where the test bed is exposed to small companies and to to research community. Our main uh, contribution in the test based on the main is on methodologies and automation. And we have developed a number of tools and we have contributed also to the methodologies, for instance, to be included now in the Etsy specification or recommendation for making end to end uh, testing. And we are, we are also exploiting the test bed for our internal research, mainly for uh, those topics that is explained before on deterministic communications, end-to-end -end support for TSM, new protocols, and all these activities. So this is the first one. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just a few, few words from, from my side. At, at TNO, we also experiment a lot uh, with uh, at least with 5G test beds at this moment. Uh, various field labs also throughout the Netherlands. Um, ranging from the north in, the, in, the, in the Groningen, where we have uh, 5G deployments for uh, the agriculture sector and the rural areas, to the southeast, uh, for example, in Helmond, we have a field lab um, focusing on automotive uh, uh, tests with, with 5G. And we have um, uh, our in our headquarters in The Hague, um, uh, 5G uh, lab uh, lab environment where we also focus a lot on, on open run uh, uh, functionalities and, and virtualization. And um, we are very curious also about introducing the artificial intelligence and machine learning in various various levels of the of the system. So I'm wondering um, how do you see this challenge for from uh, testing and and, and experiments uh, point of view. Uh, how do you see, for example, uh, obtaining training data, data uh, for uh, AI ML algorithms? How do you benchmark uh, different solutions? So can you maybe share, uh, share your thoughts about that? So maybe we start now the other way around from Pedro. Okay. Yeah. Actually, including artificial intelligence and machine learning is, uh, is a big problem is getting the autonomous system. So from the point of view of the platforms, until now, we try to have everything under control. I mean, we need to have comparable results. You need to, be, to, to have some experiments that you can repeat. So you need to automate as much as possible. When you are introducing in the platform the capability for self-organizing, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and decisions by the protocols or by the system. Or by, like it, you, you are losing the capability of controlling everything. So you are losing the capability of having comparable resources. This is a real challenge for the experimentation platforms. Um, apart from that, for me, it's also, uh, there are many changes, many challenges, for instance, to get the information, monitoring, real-time monitoring, non-intrusive real-time monitoring to get data, to have the input for the uh, prediction, configuration, and so on, to, to have the loop, the closed loop, without interfering in the proper function, uh, behavior of the platform. This is for me a real challenge where we are talking about uh, less than milliseconds, and we're talking about microseconds, and we're talking about a lot of information. So, this balance between automation, comparable results, plus self-autonomous networks and protocols and systems, this is for me an open challenge where we need to develop some effort in the next uh, few years. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, Dimitri? Yeah, actually, uh, we can divide our activity on two parts. The so first uh, part is mostly for the developing the real equipment and real software and testing this real software and the real um, uh, environment. Uh, well, and the second part is uh, definitely for the algorithms and the protocols polishing and debugging. And of course, for the polishing and debugging of algorithms, we definitely need some uh, simulating uh, environment and of course, need some, uh, because it's it's 
it's really very crucial to repeat exactly the experiment that was before, because actually then you're debugging something, you have to have absolutely the same situation. And of course, it's impossible in the real environment and some, even in some, you know, virtual environments. So you definitely have to use simulations. And talking about the, uh, let's say, baselines and the data sets for the, for the simulating, we try to use them from the real uh, traffic of the, and real information of the operator because we have the, our NTS operators as a partner. And it, 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 it really costs us, uh, you know, hand and leg, <laughs> but actually we get uh, the access to the real network and start to collect the, the data sets from the real, uh, from the real base station. And uh, it's not really always helpful because actually we, we, you can't say what exactly was outside the network. So we see only one part like uh, we see some logs from the base station, but we don't know what was exactly around this base station. I mean, in the sense of the interference, for example, or for UEs connected to the base station, something like this. But anyway, uh, since we have our own setup, I mean, the base station, the core network, and the, even the transport network, we can repeat some, uh, let's say, uh, synthetic scenario just to start traffic and see what what's happened. But actually, yes, the, the main challenge may be for the simulations, it's exactly the collection of the data sets. Okay, thank you. Walter, you are you? Yeah, I would actually directly <laughs> chime into uh, what Dimitri just mentioned, which is the data set. So I think AI ML is a cool tool, which actually starts to fly when you have good data, right? Yeah. And obtaining the data is the hard thing to do. And getting f data for, for training the network, for doing simulations, right? That, and um, getting good data out of maybe some test beds, even just collecting the data. And I think one, one important thing here is you just can collect data, but you need to somehow also have classified data to actually make use of it to train a network because just kind of sampling whatever RF environment doesn't help you. Uh, and there needs to be someone or at least uh, um, some kind of approach to kind of classify uh, this data. And this is a big, I, I think a big challenge to make actually in the end use of AI and ML techniques in, the, uh, in test beds. And the other dimension I see here is, so an, an I is actually a, um, a company that is known for the USRP platform and for those prototyping technologies. But in the core, we are a test and measurement platform. So we are also looking at uh, things like uh, testing these kind of uh, systems. And there is a, a whole other challenge of testing actually the already deployed ML systems, because usually you start with a model and then you can kind of derive from that model some kind of test requirement. and. Um, with ML AI techniques, you just have this magic black box that has been trained before and is just running and uh, you need to come up with new paradigms of testing. So this is this is another another challenge that I see yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Filippo. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I fully agree with the, with the colleagues. In addition, I'd like to say that at least from our perspective, considering that we don't have just, uh, say we have a comprehensive network that ranges from the edge to the computing part to the wireless part, uh, for us, the difficulty is also the scalability. So being able to reproduce a large environment. So, uh, so far in, in many projects uh, up to a few years ago, it was just sufficient to make a single provision, a single intent, a single, uh, simple demo. Now, this is no more no more acceptable in our opinion, at least. So we need to make an effort and it's not easy to have a test bed and to have an experimental scenario that is able to generate huge amount of, of data emulating a, a large environment. And, and an interesting point, uh, com considering what, what Pedro was mentioning, uh, is that uh, in our case, we are trying to relax uh, the, um, the fact that we may, so we may accept it to be intrusive in the, in the analysis. So, uh, of course, it, uh, it's a compromise. So, uh, we are following uh, uh, an approach in which, okay, let's, uh, let's be intrusive. Uh, the resources are increasing. We will consume a portion of it, hopefully not too much in order to get the data. But uh, it's a real, uh, say, interesting uh, approach because, of course, we were losing something uh, uh, being intrusive, so. Yeah, okay. 
Thank you. Now, this triggers me also to maybe direct the discussion in, 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 um, uh, in the sharing some thoughts, what we can do differently than we have done in the, in the past years and learn from all these approaches because maybe uh, we are dealing with new paradigms. So AI, ML really gets to the, to the physical layer even. We have yeah, integrated communication and sensing. So is it possible that um, the research community or the different um, uh, test and, um, and trial labs across uh, Europe, for, ex for example, can agree on somehow uh, uniform data sets and, and sharing of data and collaboration in a way in order to ease uh, this kind of, of tests? So what are your thoughts about that? Maybe, you know, to think a bit differently and having a a kind of different approaches that can can ease our experiments. So maybe Filippo, you can start. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, this is is relevant. What we have we have seen is that maybe so far we have been able to have in the lab or in our test, but or maybe sh small field trial. Uh, everything that was needed. Nowadays, uh, with many verticals uh, that uh, may uh, be experimented on the same infrastructure, it's, uh, it's going to be almost impossible to have uh, everything under control and, and, uh, and accessible. So uh, in, in our opinion, yeah, we, we needed to find a way to um, uh, rely on resources provided by others in an easy way. Nowadays, it's definitely not easy to rely on some other test beds or experiments. Mm -hmm. And also accessing data sets uh, exactly because you need to understand how they were retrieved and so on for mm -hmm. made by others. It's very time consuming and, and uh, there's a huge effort uh, to reuse data sets from others. Okay, thank you. Uh, Walter? Yes, so uh, I actually have two things in mind when it comes to kind of, let's say, ease the pain. <laughs> and yeah. this is, uh, the one thing is APIs. So we, if we have kind of standardized APIs, um, either between different uh, parts of the, of the testbed itself, or speaking of AIML, actually for kind of uh, extracting uh, relevant information uh, to kind of feed AI ML algorithms. I think this would help researchers quite significantly to interchange data sets and um, yeah, also jump maybe from one small scale test bed uh, to a bigger test bed and so on. And to do this, do this transfer more easily if we have those standardized uh, interfaces. And this is what kind of what Oran architectures are already starting and i think this is was from my point from the beginning is if we kind of translate this idea and this architecture more also towards running test beds that would help to kind of unify those test beds and apis are one thing and the data format to interchange data yeah. sets is the other thing so uh, for example data kind of storing data sets with like zig mf as uh, one data data format that is kind of used in the research community if people could kind of rely on that and say, okay, this is the common, let's say, academic standard. Mm -hmm. This would kind of be the the, the value to interchange uh, between the test beds and between researchers. researchers. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm curious also, maybe there is a room for this uh, kind of um, alignment uh, regarding test beds and, and trials also in the, in the standardization bodies. So, so maybe in, in Oran Alliance or even TGPP. So maybe, yeah, let's continue with this uh, uh, chain of thoughts. Um, uh, Dimitri, what do you think? Well, actually, I remember some some work, research that we did uh, sometime before for one big uh, wireless vendor, and it was dedicated to the rare events. I mean, the, the yeah. packet, packet drop in the URLC traffic in 5G. And this is, a, of course, this is a rare event. And then you perform some simulation, for example, in discrete time in a three simulator. Yeah, so you, you have to spend a lot of resources just to calculate, calculate, calculate all the net Network, and after that, get these rare events just to polish your protocol or polish your algorithm. And the idea was uh, to collect the data, I mean, all the output of the NS3 simulator. And after that, mark all the rare events 
okay, or the packet drops or the URL C traffic. And after that, uh, start to use the machine learning just to learn the some, you know, sometime before, sometime after the, the event, the, all the, uh, let's say, uh, parameters of the system and try to start to generate these parameters by the ML model. So basically make this the synthetic data for the simulator. This kind of, very, I don't know, it's, is, it, is it clear or not? Uh, but mm -hmm. actually it was kind of the problem how to simulate data for the simulator, uh, back that data from, through the SAM API uh, into the simulator and start simulator again. So after the starting simulator, see not the uh, situation, then you have the rare event. It have the parameters, then this event is not rare. You can, uh, you know, simulate all these, you know, drops, uh, without a lot of, you know, resources for the calculate and calculate this network. And uh, well, uh, that was really, you know, very difficult. So we uh, ha had some success in this, in this area, but still it's uh, quite, you know, quite, um, it was, it was really close to, to the, to the fail actually, that was really, fail. but anyway, I, I, in my opinion, uh, the simulating data, I mean, exactly the synthetic data, this is the future for for the systems because it's really difficult to collect such such amount of the data especially for the rare events or so, for some specific um i don't know some specific situation inside the network so sometimes it's better just just to simulate it and after that even uh let's say synthetically generate based on the simulation results yes okay uh, thank you pedro your thoughts on this yeah, uh, I'd like to go to the ideas by Walter re regarding standardization. Um, for me, the main point is not to share the data because all the platforms are basically different platforms. So even with the same data, you will have different results and nothing to compare because they are not uh, aligned in any way. So for me, for the future, one relevant topic to be addressed is how can we uh, share the best practice to get the platforms comparable and to have the same methodologies in the platform and to have some standardized methodology to make the experiments? This is something that is in the scope of 3GPP and Etsy. So for instance, in 4G, they had just a single standard to make some uh, standardized uh, comparison between services like uh, FTP, HTTP, uh, a number of very old services, and nothing new for 5G. Now there is a work in progress in Etsy 3GPP also to produce a paper based on the TMV working group in the 5G PPP, and mainly with experience coming from the three big projects and platforms, if uh, Vini and Genesis. And this is a way, for me, this is one way, trying to produce standards for uh, sharing the best practice in, I would say, a reduced number of big, uh, good platforms, because we are spending also a lot of money and a lot yeah. of effort in making uh, very specific uh, local platforms. And maybe we need more regional, big, uh, shared platforms. Uh, I don't say interconnect necessarily, because to be honest, Interconnection is not uh, always the best way to get a bigger resource, maybe focusing on specific areas. So standardizing best practice, even with the involvement of the SDOs, should be potentially a good way to focus on these uh, towards 6G experimental platforms. This is now my view. Yeah, thank you. Interesting. So not not the data alignment uh, is important, but also the methodology around yeah. it should be should be really uh, put into consideration and to be aligned among um, among the uh, stakeholders and and to really learn from each other's best practices and, and put it into the uh, SDOs to 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 have a kind of concrete guidelines how to do these tests. Okay, um, I, I see that we are uh, almost uh, uh, finalizing our panel, so maybe uh, roughly like a minute uh, left. Um, I 
thank you all for this uh, interesting discussions. Um, is anyone having any final thoughts to to share? Um, otherwise, let me check if there are any questions on the YouTube channel. Um, I don't see any. So by this, then uh, I will thank you uh, again. Uh, for all of you, uh, great, uh, great discussions, uh, great views. Uh, also, again, um, uh, back to IS Wireless uh, uh, for the whole program, and thanks for organizing this. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Lupto, thank you very much for. So thank you very thank much you. for hosting the hosting the panel. Thank you to all participants. And it was the last panel uh, planned for today. The only thing left is a final presentation, is a summary of the conference. It will be delivered by Adam Frisikowski from IS Wireless, head of R&D at IS Wireless. And the title of his presentation is Road Ahead Towards 6G. Adam? Thank you very much, Rafał. Well, thank you very much, the presenters, uh, speakers, panelists, moderators, everybody. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, it was a great pleasure to hear and see all your interesting, inspiring uh, feedback and uh, actually contributions that you have prepared and presented. And thank you very much for the time you have devoted to be with us. This is a real pleasure and we are proud. So. For the road ahead uh, to 6G, I think there are two receipts. Uh, one is very simple, and I would say it's like have all of you uh, cooperating and uh, utilize your interdisciplinary domains and uh, complementary uh, expertise. So this is one and very, very simple, I would say, because I, I can and everybody can clearly see that uh, what have been presented here, of course, is not completing the big picture. Sorry, it's not completing the picture. It's just like some uh, starting point and initiation of, of things. But definitely, the road is going well ahead towards the 6G. For this one, I am sure. And um, as you can see, the slides uh, well don't need to bother with the details of what is uh, right now presented. The, we um, have a chance to see and hear the three three groups of, of presenters, so with our partners at the beginning, um, then with, with the panels and with the presentations. What I tried to do, I extracted in the blue screen um, the, let's say, findings or takeaways that uh, according to my humble uh, perception and it might be not uh, ideal but uh, i try to be focused and i try to collect everything that you said and it was really lots of uh, information and indication which probably when we glue it together we might already have a nice uh, proposal so from this point of view uh, actually this we were speaking about in the whole duration of a, of a meeting today about the physical layer with uh, centralization and distribution of the DU, so distributed unit processing, uh, where we have very interesting talk by, by Professor Sophie Paulin. Then we had a very inspiring um, uh, proposal for non-coherent uh, uh, transmission uh, for high mobility from Professor Ana Garcia Armada. Then uh, we spoke about AIML uh, in, in one of the panels, but actually not in one. I think we can all see that AIML uh, was repeated many, many times. And I think this is definitely uh, the, the, the elements that are uh, laying on the, on the pavement toward the 6G. And this is clear. So uh, the need for um, coordination between the, I mean, domain experts like AIML and telecommunication was very obvious uh, when deploying and preparing the AIML, uh, building hierarchical models, end-to-end -end machine learning for like combining the locality of learning with the end-to-end -end learning. Uh, we mentioned, uh, well, actually you have mentioned multiple use cases, uh, also how to speed up processing of AI, how to speed up the training, and sometimes even in the last uh, presentations from Professor Walitsat, we heard about possibility of somehow bypassing the, the training uh, uh, possibility or, or stage. So intelligence dis distribution was presented, real-time AI. Uh, of course, um, it is clear that 6G will also be expo about explosion of complexity, but uh, in my understanding, uh, with the help of AIML, we can try to make it smarter, leaner, uh, 
uh, and we can basically uh, improve uh, the way we anticipate future, we predict the future, and we avoid uh, problems. For the architecture, we heard about transport protocols for tactile. Um, uh, we spoke about automation as a solution because uh, also we understand now that uh, beyond 5G and 6G uh, will be about new players uh, in this playground. Uh, not always um, typical mobile network operators uh, and vendors, but just the owners of the, for example, uh, private 5G or beyond uh, 5G. So there is a need for also being able to, um, let's say, augment their lack of knowledge for, for the network management. So here again, AI jumps in. So zero touch management is along the same lines. Uh, OSS, BSS, we heard very nice uh, uh, comments from our panelists. Um, so it is being transformed on, let's say, currently on the horizon, uh, and it goes into more like orchestration and control uh, direction. Also, we heard about some very futuristic uh, idea from uh, Professor Jordi um, for activating UE to serve as a base station or action point, as well as uh, uh, from, from, uh, from our professors uh, about machine learning and AI, uh, about the need for protocols that are suited to handle AI uh, requirements. So, for the control plane, I have noted about some smart controllers, or especially like Oran fast flow uh, controllers like RIX. Uh, about the intelligent orchestrators, we had a very nice talk from Professor Geir Horn, uh, and also we heard about prediction of failures, like repeating many times. Uh, for the resource point of view, uh, of course, um, energy delivery assurance, and from this point of view, efficiency increase. Um, uh, improving resiliency of, uh, of networks, but also of the energy sources that may be solar powered, where again, AI, we, we've heard that AI kicks in, AI will be present to support. Um, in, this, in the panel of uh, East European experts, we heard about the spectrum management and also uh, I would uh, anticipate it could be AI supported. Uh, but of course, we need also support from hardware, so acceleration, um, dynamic hardware adaptation. You may remember about the FPGA and programmable devices from uh, one of the professors, from, from Professor Viktor Melnik. Um, we heard a lot about data-driven algorithms, data-driven scheduling, data-driven uh, congestion admission, control, and so on. We heard about some anticipatory approach to handover uh, from Felipe, um, uh, from Filippo, sorry, Felipe, uh, and uh, also that uh, actually sustainability uh, is very important and we are going in this direction. So actually we are very happy to, um, uh, let's say today, conclude that um, the, the vision that we have all together, the vision that was expressed by our guests, but our, by our presenters um, seems to be very very clear uh, and also it is very very well aligned so basically I can see a lot of challenges and this is very good because we, we have things to solve uh, and for sure uh, beyond 5G and 6G is just the point to reach like climbing the mountain but let's say the mountain is not finished so there will be new stakeholders there will be new types of operators uh, uh, so intent based approaches were repeated a couple of times so we say to the network okay I want this I need that please uh, orchestrate it for me prepare it for me the question is orchestrate or make a choreogra choreography so more distributed um, and so we also had very inspiring uh, talk from professor uh, Simeone about neuromorphic uh, uh, capabilities that may address uh, energy efficiency that may actually uh, aspire to reach the levels of energy efficiency from what we observe from the biology and especially about spike-based uh, um, communication that requires no digital communication so there is much uh, overhead removed. For sure there were more interesting things and for those who uh, did not catch everything or who cannot con uh, so, sorry who cannot participate uh, uh, live to the live, net and live meeting please uh, take opportunity of uh, the recording that uh, we'll be providing as well. Okay, I have just, uh, just uh, two more slides. I'm almost done. Uh, from the perspective you had today, I think we see that everybody is like uh, aware of the new calls, new funding opportunities from Horizon Europe, SNS partnerships, which means 6GIA, also from space, from, uh, from military part, 
Uh, we, we perceive uh, the future very close to what has been said. Uh, we have collected here some uh, research, um, let's say bubbles, research uh, areas that we consider important. So architectural with the green, green elements, so cell-free, zero-touch management based on open run, just to name a few. Intelligent wireless systems uh, with AutoML, meta-learning, transfer learning to improve the way we learn, to improve the process of learning. Uh, sustainability of networks. It was mentioned many times for like um, uh, seeing the convergence of, uh, of networking with, with satellite, optical, optical wireless. Multi-domain controllers were repeated uh, many times, so we need to handle the different elements of hierarchy of network. And centralization distribution was, was also repeated. We, we do sign under this uh, statement that this has to be handled. And of course, not to forget about the important element of the security, whether it's uh, beyond 5G, IoT, uh, you heard about um, uh, distributed ledger technologies, application, physical, uh, con sorry, cyber physical system, and so on. So uh, this is it. Uh, I'm finishing. This is the last slide. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, let's say, uh, really wishing or planning to finish after this one. So this is just a, a glimpse on the projects of uh, ISYLS. And with the um, yellow uh, stars, I just want to highlight the projects where we are now participating in, which are on the path to 6G, so they definitely they are beyond 5G. So Marsal was today starting uh, our meeting with a great presentation from our keynote, uh, Dr. Vardakas, John Vardakas. Brainy Morphemic was also represented uh, by Geyerhorn and by uh, Filippo Zugini, uh, the coordinator, and Team Up 5G, where we had uh, Ana Garcia Armada also acting uh, as, a, as, a, as a researcher, but uh, representing also the coordinator of the project. So this is what we are doing right now, but definitely we'll be happy to team up with, with you, with, with other partners, also with those who participated as an audience to um, prepare the new proposals and address new challenges. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm done. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much, Adam, for summing up the conference for us in the form of the road ahead to the 6G. That was our last presentation for today. Um, thank you very much for being with us today. If you are watching us but you haven't registered, uh, we encourage you to do so. Uh, to all registered participants of the conference, we will be sending post-conference materials. We at IS Wireless are grateful um, to have the opportunity to prepare this conference together with our partners. Um, in the spirit of 5G Made Together and beyond 5G Made Together, the, the, the list is long. Uh, IBM, Microsoft, VMware, iQuadrat, Warsaw University of Technology, uh, WTT Research Center of Finland, National Institute of Telecommunications in Poland, Alta University, Dell Technologies, John Paul II Catholic University in Lublin, Vilnius Gediminas Technical University, uh, Technical University of Ostrava, Internet Institute from Slovenia, uh, KU Leuven, uh, University of Oslo, University of Carlos uh, III um, of Madrid, King's College London, Morphemic Project, uh, Samsung, Interdigital, Future Wireless Europe Lab, University of Malaga, Technical University of Denmark, um, University Politecnica de Catalunya, uh, Comarch, Virginia Tech, TNO, uh, CNIT, National Instruments, Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology, and our host, beautiful studio of the Central Technology House here in Warsaw. Well, the list is really long. Uh, so although 5G is in place, uh, as, you, as you've seen, there are many, many people around the world working on what's next, what's beyond 5G. Uh, and we are super happy that we managed to uh, meet with all of them uh, today. Um, please follow them. Uh, please follow us. And I think that that's it for today. Thank you very much. We hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.